preface to how to write short stories with samples by ring lardner published in 1924 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording by michelle fry baton ridge louisiana in march 2020 preface how to write short stories a glimpse at the advertising columns of our leading magazines shows that whatever else this country may be shy of there is certainly no lack of correspondence schools that learns you the art of short story writing the most notorious of these schools makes the boast that one of their pupils cleaned up five thousand dollars and no hundreds dollars writing short stories according to the system learnt in their course though it don't say if that amount was cleaned up in one year or fifty however for some reason or another when you skin through the pages of high-class periodicals you don't very often find them cluttered up with stories that was written by boys or gals who had win their phi beta skeleton keys at this or that story writing college in fact, the most of the successful authors of the short fiction of today never went to no kind of a college, or if they did, they studied piano tuning or the barber trade. They could have got just as far in what I call the literary game if they had a stayed home those four years and helped mother carry out the empty bottles. The answer is that you can't find no school in operation up to date whether it be a general institution of learning or a school that specializes in story writing which can make a great author out of a born druggist but a little group of our deeper drinkers has suggested that maybe boys and gals who wants to take up writing as their life work would be benefited if some person like i was to give them a few hints in regards to the technique of the short story how to go about planning it and writing it when and where to plant the love interest and climax and finally how to market the finished product without leaving no bad taste in the mouth well then it seems to me like the best method to use in giving out these hints is to try and describe my own personal procedure from the time i get inspired till the time the manuscript is loaded onto the trucks the first thing i generally always do is try and get a hold of a catchy title like for instance basil hargrave's vermifuge or fun at the incinerating plant then i sit down to a desk or flat table of any kind and lay out three or four sheets of paper with as many different colored pencils and look at them cockeyed for a few moments before making a selection how to begin or as we professionals would say how to commence is the next question it must be admitted that the method of approach l'approchement differs even amongst first-class fictionists for example blasco abanez usually starts his stories with a spanish word jack dempsey with an i and charlie peterson with a couple of simple declarative sentences about his leading character such as hazel gooftree had just gone mahjong she felt faint personally it has been my observation that the reading public prefers short dialogue to any other kind of writing and i always aim to open my tale with two or three lines of conversation between characters or as i call them my puppets who are to play important roles I have often found that something one of these characters says, words I have perhaps unconsciously put into his or her mouth, directs my plot into channels deeper than I had planned and changes for the better the entire sense of my story. To illustrate this, let us pretend that I have laid out a plot as follows. Two girls, Dorothy Abbott and Edith Quaver, are spending the heated term at a famous resort. The Prince of Wales visits the resort, but leaves on the next train. A day or two later, a Mexican reaches the place and looks for accommodations, but is unable to find a room without a bath. The two girls meet him at the public filling station and ask him for a contribution to their autograph album. To their amazement, he utters a terrible oath, spits in their general direction, and hurries out of town. 
it is not until years later that the two girls learn he is a notorious forger and realize how lucky they were after all let us pretend that the above is the original plot then let us begin the writing with haphazard dialogue and see whither it leads where was you asked edith quaver to the taxidermists replied dorothy abbott the two girls were spending the heated term at a famous watering trough they had just been bathing and were now engaged in sorting dental floss i am getting sick and tired of this place went on miss quaver it is mutual said miss abbott shying a cucumber at a passing paper hanger there was a rap at their door and the maid's voice announced that company was awaiting them downstairs the two girls went down and entered the music room garnet whale driver was at the piano and the girls tiptoed to the lounge the big nordic oblivious of their presence allowed his fingers to form weird fantastic minors before they strayed unconsciously into the first tones of chopin's one hundred and twenty first fugue for the bass drum from this beginning a skilled writer could go most anywheres but it would be my tendency to drop these three characters and take up the life of a mule in the grand canyon the mule watches the trains come in from the east he watches the trains come in from the west and keeps wondering who is going to ride him but she never finds out the love interest and climax would come when a man and a lady both strangers got to talking together on the train going back east well said mrs crute for it was she what did you think of the canyon some cave replied her escort what a funny way to put it replied mrs crute and now play me something without a word warren took his place on the piano bench and at first allowed his fingers to form weird fantastic chords on the black keys suddenly and with no seeming intention he was in the midst of the second movement of chopin's twelfth sonata for flute and cuspidor mrs crute felt faint that will give young writers an idea of how an apparently trivial thing such as a line of dialogue will upset an entire plot and lead an author far from the path he had pointed for himself it will also serve as a model for beginners to follow in regards to style and technique i will not insult my readers by going on with the story to its obvious conclusion that simple task they can do for themselves and it will be good practice so much for the planning and writing now for the marketing of the completed work a good many young writers make the mistake of enclosing a stamped self-addressed envelope big enough for the manuscript to come back in this is too much of a temptation to the editor personally i have found it a good scheme to not even sign my name to the story and when i have got it sealed up in its envelope and stamped and addressed i take it to some town where i don't live and mail it from there the editor has no idea who wrote the story so how can he send it back he is in a quandary in conclusion let me warn my pupils never to write their stories or as we professionals call them yarns on used paper and never to write them on a postcard and never to send them by telegraph morse code stories yarns of mine which have appeared in various publications one of them having been accepted and published by the first editor that got it are reprinted in the following pages and will illustrate in a half-hearted way what i am trying to get at ring lordner the mange great neck long island 1924 end of preface Chapter 1, Part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 1, The Facts. Part 1. A Sample Story of Life in the Kentucky Mountains. An English girl leaves her husband, an Omaha policeman, but neglects to obtain a divorce. 
She later meets the man she loves, a garbage inspector from Bordeaux, and goes with him without benefit of clergy. This story was written on top of a Fifth Avenue bus, and some of the sheets blew away, which may account for the apparent scarcity of interesting situations. 1. The engagement was broken off before it was announced, so only a thousand or so of the intimate friends and relatives of the parties knew anything about it. What they knew was that there had been an engagement, and that there was one no longer. The cause of the breach they merely guessed, and most of the guesses were, in most particulars, wrong. Each intimate and relative had a fragment of the truth. It remained for me to piece the fragments together. It was a difficult job, but I did it. Part of my evidence is hearsay. The major portion is fully corroborated, and not one of my witnesses had anything to gain through perjury. So I am positive that I have at my tongue's end the facts and I believe that in justice to everybody concerned, I should make them public. Ellen MacDonald had lived on the north side of Chicago for 21 years. Billy Bowen had been a south sider for seven years longer, but neither knew of the other's existence until they met in New York the night before the Army-Navy game. Billy, sitting with a business acquaintance at a neighboring table, Antonio's, was spotted by a male member of Ellen's party, a Chicagoan, too. He was urged to come on over. He did and was introduced. The business acquaintance was also urged, came, was introduced and forgotten. Forgotten, that is, by everyone but the waiter who observed that he danced not nor told stories and figured that his function must be to pay. The business acquaintance had been Billy's guest. Now he became host and without seeking the office. It was not that Billy and Miss McDonald's male friends were niggards, but unfortunately for the B.A., the checks always happened to arrive when everybody else was dancing or so hysterical over Billy's repartee as to be potentially insolvent. Billy was somewhere between his 14th and 21st highball. In other words, at his best, from the audience's standpoint. His dialogue was simply screaming and his dancing just heavenly. He was Frank Tinney doubling as Vernon Castle. On the floor, he tried and accomplished twinkles that would have spelled catastrophe if attempted under the 14 mark or over the 21, and he said the cutest things, one right after the other. 2. You can be charmed by a man's dancing, but you can't fall in love with his funniness. If you're going to fall in love with him at all, you'll do it when you catch him in a serious mood. Miss MacDonald caught Billy Bowen and won at the game the next day. Entirely by accident or a decree of fate, her party and his sat in adjoining boxes. Not by accident, Miss MacDonald sat in the chair that was nearest Billy's. She sat there first to be amused. She stayed to be conquered. Here was a different Billy from the Billy of Tonio's. Here was a Billy who trained his gun on your heart and let your risibles alone. Here was a dreamy Billy, a Billy of romance. How calm he remained through the excitement. How indifferent to the thrills of the game. There was depth to him. He was a man. Her escort and the others round her were children, screaming with delight at the puerile deeds of pseudo-heroes. Football was a great sport, but a sport. It wasn't life. Would the world be better or worse for that nine-yard gain that Elephant or Oliphant or whatever his name was had just made? She knew it wouldn't. Billy knew, too, for Billy was deep. 
He was thinking man's thoughts. She could tell by his silence, by his inattention to the scene before him. She scarcely could believe that here was the same person who last night had kept his own yes and the neighboring tables roaring with laughter. What a complex character he is. In sooth, Mr. Bowen was thinking man's thoughts. He was thinking that if this pretty Miss McDowell or Donnelly were elsewhere, he could go to sleep. And that if he could remember which team he had bet on and could tell which team was which, he would have a better idea of whether he was likely to win or lose. When, after the game they parted, Billy rallied to the extent of asking permission to call. Ellen, it seemed, would be very glad to have him. But she couldn't tell exactly when she would have to be back in Chicago. She still had three more places to visit in the East. Could she possibly let him know when she did get back? Yes, she could and would. If he really wanted her to, she would drop him a note. He certainly wanted her to. This, thought Billy, was the best possible arrangement. Her note would tell him her name and address and save him the trouble of phoning to all the McConnells, McDowells, and Donnellys on the north side. He did want to see her again. She was pretty, and judging from last night, full of pep. And she had fallen for him. He knew it from that look. He watched her until she was lost in the crowd. Then he hunted round for his pals in the car that had brought them up. At length he gave up the search and wearily climbed the elevated stairs. His hotel was on Broadway, near 44th. He left the train at 42nd, the third time it stopped there. I guess you've rode far enough, said the guard. Fifteen cents worth for a nickel. I guess we ought to have a pullman on these here trains. I guess, said Billy, I guess. But the repartee well was dry. He stumbled downstairs and hurried toward Broadway to replenish it. Three. Ellen MacDonald's three more places to visit in the East must have been deadly dull. Anyway, on the 6th of December, scarcely more than a week after his parting with her in New York, Billy Bowen received the promised note. It informed him merely that her name was Ellen MacDonald, that she lived at so-and-so Walton Place, and that she was back in Chicago. That day, if you'll remember, was Monday. Miss MacDonald's parents had tickets for the opera, but Ellen was honestly just worn out. And would they be mad at her if she stayed home and went to bed? They wouldn't. They would take Aunt Mary in her place. On Tuesday morning, Paul Potter called up and wanted to know if she would go with him that night to the Follies. She was horribly sorry, but she'd made an engagement. The engagement evidently was to study and the subject was harmony, with Berlin, Kern, and Van Elstein as instructors. She sat on the piano bench from half-past seven till quarter after nine, and then went to her room vowing that she would accept any and all invitations for the following evening. Fortunately, no invitations arrived, for at quarter of nine Wednesday night, Mr. Bowen did, and in a brand new mood. He was a bit shy and listened more than he talked. But when he talked, he talked well, though the sparkling wit of the night at Tonio's was lacking. Lacking, too, was the preoccupied air of the day at the football game. There was no problem to keep his mind busy. But even if the Army and Navy had been playing football in this very room, he could have told at a glance which was which. Vision and brain were perfectly clear, and he had been getting his old eight hours, and, like the railroad hen, sometimes nine and sometimes ten, every night since his arrival home from Gotham, New York. Mr. Bowen was on the wagon. They talked of the east of Tonio's of the game. This was where Billy did most of his listening of the war, of theaters, of books, of college, of automobiles, of the market. They talked, too, of their immediate families. 
Billy's consisting of one married sister in South Bend was soon exhausted. He had two cousins here in town whom he saw frequently, two cousins and their wives, but they were people who simply couldn't stay home nights. As for himself, he preferred his rooms and a good book to the so-called gay life. Ellen should think that a man who danced so well would want to be doing it all the time. It was nice of her to say that he danced well. But really, he didn't, you know. Oh, yes, he did. She guessed she could tell. Well, anyway, the giddy whirl made no appeal to him unless, of course, he was in particularly charming company. His avowed love for home and quiet surprised Ellen a little. It surprised Mr. Bowen a great deal. Only last night he remembered he had been driven almost desperate by that quiet of which he was now so fond. He had been on the point of busting loose, but had checked himself in time. He had played Canfield till ten, though the bookshelves were groaning with their load. Ellen's family kept them busy for an hour and a half. It was a dear family, and she wished he could meet it. Mother and father were out playing bridge somewhere tonight. Aunt Mary had gone to bed. Aunts Louise and Harriet lived in the next block. Sisters Edith and Wilma would be home from Northampton for the holidays about the 20th. Brother Bob and his wife had built the cutest house in Evanston. Her younger brother Walter was a case. He was away tonight, had gone out right after dinner. He'd better be in before mother and father came. He had a new love affair every week and 16 years old last August. Mother and father really didn't care how many girls he was interested in so long as they kept him too busy to run round with those crazy schoolmates of his. The latter were older than he, just at the age when it seemed smart to drink beer and play cards for money. Father said that if he ever found out that Walter was doing these things, he'd take him out of school and lock him up somewhere. Aunts Louise and Mary and Harriet did a lot of settlement work. They met all sorts of queer people, people you'd never believe existed. The three aunts were unmarried. Brother Bob's wife was dear, but absolutely without a sense of humor. Bob was full of fun, but they got along just beautifully together. You never saw a couple so much in love. Edith was on the basketball team at college and terribly popular. Wilma was horribly clever and everybody said she'd make Phi Beta Kappa. Ellen, so she averred, had been just nothing in school. Not bright, not athletic, and of course not popular. Of course not, said Billy, smiling. Honestly, fibbed Ellen. You never could make me believe it, said Billy. Whereat Ellen blushed and Billy's unbelief strengthened. At this crisis, the case burst into the room with his hat on. He removed it at sight of the collar and awkwardly advanced to be introduced. I'm going to bed, he announced after the formality. I hoped, said Ellen, you tell us about the latest. Who is it now? Beth? Beth nothing, scoffed the case. We split up the day of the Kiwatin game. What was the matter? asked his sister. I'm going to bed, said the case. It's pretty near midnight. By George, it is, exclaimed Billy. I didn't dream it was that late. No, said Walter. That's what I tell Dad. The clock goes along some when you're having a good time. Billy and Ellen looked shyly at each other and then laughed. Laughed harder, it seemed, to Walter than the joke warranted. In fact, he hadn't thought of it as a joke. If it was that good, he'd spring it on Catherine tomorrow night. It would just about clinch her. The case, carrying out his repeated threat, went to bed and dreamed of Catherine. Fifteen minutes later, Ellen retired to dream of Billy. And an hour later than that, Billy was dreaming of Ellen, who had become suddenly popular with him, even if she hadn't been so at Northampton, which he didn't believe. Four. They saw the Follies Friday night. 
A criticism of the show by either would have been the greatest folly of all. It is doubtful that they could have told what theater they'd been to ten minutes after they'd left it. From wherever it was, they walked to a dancing place and danced. Ellen was so far gone that she failed to note the change in Billy's trotting. Foxes would have blushed for shame at its awkwardness and lack of variety. If Billy was a splendid dancer, he certainly did not prove it this night. All he knew or cared to know was that he was with the girl he wanted, and she knew only that she was with Billy and happy. On the drive home, the usual superfluous words were spoken. They were repeated inside the storm door at Ellen's father's house, while the taxi driver, waiting, wondered audibly why them suckers of explorers beat it to the pole to freeze when the north side was so damn handy. Ellen's father was out of town, so in the morning she broke the news to Mother and Aunt Mary and then sat down and wrote it to Edith and Wilma. Next she called up Bob's wife in Evanston, and after that she hurried on to the next block and sprang it on Aunts Louise and Harriet. It was decided that Walter had better not be told. He didn't know how to keep a secret. Walter, therefore, was in ignorance till he got home from school. The only person he confided in the same evening was Catherine, who was the only person he saw. Bob and his wife and Aunts Louise and Harriet came to Sunday dinner, but were chased home early in the afternoon. Mr. McDonald was back, and Billy was coming to talk to him. It would embarrass Billy to death to find such a crowd in the house. They'd all meet him soon, never fear, and when they met him, they'd be crazy about him. Bob and Aunt Mary and Mother would like him because he was so bright and said such screaming things, and the rest would like him because he was so well-read and sensible and so horribly good-looking. Billy, I said, was coming to talk to Mr. MacDonald. When he came, he did very little of the talking. He stated the purpose of his visit, told what business he was in, and affirmed his ability to support a wife. Then he assumed the role of audience while Ellen's father delivered an hour's lecture. The speaker did not express his opinion of Tyrus Cobb or the Kaiser, but they were the only subjects he overlooked. Sobriety and industry were words frequently used. I don't care, he prevaricated in conclusion, how much money a man is making if he is sober and industrious. You attended college, and I presume you did all the fool things college boys do. Some men recover from their college education, and others don't. I hope you are one of the former. The Sunday night supper, just cold scraps, you might say, was partaken of by the happy but embarrassed pair, the trying-to-look-happy but unembarrassed parents, and Aunt Mary. Walter, the case, was out. He had stayed home the previous evening. He'll be here tomorrow night and the rest of the week, or I'll know the reason why, said Mr. MacDonald. He won't, and I'll tell you the reason why, said Ellen. He's a real boy, Sam, put in the real boy's mother. You can't expect him to stay home every minute. I can't expect anything of him, said the father. You and the girls and Mary here have let him have his own way so long that he's past managing. When I was his age, I was in my bed at nine o'clock. Morning or night? asked Ellen. Her father scowled. It was evident he could not take a joke, not even a good one. After the cold scraps had been ruined, Mr. MacDonald drew Billy into the smoking room and offered him a cigar. The prospective son-in-law was about to refuse and express a preference for cigarettes when something told him not to. A moment later, he was deeply grateful to the something. I smoke three cigars a day, said the oracle, one after each meal. That amount of smoking will hurt nobody. More than that is too much. I used to smoke to excess, four or five cigars per day and maybe a pipe or two. I found it was affecting my health, and I cut down. Thank heaven no one in my family ever got the cigarette habit. Disease, rather. How any sane, clean-minded man can start on those things is beyond me. 
Me too, agreed Billy, taking the proffered cigar with one hand and making sure with the other that his silver pill case was as deep down in his pocket as it would go. Cigarettes, gambling, and drinking go hand in hand, continued the man of the house. I couldn't trust a cigarette fiend with a nickel. There are only two or three kinds he could get for that, said Billy. What say, demanded Mr. MacDonald, but before Billy was obliged to wriggle out of it, Aunt Mary came in and reminded her brother-in-law that it was nearly church time. Mr. MacDonald and Aunt Mary went to church. Mrs. MacDonald, pleading weariness, stayed home with the children. She wanted a chance to get acquainted with this pleasant-faced boy who was going to rob her of one of her five dearest treasures. The three were no sooner settled in front of the fireplace than Ellen adroitly brought up the subject of auction bridge, knowing that it would relieve Billy of the conversational burden. Mother is really quite a shark, aren't you, mother, she said. I don't fancy being called a fish, said the mother. She's written two books on it, and she and father have won so many prizes that they may have to lease a warehouse. If they'd only play for money, just think of how rich we'd all be. The game is fascinating enough without adding to it the excitements and evils of gambling, said Mrs. MacDonald. It is a fascinating game, agreed Billy. It is, said Mrs. MacDonald, and away she went. Before Father and Aunt Mary got home from church, Mr. Bowen was a strong disciple of conservativeness and bidding, and thoroughly convinced that all the rules that had been taught were dead wrong. He saw the shark's point so quickly and agreed so wholeheartedly with her arguments that he impressed her as one of the most intelligent young men she had ever talked to. It was too bad it was Sunday night, but some evening soon he must come over for a game. I'd like awfully well to read your book, said Billy. The first one's usefulness died with the changes in the rules, replied Mrs. MacDonald. But I think I have one of the new ones in the house, and I'll be glad to have you take it. Oh, I don't like to have you give me your only copy. Oh, I believe we have two. She knew perfectly well she had two dozen. Aunt Mary announced that Walter had been seen in church with Catherine. He had made it his business to be seen. He and the lady had come early and had maneuvered into the third row from the back on the aisle leading to the MacDonald family pew. He had nudged his aunt as she passed on the way to her seat, and she had turned and spoken to him. She could not know that he and Catherine had ducked before the end of the processional. After reporting favorably on the case, Aunt Mary launched into a description of the service. About 70 had turned out. The music had been good, but not quite as good as in the morning. Mr. Pratt had sung, Fear ye not, O Israel, for the offertory. Dr. Gish was still sick and a lay reader had served. She had heard from Allie French that Dr. Gish expected to be out by the middle of the week and certainly would be able to preach next Sunday morning. The church had been cold at first, but very comfortable finally. Ellen rose and said she and Billy would go out in the kitchen and make some fudge. I was afraid Aunt Mary would bore you to death, she told Billy, when they had kissed for the first time since five o'clock. She just lives for the church and can talk on no other subject. I wouldn't hold that against her, said Billy charitably. The fudge was a failure, as it was bound to be. But the case who came in just as it was being passed around was the only one rude enough to say so. Is this a new stunt, he inquired, when he had tested it? Is what a new stunt, asked Alan, using cheese instead of chocolate? That will do, Walter, said his father. You can go to bed. Walter got up and started for the hall. At the threshold, he stopped. I don't suppose there will be any of that fudge left, he said. But if there should be, you'd better put it in the mouse trap. Billy called a taxi and departed soon after Walter's exit. When he got out at his south side abode, the floor of the tonneau was littered with recent cigarettes. And that night he dreamed that he was president of the Anti-Cigarette League, that Dr. Gish was vice president, and that the motto of the organization was, No Trump.
Billy Bowen's business took him out of town the second week in December, and it was not until the 20th that he returned. He had been east and had ridden home from Buffalo on the same train with Wilma and Edith MacDonald. But he didn't, didn't know it, and neither did they. They could not be expected to recognize him from Ellen's description. That he was horribly good-looking. The dining car conductor was all of that. Ellen had further written them that he, not the dining car conductor, was a man of many moods. That sometimes he was just nice and deep. And sometimes he was screamingly funny. And sometimes so serious and silent that she was almost afraid of him. They were wild to see him, and the journey through Ohio and Indiana would not have been half so long in his company. Edith, the athletic, would have reveled in his wit. Wilma would gleefully have fathomed his depths. They would both have been proud to flaunt his looks before the hundreds of their kind aboard the train. Their loss was greater than Billy's, for he, smoking cigarettes as fast as he could light them and playing bridge that would have brought Tears of compassion to the shark's eyes enjoyed the trip, every minute of it. Ellen and her father were at the station to meet the girls. His arrival on the train had not been heralded, and it added greatly to the hysterics of the occasion. Wilma and Edith upbraided him for not knowing by instinct who they were. He accused them of recognizing him and purposely avoiding him. Much more of it was pulled in the same light vein, pro and con. He was permitted at length to depart for his office. On the way, he congratulated himself on the improbability of his ever being obliged to play basketball versus Edith. She must be a whiz in condition. Chances were she'd trained down to 195 before the big games. The other one, Wilma, was a splinter if he ever saw one. You had to keep your eyes peeled or you'd miss her entirely. But suppose you did miss her. What then? If she won her Phi Beta Kappa pin, he thought it would make her a dandy belt. These two, he thought, were a misdeal. They should be reshuffled and cut near the middle of the deck. End of chapter one. The Facts. Part 1. Chapter 1, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 1. The Facts. Part 2. Lots of other funny things he thought about these two. Just before he had left Chicago on this trip, his stenographer had quit him to marry an elevator starter named Felix Bond. He had phoned one of his cousins and asked him to be on the lookout for a live stenographer who wasn't likely to take the eye of an elevator starter. The cousin had one in mind. Here was her card on Billy's desk when he reached the office. It was not a business card, visiting card, at three dollars per hundred. Miss Violet Moore, the engraved part said. Above was written, Mr. Bowen, call me up any night after seven. Calumet 2678. Billy stowed the card in his pocket and plunged into a pile of uninteresting letters. On the night of the 22nd, there was a family dinner at McDonald's, and Billy was in on it. At the function, he met the rest of them, Bob and his wife, and Aunt Harriet, and Aunt Louise. Bob and his wife, despite the former's alleged sense of humor, spooned every time they were contiguous. That they were in love with each other, as Ellen had said, was easy to see. The wherefore was more of a puzzle. Bob's hirsute adornment having been disturbed by his spouse's digits during one of the orgies, he went upstairs ten minutes before dinner time to effect repairs. Mrs. Bob was left alone on the Davenport. 
In performance of his social duties, Billy went over and sat down beside her. She was not, like Miss Muffet, frightened away. But terror, or some other fiend, rendered her temporarily dumb. The game Mr. Bowen was making his fifth attempt to pry open a conversation when Bob came back. To the impartial observer, the scene on the Davenport appeared heartless enough. There was a generous neutral zone between Billy and Flo, that being an abbreviation of Mrs. Bob's given name, which, as a few may suspect, was Florence. Billy was working hard, and his face was flushed with the effort. The flush may have aroused Bob's suspicions. At any rate, he strode across the room, scowling almost audibly, shot a glance at Billy that would have made the Kaiser wince, halted magnificently in front of his wife, and commanded her to accompany him to the hall. Billy's flush became ace-high. He was about to get up and break a chair when a look from Ellen stopped him. She was at his side before the pair of bobs had skidded out of the room. Please don't mind, she begged. He's crazy. I forgot to tell you that he's insanely jealous. Did I understand you to say he had a sense of humor? It doesn't work where Flo's concerned. If he sees her talking to a man, he goes wild. With astonishment, probably, said Billy. <laughs> You're a nice boy, said Ellen irrelevantly. Dinner was announced, and Mr. Bowen was glad to observe that Flo's terrestrial body was still intact. He was glad, too, to note that Bob was no longer frothing. He learned for the first time that the case and Catherine were of the party. Mrs. MacDonald had wanted to make sure of Walter's presence, hence the presence of his crush. Catherine giggled when she was presented to Billy. It made him uncomfortable, and he thought for a moment that a couple of studs had fallen out. He soon discovered, however, that the giggle was permanent, just as much a part of Catherine as her fraction of a nose. He looked forward with new interest to the soup course, but was disappointed to find that she could negotiate it without disturbing the giggle or the linen. He next centered his attention on Wilma and Edith. Another disappointment was in store. There were as many and as large oysters in Wilma's soup as in anyone's. She ate them all, and so far as appearances went, was the same Wilma. He had expected that Edith would either diet or plunge. But Edith was as prosaic in her consumption of victuals as Ellen, for instance, or Aunt Louise. He must content himself for the present with Aunt Louise. She was sitting directly opposite, and he had an unobstructed view of the widest part he had ever seen in woman's hair. Ogden Avenue, he said to himself. Aunt Louise was telling about her experiences in Aunt Harriet's among the heathen of Peoria Street. You would never dream there were such people, said she. I suppose most of them are foreign-born, supposed her brother, who was Mr. MacDonald. Practically all of them, said Aunt Louise. Billy wanted to ask her whether she had ever missionaried among the Indians. He thought possibly an attempt to scalp her had failed by a narrow margin. Between courses, Edith worked hard to draw out his predicated comicality, and Wilma worked as hard to make him sound his low notes. Their labors were in vain. He was not sleepy enough to be deep, and he was fourteen highballs shy of comedy. In disgust, perhaps, at her failure to be amused, the major portion of the Miss Deal capsized her cocoa just before the close of the meal and drew a frown from her father, whom she could have thrown in ten minutes, straight falls, any style. She'll never miss that ounce, thought Billy. When they got up from the table and started for the living room, Mr. Bowen found himself walking beside Aunt Harriet, who had been so silent during dinner that he had all but forgotten her. Well, Miss MacDonald, he said, it's certainly a big family, isn't it? Well, young man, said Aunt Harriet, it ain't no small family, that's sure. I should say not, repeated Billy. Walter, in his giggling crush, intercepted him. What do you think of Aunt Harriet's grammar, demanded Walter. I didn't notice it, lied Billy. No, I suppose not. Ain't no small family, 
I suppose you didn't notice it. She isn't a real aunt like Aunt Louise and Aunt Mary. She's just an adopted aunt. She kept house for Dad and Aunt Louise after their mother died, and when Dad got married, she just kept on living with Aunt Louise. Oh, was Billy's fresh comment, and it brought forth a fresh supply of giggles from Catherine. Ellen had already been made aware of Billy's disgusting plans. He had to catch a night train for St. Louis, and he would be there all day tomorrow, and he'd be back Friday, but he wouldn't have time to see her, and he'd surely call her up. On Friday afternoon, he was going to South Bend to spend Christmas Day with his married sister because it was probably the last Christmas he'd be able to spend with her. But I'll hustle home from South Bend Sunday morning, he said. And don't you dare make any engagement for the afternoon. I do wish you could be with us Christmas Eve. The tree won't be a bit of fun without you. You know, I wish I could. But you see how it is. I think your sister's mean. Billy didn't deny it. Who's going to be here Christmas Eve? Just the people we had tonight, except Catherine and you. Why? Oh, nothing, said Billy. Look here, sir, said his betrothed. Don't you do anything foolish. You're not supposed to buy presents for the whole family. Just a little tiny one for me, if you want to, but you mustn't spend much on it. And if you get anything for anyone else in this house, I'll be mad. I'd like to see you mad, said Billy. You'd wish you hadn't, Ellen retorted. When Billy had gone, Ellen returned to the living room and faced the assembled company. Well, she said, now that you've all seen him, what's the verdict? The verdict seemed to be unanimously in his favor. But, said Bob, I thought you said he was so screamingly funny. Yes, said Edith, you told me that too. Give him a chance, said Ellen. Wait till he's in a funny mood. You'll simply die laughing. 5. It is a compound fracture of the rules to have so important a character as Tommy Richards appear in only one chapter. But remember, this isn't a regular story, but a simple statement of what occurred when it occurred. During Chapter 4, Tommy had been on his way home from the Pacific Coast where business had kept him all fall. His business out there and what he said en route to Chicago are collateral. Tommy had been Billy's pal at college. Tommy's home was in Minnesota, and Billy was his most intimate, practically his only friend in the so-called metropolis of the Middle West. So Tommy, not knowing that Billy had gone to St. Louis, looked forward to a few pleasant hours with him between the time of the Coast Train's arrival and the Minnesota train's departure. The cross train reached Chicago about noon. It was Thursday noon, the 23rd. Tommy hustled from the station to Billy's office and there learned of the St. Louis trip. Disappointed, he roamed the streets a while and at length dropped into the downtown ticket office of his favorite Minnesota road. He was told that everything for the night was sold out. Big Christmas business, Tommy pondered. The coast train reached Chicago about noon. It was Thursday noon, the 23rd. How about tomorrow night, he inquired. I can give you a lower tomorrow night on the 6.30, replied Leslie Painter, that being the clerk's name. I'll take it, said Tommy. He did so, and the clerk took $10.05. I'll see old Bill after all, said Tommy. Leslie Painter made no reply. In the afternoon, Tommy sat through a vaudeville show, and at night he looped the loop. He retired early, for the next day promised to be a big one. Billy got in from St. Louis at 7 Friday morning and had been in his office an hour when Tommy appeared. I have no details of the meeting. At half past 8, Tommy suggested that they'd better go out and hissed one. Still on it, eh, said Billy. What do you mean? I mean that I'm off of it. Good Lord, for how long? The last day of November. Too long. You look sick already. I feel great, averred Billy. Well, I don't, so come along and bathe in Vichy. On the way along, Billy told Tommy about Ellen. Tommy's congratulations were physical and jarred Billy from head to heels. Good stuff! Stuff, cried Tommy, so loudly that three pedestrians jumped sideways. 
old Bill hooked. And do you think you're going to celebrate this occasion with water? I think I am, was Billy's firm reply. You think you are? What odds? A good lunch against a red hot. You're on, said Tommy, and I'm going to be mighty hungry at one o'clock. You'll be hungry and alone. What's the idea? If you've got a lunch date with the future, I'm in on it. I haven't, said Billy, but I'm going to South Bend on the 140. And between now and then, I have nothing to do but clean up my mail and buy a dozen Christmas presents. They turned in somewhere. Don't you see the girl at all today, asked Tommy. Not today. All I do is color up. Well, then, if you get outside of a couple, who'll be hurt? Just for old time's sake. If you need lunch money, I'll give it to you. No, no, that bet's off. It's not off. I won't call it off. Suit yourself, said Tommy graciously. At half past nine, it was officially decided that Billy had lost the bet. At half past twelve, Billy said it was time to pay it. I'm not hungry enough, said Tommy. Hungry or no hungry, said Billy. I buy your lunch now or I don't buy it. See? Hungry or no hungry. What's the hurry, asked Tommy. I guess you know what's the hurry. Me for South Bend on the 140 and I got to go to the office first. Hurry or no hurry. Listen to reason, Bill. How are you going to eat lunch, go to the office, buy a dozen Christmas presents and catch the 140? Christmas presents! I forgot them! What do you think of that? I forgot them! Good night! What are you going to do? Do? What can I do? You got me into this mess. Get me out! Sure, I'll get you out if you'll listen to reason, said Tommy. Has this 140 train got anything on you? Are you under obligations to it? Is the engineer your girl's uncle? I guess you know better than that. I guess you know I'm not engaged to a girl who's got an uncle for an engineer. Well then, what's the next train? That's the boy, Tommy. That fixes it. I'll go on the next train. You're sure there is one, asked Tommy. Is one? Say, where do you think South Bend is? In Europe? I wouldn't mind, said Tommy. South Bend's only a two-hour run. Where do you think it was? Europe? I don't care where it is. The question is, what's the next train after 140? Maybe you think I don't know, said Billy. He called the gentleman with the apron. What do you know about this, Charlie? Here's an old pal of mine who thinks I don't know the timetable to South Bend. He's mistaken, isn't he, said Charlie. Is he mistaken? Say, Charlie, if you knew as much as I do about the timetable to South Bend, you wouldn't be here. No, sir, said Charlie. I'd be an announcer over in the station. There, said Billy triumphantly. How's that, Tommy? Do I know the timetable or don't I? I guess you do, said Tommy, but I don't think you ought to have secrets from an old friend. There's no secrets about it, Charlie. My name is Tommy, corrected his friend. I know that. I know your name as well as my own, better than my own. I know your name as well as I know the timetable. If you'd just tell me the time of that train, we'd all be better off. I'll tell you, Tommy. I wouldn't hold out anything on you, old boy. It's 5.25. You're sure? Sure. Say, I've taken it a hundred times if I've taken it once. All right, said Tommy, that fixes it. We'll go in and have lunch and be through by half past one. That'll give you four hours to do your shopping, get to your office, and make your train. Where are you going while I shop? Don't bother about me. You go along with me. Nothing doing. Yes, you do. No, I don't. But this argument was won by Mr. Bowen. At ten minutes of three, when they at last called for the check, Mr. Richards looked on the shopping expedition in an entirely different light. Two hours before, it had not appealed to him at all. Now he could think of nothing that would afford more real entertainment. 
Mr. Richards was at a stage corresponding to Billy's 21. Billy was far past it. What we better do, said Tommy, is write down a list of all the people so we won't forget anybody. That's the stuff, said Billy. I'll name them. You write them. So Tommy produced a pencil and took dictation on the back of a menu card. First, girl's father, Samuel MacDonald. Samuel MacDonald, repeated Tommy. Maybe you'd better give me some dope on each one, so if we're shy of time, we can both be buying at once. All right, said Billy. First, Samuel McDonald. He's an old crab, raves about cigarettes. Like him? No, hates him. Samuel McDonald, cigarettes, wrote Tommy. Old crab, he added. When the important preliminary arrangement had at last been completed... The two old college chums went out into the air. Where do we shop? asked Tommy. Marshes, said Billy. It's the only place I got charge account. Maybe we better take a taxi and save time, suggested Tommy. So they waited five minutes for a taxi and were driven to Marshes two blocks away. We'll start on the first floor and work up, said Tommy, who had evidently appointed himself captain. They found themselves among the jewelry and silverware. You might get something for the girl here, suggested Tommy. Don't worry about her, said Billy. Leave her till last. What's the limit on the others? I don't care, said Billy. Dollar, two dollars, three dollars. Well, come on, said Tommy. We got to make it snappy. But Billy hung back. Say, old boy, he wheedled, you're my oldest friend. Is that right? That's right, agreed Tommy. Well, say, old friend, I'm pretty near all in. Go home, then, if you want to. I can pull this all right alone. Nothing doing, but if I could just little nap 10, 15 minutes, you could get a couple things here on first floor and then come and get me. Where? Third floor waiting room. Go ahead, but wait a minute. Give me some of your cards, and will I have any trouble charging things? Not a bit. Tell them you're me. It was thus that Tommy Richards was left alone in a large store with Billy Bowen's charge account, Billy Bowen's list, and Billy Bowen's cards. He glanced at the list. Samuel MacDonald, Cigarettes, Old Crab, he read. He approached a floor walker. Say, old pal, he said, I'm doing some shopping and I'm in a big hurry. Where'd I find something for an old cigarette fiend? Cigarette cases two aisles down and an aisle to your left said old pal. Tommy raised the limit on the cigarette case he picked out for Samuel McDonald. It was three dollars and seventy-five cents. I'll cut down somewhere else, he thought. The father-in-law ought to be favored a little. Charge, he said in response to a query. William Bowen, Bowen and Company, 18 South LaSalle. And here's a card for it. That go out tonight, sure? He looked again at the list. Mrs. Samuel MacDonald, Bridge Bug. Miss Harriet MacDonald, Reverse English. Miss Louise MacDonald, Thin Hair. Miss Mary Carey, Church Stuff. Bob and Wife, the man who married a dumb wife and gets mysteriously jealous. Walter MacDonald, Real Kid. Edith, Fat Lady. Wilma, A Splinter. He consulted old pal once more. Old pal's advice was to go to the third floor and look over the books. The advice proved sound. On the third floor, Tommy found for mother the first principles of auction bridge and for Aunt Harriet an English grammar. He also bumped into a counter laden with hymnals, chant books, and books of common prayer. Aunt Mary, he exclaimed, and to the clerk, how much are your medium prayer books? What denomination, asked the clerk, whose name was Frieda Swanson. One or two dollars, said Tommy. What church, I mean, inquired Frieda. How would I know, said Tommy. Are there different books for different churches? Sure, Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Lutheran. Let's see, MacDonald, Carey, how much are the Catholic ones? Here's one at a dollar and a half, in Latin, too. That's it. That'll give her something to work on. Tommy figured on the back of his list. 
Good work, Tommy, he thought. Four and a half under the top limit for those three. Walter's next. He plunged on Walter. A nice poker set, discovered on the fourth floor, came to five even. Tommy wished he could keep it for himself. He also wished constantly that the woman shoppers had taken a course in dodging. He was almost as badly battered as the day he played guard against the Indians. Three left besides the queen herself, he observed. Lord, no, I forgot Bob and his missus. He moved downstairs again to the books. Have you got the man who married a dumb wife, he queried. Hannah Henderson looked, but could not find it. Never mind, said Tommy. Here's one that'll do. And he ordered the green-eyed monster for the cooing doves in Evanston. Now, he figured, there's just Wilma and Edith and Aunt Louise. Once more he started away from the books, but a title caught his eye. Eat and grow thin. Great, exclaimed Tommy. It'll do for Edith. By George, it'll do for both of them. Eat for Wilma and the grow thin for Edith. I guess that's doubling up some. And now for Aunt Louise. The nearest floor walker told him in response to his query that switches would be found on the second floor. I ought to have a switch engine to take me round, said Tommy, who never had felt better in his life. But the floor walker did not laugh, possibly because he was tired. Have you anything to match it with? asked the lady in the switchyard. No, I haven't. Can you give me an idea of the color? What colors have you got? demanded Tommy. Everything there is. I'll show them all to you if you've got the time. Never mind, said Tommy. What's your favorite color in hair? The girl laughed. Golden, she said. You're satisfied, aren't you, said Tommy, for the girl had chosen the shade of her own shaggy mane. All right, make it golden, and a Merry Christmas to you. He forgot to ask the price of switches. He added up the rest and found that the total was $16.25. About 75 cents for the hair, he guessed. That will make it 17 even. I'm some shopper, and all done in an hour and 13 minutes. He discovered Billy asleep in the waiting room, and it took him three precious minutes to bring him to. Everybody's fixed but the girl herself, he boasted. I got books for most of them. Where you been, asked Billy. What time is it? You've got about 33 minutes to get a present for your lady love and grab your train. You'll have to pass up the office. What time is it? Where you been? Don't bother about that. Come on. On the ride down, Billy begged everyone in the elevator to tell him the time, but no one seemed to know. Tommy hurried him out of the store and into a taxi. There's a flock of stores around the station, said Tommy. You can find something there for the dame. But the progress of the cab through the packed downtown streets was painfully slow, and the station clock, when at last they got in sight of it, registered 517. You can't wait, said Tommy. Give me some money and tell me what to get. Billy fumbled clumsily in seven pockets before he located his pocketbook. In it were two fives and a ten. I gotta have a five-e, he said. All right, I'll get something for fifteen. What'll it be? Make it a wristwatch. Sure she has none? She's got one. That's for the other wrist. I used your last card. Have you got another? Pocketbook, said Billy. Tommy hastily searched and found a card. He pushed Billy toward the station entrance. Goodbye and Merry Christmas, said Tommy. Goodbye and God bless you, said Billy, but he was talking to a large policeman. Where are you trying to go, asked the latter. South Bend, said Billy. Hurry up then, you've only got a minute. The minute and six more were spent in the purchase of a ticket. And when Billy reached the gate, the 525 had gone and the 530 was about to chase it. Where to, inquired the gateman. South Bend, said Billy. Run then, said the gateman. Billy ran. He ran to the first open vestibule of the Rock Island train, bound for St. Joe, Missouri. Where to, asked a porter. South, said Billy. Ah, uh, I can see that, said the porter. But where are you going? 
The train began to move, and Billy, one foot dragging on the station platform, moved with it. The porter dexterously pulled him aboard, and he was allowed to ride to Englewood. Walking down Van Buren Street, it suddenly occurred to the genial Mr. Richards that he would have to go some himself to get his baggage and catch the 6.30 for the Northwest. He thought of it in front of a Van Buren jewelry shop. He stopped and went in. Three quarters of an hour later, a messenger boy delivered a particularly ugly and frankly inexpensive wristwatch at the McDonald home. The parcel was addressed to Miss McDonald, and the accompanying card read, Mr. Bowen, call me up any night after 7. Calumet 2678, Miss Violet Moore. There was no goodwill toward men in the McDonald home this Christmas. Ellen spent the day in bed and the orders were that she must not be disturbed. Downstairs, one person smiled. It was Walter. He smiled in spite of the fact that his father had tossed his brand-new five-dollar poker set into the open fireplace. He smiled in spite of the fact that he was not allowed to leave the house, not even to take Catherine to church. Gee, he thought between smiles, Billy sure had nerve. Bob walked around among his relatives, seeking to dispel the gloom with a remark that he thought apt and nifty. Be grateful, was the remark, that he had one of his screamingly funny moods before it was too late. But no one but Bob seemed to think much of the remark, and no one seemed grateful. Those are the facts, and it was quite a job to dig them up, but I did it. End of Chapter 1, The Facts, Part 2. Chapter 2, Part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Samples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter is a duet, read by William Jones, Bonita Springs, Florida, and Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 2. Some Like Them Cold. Part 1. New York, August 3rd. Dear Miss Gillespie, How about our bet now? As you bet me, I would forget all about you the minute I hit the big town, and would never write you a letter. Well, girlie, it looks like you lose, so pay me. Seriously, we will call all bets off, as I am not the kind that bet on a sure thing, and it sure was a sure thing that I would not forget a girlie like you, and all that is worrying me is whether it may not be the other way round. And you are wondering who this fresh guy is that is writing you this letter. I bet you are, so we'll try and refresh in your memory. Well, girlie, I am the handsome young man that was wandering round the La Salle Street station Monday and happened to sit down beside a mighty pretty girlie who was waiting to meet her sister from Toledo, and the train was late, and I am glad of it, because if it had not have been, that little girlie and I would never have met. So for once I was a lucky guy, but still I guess it was time I had some luck as it was certainly tough luck for you and I to both be living in shy all that time and never get together till a half hour before I was leaving town for good. Still, better late than never, you know, and maybe we can make up for lost time, though it looks like we would have to do our making up at long distance, unless you make good on your threat and come to New York. I wish you would do that little thing, girlie as it looks like that was the only way we would get a chance to play around together, as it looks like there was little or no chance of me coming back to Shy, as my whole future is in the big town. New York is the only spot, and especially for a man that expects to make my living in the songwriting game, as here is the Mecca for that line of work, and no matter how good a man may be, they don't get no recognition unless they live in New York. Well, girlie, you asked me to tell you all about my trip. Well, I remember you saying that you would give anything to be making it yourself, 
but as far as the trip itself was concerned you ought to be thankful you did not have to make it as you would have sweat your head off i know i did especially while going through indiana monday p m but monday night was the worst of all trying to sleep and finally i gave it up and just laid there with the perspiration rolling off of me though i was lying on top of the covers and nothing on but my underwear yesterday was not so bad as it rained most of the a m you coming through new york state and in the p m we rode alongside of the hudson all p m some river girlie and just looking at it makes a man forget all about the heat and everything else except a certain girlie whom i seen for the first time monday and then only for about half hour but she is the kind of girlie that a man don't need to see her only once and they would be no danger of forgetting her there i guess i'd better lay off that subject or you will think i am a fresh guy well that is about all to tell you about the trip only there was one amusing incident that came off yesterday which i will tell you well there was a dame got on the train at toledo monday and had the berth opposite mine but i did not see nothing of her that night as i was out smoking till late and she hit the hay early but yesterday a m she come in to dinner and sat at the same table with me and tried to make me and it was so raw that the dinge waiter seen it and gave me the wink and of course i paid no attention and i waited till she got through so as there would be no danger of her following me out but she stopped on the way to get a toothpick and when i came out she was out on the platform with it so i tried to brush right by but she spoke up and asked me what time it was and i told her and she said she guessed her watch was slow so i said maybe it just seemed slow on account of the company it was in i don't know if she got what i was driving at or not but anyway she gave up trying to make me and got off at albany she was a good looker but i have no time for gals that tries to make strangers on a train well if i don't quit you will think i am writing a book but we'll expect a long letter in answer to this letter and we will see if you can keep your promise like i have kept mine don't disappoint me girlie as I am all alone in a large city, and hearing from you will keep me from getting homesick for old Shy, though I never thought so much of the old town till I found out you live there. Don't think that is kidding, girlie, as I mean it. You can address me at this hotel, as it looks like I will be here right along, as it is on 47th Street, right off of Old Broadway, and handy to everything and i'm only paying twenty one dollars per week for my room and could have got one for sixteen but without a bath and i am glad to pay the difference as i am lost without my bath in the a m and sometimes at night too tomorrow i expect to commence fighting the battle of broadway and will let you know how i come out that is if you answer this letter in the meanwhile girlie all reservoir and don't do nothing i would not do your new friend, Charles F. Lewis. Chicago, Illinois, August the 6th. My dear Mr. Lewis, well, that certainly was a surprise party getting your letter, and you are certainly a wonder man to keep your word, as I am afraid most men of your sex are gay deceivers. But maybe you are different. Anyway, it sure was a surprise, and will gladly pay the bet if you will just tell me what it was we bet. Hope it was not money, as I am a working girl, but if it was not more than a dollar or two, we'll try to dig it up, even if I have to beg, borrow, and steal. Suppose you will think me a case to make a bet and then forget what it was, but you must remember, Mr. Man, that I had just met you and was dazzled. Joking aside, I was rather fussed, and will tell you why. Well, Mr. Lewis, I suppose you see lots of girls like the one you told me about that you saw on the train who tried to get acquainted, but I want to assure you that I am not one of those kind, and sincerely hope you will believe me when I tell you that you was the first man I ever spoke to meeting them like that, and my friends and the people who know me would simply faint if they knew I ever spoke to a man without a proper introduction. Believe me, Mr. Lewis, I am not that kind. 
and i don't know why i did it only that you were so different looking if you know what i mean and not at all like the kind of men that usually try to force their attentions on every pretty girl they see lots of times i act on impulse and let my feelings run away from me and sometimes i do things on the impulse of the moment which i regret them later on and that is what i did this time but i hope you won't give me cause to regret it and i know you won't as i know you're not that kind of a man especially after what you told me about the girl on the train but anyway as i say i was in a daze so i can't remember what it was we bet but we'll try and pay it if it does not break me sissy's train got in about ten minutes after yours had gone and when she saw me what do you think was the first thing she said well mr lewis she said why mibs that is the pet name some of my friends have given me what has happened to you i never seen you have as much color so i passed it off with some remark about the heat and changed the subject as i certainly was not going to tell her that i had just been talking to a man who i had never met or she would have dropped dead from the shock either that or she would not have believed me as it would be hard for a person who knows me well to imagine me doing a thing like that as i have quite a reputation for squelching men who try to act fresh i don't mean anything personal by that mr lewis as i am a good judge of character and could tell without you telling me that you are not that kind well sis and i have been on the go ever since she arrived as i took yesterday and today off so i could show her the sights though she says she would be perfectly satisfied to just sit in the apartment and listen to me rattle on i'm afraid i am a great talker mr lewis but sis says it is as good as a show to hear me talk as i tell things in such a different way as i cannot help from seeing the humorous side of everything and she says she never gets tired of listening to me but of course she is my sister and thinks the world of me <laughs> but she really does laugh like she enjoyed my craziness maybe i told you that i have a tiny little apartment which a girlfriend of mine and i have together and it is hardly big enough to turn around in but still it is home and i am a great home girl and hardly ever care to go out evenings except occasionally to the theater or dance but even if our nest is small we are proud of it and sis complimented us on how cozy it is and how homey it looks and she said she did not see how we could afford to have everything so nice and edith my girlfriend says mibs deserves all the credit for that <clears throat> i never knew a girl who could make as little money go a long ways like she can well of course she is my best friend and always saying nice things about me but i do try and i hope i get results have always said that good taste and being careful is a whole lot more important than lots of money though it is nice to have it you must write and tell me how you are getting along in the battle of broadway i laughed when i read that and whether the publishers like your songs though i know they will i'm crazy to hear them and hear you play the piano as i love good jazz music even better than classical though i suppose it is terrible to say such a thing but i usually say just what i think though sometimes i wish afterwards i had not of but still i believe it is better for a girl to be her own self and natural instead of always acting but i am afraid that i will never have a chance to hear you play unless you come back to shy and pay us a visit as my threat to come to new york was just a threat and i don't see any hope of ever getting there unless some rich new yorker should fall in love with me and take me there to live fine chance for poor little me eh mr lewis well i guess i've rattled on long enough and you will think i'm writing a book unless i quit and besides sis has asked me as a special favor to make her a pie for dinner maybe you don't know it mr man but i am quite famous for my pie and pastry but i don't suppose a genius is interested in common things like that well be sure and write soon and tell me what new york is like and all about it and don't forget the little girlie who was bad and spoke to a strange man in the station and having been blushing over it ever since your friend 
Mabel Gillespie. New York, August 10th. Dear Gurley, I bet you will think I'm a fresh guy, commencing that way, but Miss Gillespie is too cold, and a man cannot do nothing cold in this kind of weather, especially in this man's town, which is the hottest place I ever been in. And I guess maybe the reason why New Yorkers is so bad is because they think they are already in H, and cannot go no worse place, no matter how they behave themselves. Honest, girlie, I certainly envy you being where there is a breeze off the old lake, and shy may be dirty, but I never heard of nobody dying because they was dirty. But four people died here yesterday on account of the heat, and I seen two different women flop right on Broadway and had to be taken away in the ambulance, and it could not have been because they was dressed too warm, because it would be impossible for the women here to leave off any more clothes. Well, I have not had much luck yet in a battle of Broadway, as all the heads of the big music publishers is out of town on their vacation, and the big boys is the only ones I will do business with, as it would be silly for a man with the stuff I have got to waste my time on somebody that is just on the staff and have not got the final say. But I did play a couple of my numbers for the people up to Levy's and Gables, and they went crazy over them in both places. So it looks like all I have to do is wait for the big boys to get back and then play my numbers for them, and I will be all set. What I want is to get taken on the staff of one of the big firms, as that gives a man the inside, and they will plug your numbers more if you are on the staff. In the meanwhile, have not got nothing to worry me, but am just seeing the sights of the big town as have saved up enough money to play round for a while, and anyway, a man that can play piano like I can don't never have to worry about starving. Can certainly make the old music box talk, girly, and am always good for a seventy-five dollar or a hundred dollar job. Well, have been here a week now, and on the go every minute, and I thought I would be lonesome down here, but no chance of that, as I have been treated fine by the people I have met, and have sure met a bunch of them. One of the boys living in the hotel is a vaudeville actor, and he is a member of the Friars Club, and took me over there to dinner the other night, and some way or another the bunch got wise, I could play the piano. So, of course, I had to sit down and give them some of my numbers, and everybody went crazy over them. One of the boys I met there was Paul Sears, the songwriter, but he just writes the lyrics and has wrote a bunch of hits, and when he heard some of my melodies, he called me over to one side and said, he would like to work with me on some numbers. How is that, girlie? as he is one of the biggest hit writers in New York. But New York has got some mighty pretty girlies, and I guess it would not be hard to get acquainted with them, and in fact several of them has tried to make me since I've been here, but I always figure that a girl must be something wrong with her if she tries to make a man that she doesn't know nothing about, so I pass them all up. But I did meet a couple of pips that a man here in the hotel went up on Riverside Drive to see them, and insisted on me going along, and they got on some way that I could make a piano talk, so there was nothing but I must play for them. So I sit down and played some of my own stuff, and they went crazy over it. One of the girls wanted I should come up and see her again, and I said I might, but I think I'd better keep away, as she acted like she wanted to vamp me, and I am not the kind that likes to play around with a gal just for their company and dance with them, etc. But when I see the right gal, that will be a different thing, and she won't have to beg me to come and see her, as I will camp right on her trail till she says yes. And it won't be none of those New York fly-by-nights, neither. They are all right to look at, but a man would be a sucker to get serious with them, as they might take you up, and next thing you know, you would have a wife on your hands that don't know a dish rag from a waffle iron. Well, girlie, we'll quit and call it a day, 
as it is too hot to write any more, and I guess I will turn on the cold water and lay down in the tub a while, then turn in. Don't forget to write to your friend, Charles F. Lewis. Dear Mr. Mann, hope you won't think me a silly billy for starting my letter that way, but Mr. Lewis is so formal, and Charles is too much the other way, and anyway I would not dare call a man by their first name after only knowing them for only two weeks. Though I may as well confess that Charles is my favorite name for a man, and have always been crazy about it, as it was my father's name. Poor old dad, he died of cancer three years ago, but left enough insurance so that mother and we girls were well provided for and do not have to do anything to support ourselves, though I have been earning my own living for two years to make things easier for mother, and also because I simply can't bear to be doing nothing as I feel like a drone. So I flew away from the home nest, though mother felt bad about it, as I was her favorite, and she always said I was such a comfort to her, as when I was in the house she never had to worry about how things would go. But there I go, gossiping about my domestic affairs, just like you would be interested in them. Though I don't see how you could be, though personally I always like to know all about my friends, but I know men are different, so we'll try and not bore you any longer. Poor man, I certainly feel sorry for you, if New York is as hot as all that. I guess it has been very hot and shy, too. At least everybody has been complaining about how terrible it is. Suppose you will wonder why I say, I guess, and you will think I ought to know if it is hot. Well, sir, the reason I say, I guess, is because I don't feel the heat like others do, or at least I don't let myself feel it. That sounds crazy, I know, but don't you think there is a good deal in mental suggestion and not letting yourself feel things? I believe that if a person simply won't allow themselves to be affected by disagreeable things, why, such things won't bother them near as much. I know it works with me, and that is the reason why I am never cross when things go wrong, and keep smiling no matter what happens, and as far as the heat is concerned, why, I just don't let myself feel it, and my friends say I don't even look hot, no matter if the weather is boiling, and Edith, my girlfriend, often says that I am like a breeze, and it cools her off just to have me come in the room. Poor Edie suffers terribly during the hot weather, and says it almost makes her mad at me to see how cool and unruffled I look when everybody else is perspiring and have red faces, etc. I laughed when I read what you said about New York being so hot that people thought it was the other place. I can appreciate a joke, Mr. Man, and that one did not go over my head. I am still laughing at some of the things you said in the station, though they probably struck me funnier than they would most girls, as I always see the funny side, and sometimes something is said and I laugh, and the others wonder what I am laughing at, as they cannot see anything in it themselves. But it is just the way I look at things, so, of course, I cannot explain to them why I laughed, and they think I am crazy. But I had rather part with almost anything rather than my sense of humor, as it helps me over a great many rough spots. Sis has gone back home, though I would have liked to have kept her here much longer, but she had to go, though she said she would have liked nothing better than to stay with me and just listen to me rattle on. She always says it is just like a show to hear me talk, as I always put things in such a funny way, and for weeks after she has been visiting me, she thinks of some of the things I said and laughs over them. Since she left, Edith and I have been pretty quiet, though poor Edie wants to be on the go all the time, and tries to make me go out with her every evening to the pictures, and scolds me when I say I had rather stay home and read, and calls me a bookworm. Well, it is true that I had rather stay home with a good book than go to some crazy old picture, and the last two nights I have been reading myself to sleep with Robert W. Service's poems. Don't you love service, or don't you care for highbrow writings? Personally, there is nothing I love more than to just sit and read a good book or sit and listen to somebody play the piano. I mean, if they can really play, and I really believe I like popular music better than classical, though I suppose that is a terrible thing to confess, 
but i love all kinds of music but especially the piano when it is played by somebody who can really play i am glad you have not fallen for the ladies who have tried to make their acquaintance in new york you are right in thinking there must be something wrong with girls who try to pick up strange men as no girl with self-respect would do such a thing and when i say that mr man i know you will think it is a funny thing for me to say on account of the way our friendship started but i mean it and i assure you that was the first time i ever done such a thing in my life and would never have thought of doing it had i not known you were the right kind of a man as i flatter myself that i am a good judge of character and can tell pretty well what a person is like by just looking at them and i assure you i had made up my mind what kind of a man you were before i allowed myself to answer your opening remark otherwise i am the last girl in the world that would allow myself to speak to a person without being introduced to them when you write again you must tell me all about the girl on riverside drive and what she looks like and if you want to see her again and all about her suppose you will think i am a little old curiosity shop for asking all those questions and will wonder why i want to know well sir i won't tell you why so there but i insist on you answering all questions and will scold you if you don't maybe you will think that the reason why i am so curious is because i am jealous of the lady in question well sir i won't tell you whether i am or not but will keep you guessing now don't you wish you knew must close or you will think i am going to rattle on forever and maybe you have already become disgusted and torn my letter up if so all i can say is poor little me she was a nice little girl and meant well but the man did not appreciate her there we'll stop or you will think i am crazy if you do not already yours maybell end of chapter two part one of some like them cold part two coming up chapter two part two of how to write short stories with samples by ring lardner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. this chapter is a duet read by william jones bonita springs florida and michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter two some like them cold part two new york august twentieth dear girlie well girlie i suppose you thought i was never going to answer your letter but have been busier than a one-armed paper hanger the last week as have been working on a number with paul sears who is one of the best lyric writers in new york and has turned out as many hits as berlin or davis or any of them and believe me girlie he has turned out another hit this time that is he and i have done it together it is all done now and, and we're just waiting for the best chance to place it but we'll not place it nowheres unless we get the right kind of a deal and maybe we'll publish it ourselves the song is bound to go over big as sears has wrote a great lyric and i have given a great tune or at least everybody that has heard it goes crazy over it and it looks like it would go over bigger than any song since mammy and would not be surprised to see it come out the hit of the year if it is handled right we will make a bundle of money and sears says it is a cinch we will clean up as much as twenty five thousand dollars apiece which is pretty fair for one song but this one is not like the most of them and has got a great lyric and i have wrote a melody that will knock them out of their seats i only wish you could hear it girlie and hear it the way i play it i had to play it over and over about fifty times at the friars last night i will copy down the lyric of the chorus so you can see what it is like and get the idea of the song though of course you can't tell much about it unless you hear it played and sang the title of the song is when they are like you and here is the chorus some like them hot some like them cold some like them when they're not too darn old some like them fat some like them lean 
some like them only at sweet sixteen some like them dark some like them light some like them in the park late at night some like them fickle some like them true but the time i like them is when they are like you how is that for a lyric and i only wish i could play my melody for you as you would go nuts over it but we'll send you a copy as soon as the song is published and you can get some of your friends to play it over for you and i know you will like it though it is a different melody when i play it or when someone else plays it well girlie you'll see how busy i have been and am liable to keep right on being busy as we are not going to let the grass grow under our feet but as soon as we have got this number placed we will get busy on another one as a couple like that will put me on easy street even if they don't go as big as we expect but even twenty-five grand is a big bunch of money and if a man could only turn out one hit a year and make that much out of it i would be on easy street and no more hammering on the old music box in some cabaret whoever we take the song to we will make them come across with one grand for advanced royalties and that will keep me going till i can turn out another one so the future looks bright and rosy to yours truly and i am certainly glad i come to the big town though sorry i did not do it a whole lot quicker this is a great old town girlie and when you have lived here a while you wonder how you ever stood for a burg like shy which is just a hick town alongside of this besides being dirty etc and a man is a sucker to stay there all their life especially men in my line of work as new york is the mecca for a man that has got the musical gift i figure that all the time i spent in shy was just wasting my time and never really started to live till i come down here and i have to laugh when i think of the boys out there that is trying to make a living in the song-writing game and most of them starve to death all their life and the first week i am down here i meet a man like sears and the next thing you know we have turned out a song that will make us a fortune well girlie you asked me to tell you about the girlie up on the drive that tried to make me and asked me to come and see her again well i can assure you you have no reason to be jealous in that quarter as i have not been back to see her as i figure it is wasting my time to play around with a dame like she that wants to go out somewheres every night and if you married her she would want a house on fifth avenue with a dozen servants so i have passed her up as that is not my idea of home what i want when i get married is a real home where a man can stay home and work and and maybe have a few of his friends in once in a while and entertain them or go to a good musical show once in a while and have a wife that is in sympathy with you and not nag at you all the while but be a real helpmate the girlie up on the drive would run me ragged and have me in the poorhouse inside of a year even if i was making twenty-five grand out of one song besides she wears a make-up that you would have to blast to find out what her face looks like so i have not been back there and don't intend to see her again and so what is the use of me telling you about her and the only other girlie i have met is a sister of paul sears who i met up to his house while we was working on the song but she don't hardly count as she has not got no use for the boys and treats them like dirt and paul says she is the coldest proposition he ever seen well i don't know no more to write and besides have got a date to go out to paul's place for dinner and play some of my stuff for him so as he can see if he wants to set words to some more of my melodies well don't do nothing i would not do and have as good a time as you can in old shy and we'll let you know how we come along with the song charles f lewis chicago illinois august twenty third dear mr man 
I am thrilled to death over the song and think the words awfully pretty and am crazy to hear the music, which I know must be great. It must be wonderful to have the gift of writing songs and then hear people play and sing them and just think of making $25,000 in such a short time. My, how rich you will be, and I certainly congratulate you, though I am afraid when you are rich and famous, you will have no time for insignificant little me, or will you be an exception and remember your old friends even when you are up in the world? I sincerely hope so. We'll look forward to receiving a copy of the song, and will you be sure and put your name on it? I am already very conceited just to think that I know a man that writes songs and makes all that money. Seriously, I wish you success in your next song, and I laughed when I read your remark about being busier than a one-armed paper hanger. I don't see how you think up all those comparisons and crazy things to say. The next time one of the girls asks me to go out with him, I am going to tell them that I can't go because I am busier than a one-armed paper hanger. And then they will think I made it up and say, the girl is clever. Seriously, I am glad you did not go back to see the girl on the drive. And I'm also glad you don't like girls who make themselves up so much, as I think it is disgusting and would rather go around looking like a ghost than put artificial color on my face. Fortunately, I have a complexion that does not need fixing, but even if my coloring was not what it is, I would never think of lowering myself to fix it. But I must tell you a joke that happened just the other day when Edith and I were out at lunch, and there was another girl in the restaurant whom Edie knew, and she introduced her to me, and I noticed how this girl kept staring at me, and finally she begged my pardon and asked if she could ask me a personal question. And I said yes, and she asked me if my complexion was really mine. I assured her it was, and she said, Well, I thought so, because I did not think anybody could put it on so artistically. I certainly envy you. Edie and I both laughed. Well, if that girl envies me my complexion, why, I envy you living in New York. Chicago is rather dirty, though I don't let that part of it bother me, as I bathe and change my clothing so often that the dirt does not have time to settle. Edie often says she cannot see how I always keep so clean looking, and says I always look like I had just stepped out of a bandbox. She also calls me a fish, jokingly, because I spend so much time in the water. But seriously, I do love to bathe and never feel so happy as when I have just cleaned up and put on fresh clothing. Edie has just gone out to see a picture and was cross at me because I would not go with her. I told her I was going to write a letter, and she wanted to know to whom, and I told her, and she said, You write to him so often that a person would almost think you was in love with him. I just laughed and turned it off, but she does say the most embarrassing things, and I would be angry if it was anybody but she that said them. Seriously, I had much rather sit here and write letters or read or just sit and dream than go out to some crazy old picture show, except once in a while I do like to go to the theater and see a good play, and especially a musical play if the music is catchy. But as a rule, I am contented to just stay home and feel cozy, and lots of evenings Edie and I sit here without saying hardly a word to each other, though she would love to talk, but she knows I had rather be quiet, and she often says it is just like living with a deaf and dumb mute to live with me because I make so little noise around the apartment. I guess I was born to be a homebody, as I so seldom care to go gadding though I do love to have company once in a while, just a few congenial friends whom I can talk to and feel at home with and play chords or have some music. My friends love to drop in here, too, as they say Edie and I always give them such nice things to eat. Though poor Edie has not much to do with it, I am afraid, as she hates anything connected with cooking, which is one of the things I love best of anything, and I often say that when I begin keeping house in my own home, I will insist on doing most of my own work, as I would take so much more interest in it than a servant, though I would want somebody to help me a little if I could afford it, as I often think a woman that does all her own work is liable to get so tired that she loses interest in the bigger things of life, like books and music. Though, after all, what bigger thing is there than home-making, especially for a woman? I am sitting in the dearest old chair that I bought yesterday at a little store on the north side. 
this is one of my extravagance buying furniture and things for the house but i always say it is economy in the long run as i will always have them and have use for them and when i can pick them up at a bargain i would be silly not to though heaven knows i will never be poor in regards to furniture and rugs and things like that as mother's house in toledo is full of lovely things which she says she is going to give to sis and myself as soon as we have real homes of our own she is going to give me the first choice as i am her favorite she has the loveliest old things that you could not buy now for love or money including lovely old rugs and a piano which sis wanted to have a player attachment put on it but i said it would be an insult to the piano so we did not get one i am funny about things like that a specially old furniture and feel towards them like people whom i love poor mother i'm afraid she won't live much longer to enjoy her lovely old things as she has been suffering for years from stomach trouble and the doctor says it has been worse lately instead of better and her heart is weak besides i am going home to see her a few days this fall as it may be the last time she is very cheerful and always says she's ready to go now as she has had enough joy out of life and all she would like would be to see her girls settled down in their own homes before she goes there i go talking about my domestic affairs again and i will bet you are bored to death though personally i am never bored when my friends tell me about themselves but i won't rattle on any longer but will say good night and don't forget to write and tell me how you come out with this song and thanks for sending me the words to it will you write a song about me sometime i would be thrilled to death but i am afraid i am not the kind of girl that inspires men to write songs about them but i am just a quiet mouse that loves home and i am not giddy enough to be the heroine of a song well mr man good night and don't wait so long before writing again to yours maybell new york september eighth dear girlie well girlie have not got your last letter with me, so cannot answer what was in it, as I have forgotten if there was anything I was supposed to answer, and besides, have only a little time to write, as I have a day to go out on a party with the Sears. We are going to the George Might show, and afterwards somewhere for supper. Sears is the boy who wrote the lyric to my song, and it is him and his sister I am going to the party with. The sister is a cold fish that has no use for men, but she is show-crazy and insists on Paul taking her to three or four of them a week. Paul wants me to give up my room here and come and live with them, as they have plenty of room, and I am running a little low on money. But don't know if I will do it or not, as I am afraid I would freeze to death in the same house with a girl like this sister, as she is ice-cold, but she don't hang around the house much as she is always taking trips or going to shows or somewhere. So far, we have not had no luck with the song. All the publishers we have showed it to has went crazy over it, but they won't make the right kind of deal with us, and if they don't loosen up and give us a decent royalty rate, we are liable to put the song out ourselves and show them up. The man up to Goebbels told me the song was okay, and he liked it, but it was more of a production number than anything else, and ought to go in a show like The Follies. But they won't be in New York much longer, and what we ought to do is hold it till next spring. Meanwhile, I am working on some new numbers, and also have taken a position with the orchestra at the Wilton, and am going to work there starting next week. They pay good money, sixty dollars, and it will keep me going. Well, girlie, that is about all the news. I believe you said your father was sick, and hope he is better, and also hope you are getting along okay, and take care of yourself. When you have nothing else to do, write to your friend, Charles F. Lewis. Chicago, Illinois, September 11th. Dear Mr. Lewis, your short note reached me yesterday, and I must say I was puzzled when I read it. It sounded like you was mad at me, though I cannot think any reason why you should be. If there was something I said in my last letter that offended you, I wish you would tell me and what it was, and I will ask your pardon, though I cannot remember anything I could have said that you could take offense at. 
but if there was something why i assure you mr lewis that i did not mean anything by it i certainly did not intend to offend you in any way perhaps it is nothing i wrote you but you were worried on account of the publishers not treating you fair in regards to your song and that is why your letter sounded so distant if that is the case i hope that by this time matters have rectified themselves and the future looks brighter but anyway mr lewis don't allow yourself to worry over business cares as they will all come right in the end and i always think it is silly for people to worry themselves sick over temporary troubles but the best way is to keep smiling and look for the silver lining in the cloud that is the way i always do and no matter what happens i manage to smile and my girlfriend edie calls me sunny because i always look on the bright side remember also mr lewis that sixty dollars is the salary that a great many men would like to be getting and are living on less than that and supporting a wife and family on it i always say that a person can get along on whatever amount they make if they manage things in the right way so if it is business troubles mr lewis i say don't worry but look on the bright side but if it is something i wrote in my last letter that offended you i wish you would tell me what it was so i can apologize as i assure you i meant nothing and would not say anything to hurt you for the world please let me hear from you soon as i will not feel comfortable until i know i am not to blame for the sudden change sincerely maybel gillespie new york september twenty fourth dear miss gillespie just a few lines to tell you the big news or at least it is big news to me i am engaged to be married to paul sears sister and we are going to be married early next month and live in atlantic city where the orchestra i have been playing with has got an engagement in one of the big cabarets i know this will be a surprise to you as it was even a surprise to me as i did not think i would ever have the nerve to ask the girl the big question as she was always so cold and acted like i was just in the way but she said she supposed she would have to marry somebody some time and she did not dislike me as much as most of the other men her brother brought around and she would marry me with the understanding that she would not have to be a slave and work around the house and also i would have to take her to a show somewheres every night and if i could not take her myself she would run wild alone atlantic city will be okay for that has a lot of new shows opens down there and she will be able to see them before they get to the big town as for her being a slave i would hate to think of marrying a girl and then have them spend their lives in drudgery around the house we are going to live in a hotel till we find something better but we'll be in no hurry to start housekeeping as we will have to buy all new furniture betsy is some doll when she is all fixed up and believe me she knows how to fix herself up i don't know what she uses but it is weatherproof as i have been out in a rainstorm with her and we both got drowned but her face stayed on i would almost think it was real only she tells me different well girlie i may write to you again once in a while as betsy says she doesn't give a damn if i write to all the girls in the world just so i don't make her read the answers but that is all i can think of to say now except good-bye and good luck and may the right man come along soon and he will be a lucky man getting a girl that is such a good cook and got all that furniture etc but just let me give you a word of advice before i close and that is don't never speak to strange men who you don't know nothing about as they may get you wrong and think you are trying to make them it just happened that i knew better so you was lucky in my case but the luck might not last your friend charles f lewis chicago illinois september twenty seventh my dear mr lewis 
thanks for your advice and also thank your fiance for her generosity in allowing you to continue your correspondence with her rivals but personally i have no desire to take advantage of that generosity as i have something better to do than read letters from a man like you especially as i have a man friend who is not so generous as miss sears and would strongly object to my continuing a correspondence with another man it is at his request that i am writing this note to tell you not to expect to hear from me again allow me to congratulate you on your engagement to miss sears and i am sure she is to be congratulated too though if i met the lady i would be tempted to ask her to tell me her secret namely how is she going to run wild on sixty dollars sincerely maybelle gillespie end of chapter two some like them cold by ring lardner chapter three part one of how to write short stories with examples by ring lardner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by william jones benita springs florida chapter three alibi ike a typical tale of the backwoods of indiana some seventy years ago very interestingly depicted the author acknowledges his indebtedness to chief justice taft for some of the slang employed part one his right name was frank x farrell and i guess the x stood for excuse me because he never pulled a play good or bad on or off the field without apologizing for it alibi ike was the name carey wished on him the first day he reported down south of course we all cut out the alibi part of it right away for the fear he would overhear it and bust somebody but we called him ike right to his face and the rest of it was understood by everybody on the club except ike himself he asked me one time he says what do you call me ike for i ain't no yid carrie gave you the name i says it's his nickname for everybody he takes a liking to he mustn't have only a few friends then says i i never heard him say ike to nobody else but i was going to tell you about carrie naming him we'd been working out two weeks and the pictures was showing something when this burr joined us his first day out he stood up there so good and took such a reef at the old pill that he had everyone looking then him and carrie was together in left field catching fun goes and it was after he was through for the day that carrie told me about him what do you think of alibi ike asked carrie who's that i says this here feral in the outfield says carrie well, he looks like he could hit i says yes said carrie but he can't hit as near as good as he can apologize then carrie went on to tell me what ike had been pulling out there he dropped the first fly ball that was hit to him and told carrie his glove wasn't broke in good yet and carrie says the glove could easy have been kid gleason's grandfather he made a whale of a catch out on the next one and carrie says nice work or something like that but ike says he could have caught the ball with his back turned only he slipped when he started after it and besides that the air currents fooled him i thought you'd done well to get to the ball says carrie i ought to have been setting and under it says ike what did you hit last year carrie asked him i had malaria most of the season says ike i wound up with a three fifty six where would i have to go to get malaria says carrie but ike didn't wise up i and carrie and him sat at the same table together for supper it took him half an hour longer than us to eat because he had to excuse himself every time he lifted his fork doctor told me i needed starch he'd say and then toss a shovel full of potatoes into him or there ain't much meat on one of these chops he'd tell us and grab another one or he'd say nothing like onions for a cold 
and then he had dipped into the perfumery. Better try that applesauce, says Carrie. It'll help your malaria. Whose malaria? says I. He had forgot already why he had didn't only hit three fifty six last year. I and Carrie began to lead him on. Whereabouts did you say your home was? I asked him. I live with my folks, he says. We live in Kansas City. Not right down in the business part, outside a ways. How's that coming? says Carrie. I should think you'd get rooms in the post office. But Ike was too busy curing his cold to get that one. Are you married? I asked him. No, he says. I never run around much with girls, except to shows once in a while, and parties and dances and roller skating. Never take em to the prize fights, uh? says Carrie. We don't have no real good bouts, says Ike. Just bush stuff, and I never figured a boxing match was a place for the ladies. Well, after supper, he pulled his cigar out and lit it. I was just going to ask him what he'd done it for, but he beat me to it. Kind of rests a man to smoke after a good workout, he says. Kind of settles a man's supper, too. Looks like a pretty good cigar, says Carrie. Well, yeah, says I. A friend of mine gave it to me, a fellow in Kansas City that runs a billiard room. Do you play billiards? I asked him. Oh, I used to play a fair game, he says. I'm all out of practice now. Can't hardly make a shot. We coached him into a little four-handed battle, him and Carrie against Jack Mack and I. Say, he couldn't play billiards as good as Willie Hop, Not quite. But to hear him tell it, he didn't make a good shot all evening. I'd leave him an awful-looking layout, and he'd gather him up in one try, and then run a couple of hundred. And then between every carom he'd say he had put too much stuff on the ball, or the English didn't take, or the table wasn't true, or his stick was crooked, or something. And all the time he had the balls acting like they was Dutch soldiers, and him Kaiser Wilhelm. We started out to play fifty points, but we had to make it a thousand so as I and Jack and Carrie could try the table. The four of us sat around the lobby a while after he was through playing, and when it got along toward bedtime, Carrie whispered to me and says, I could like to go to bed, but he can't think up no excuse. Carrie hadn't hardly finished whispering when Ike got up and pulled it. Well, good night, boys, he says. I ain't sleepy, but I got some gravel in my shoes, and it's killin' my feet. Well, we knowed he had never left the hotel since we came in from the grounds and changed our clothes. So Carrie says, I should think they'd take them gravel pits out of the billiard room. But Ike was already on his way to the elevator, limpin'. He's got the world beat, said Carrie to Jack and I. I've knew lots of guys that had an alibi for every mistake they made. I've heard pitchers say that the ball slipped when somebody cracked one off of them. I've heard infielders complain of a sore arm after heaving one into the stands. And I've saw outfielders took and sick with a dizzy spell when they've misjudged a fly ball. But this baby can't even go to bed without apologizing. And I bet he excuses himself to the razor when he gets ready to shave. And at that, says Jack, he's going to make us a good man. Yes, says Carrie, unless rheumatism keeps his batting average down to 400. Well, sir, I kept wailing away at the ball all through the trip till everybody knowed he had won a job. Cap had him in there regular the last few exhibition games and told the newspaper boys a week before the season opened that he was going to start him in Kane's place. You're there, kid, said Carrie to Ike, the night Kappa made the announcement. There ain't many boys that wins a big league berth their third year out. I'd have been up here a year ago, says Ike, only I was bent over all season with a lumbago. It rained down in Cincinnati one day. Part two. And somebody organized a little game of cards. They was two men shy to make six, and asked I and Carrie to play. 
I am with you. If you get Ike and make it seven-handed, said Carry. So they got a hold of Ike, and we went up to Smitty's room. I pretty near forgot how many you deal, says Ike. It's been a long while since I played. I and Carry gave each other the wink, and sure enough, he was just as ignorant about poker as billiards. But the second hand, the pot was opened two or three ahead of him, and there was three in it when it came to his turn. It cost a buck, and he throwed in two. It's raised, boys, someone says. Gosh, that's right, I did raise it, says I. Take out a buck if you didn't mean to tilt her, says Carrie. No, says I. I'll leave it go. Well, it was raised back at him, and then he made another mistake and raised again. There was only three left in when the draw come. Smitty and open with a pair of kings, and he didn't help him. Ike stood pat. The guy that had raised him back was flushing, and he didn't fill. So Smitty checked, and Ike bet, and didn't get no call. He tossed his hand away, but I grabbed it and gave it a look. He had a king, queen, jack, and two tens. Out by Ike, he must have seen me peeking, for he leaned over and whispered to me, I overlooked my hand, he says. I thought all the while it was a straight. Yeah, I says. That's why you raised twice by mistake. There was another pot that he came into with tens and fours. It was tilted a couple of times, and two of the strong fellows drawed ahead of Ike. They each drawed one. So Ike throwed away his little pair and come out with four tens and they was four trays against him. Carrie had looked at Ike's discard, and then he says, This lucky bum busted two pair. No, no, I didn't, says Ike. Yes, yes, you did, says Carrie, and showed us the two fours. What do you know about that, says Ike? I'd have swore one of them was a five spot. Well, we hadn't had no payday yet, and after a while everybody except Ike was going shy. I could see him getting restless, and I was wondering how he'd make the getaway. He tried two or three times. I gotta buy some collars before supper, he says. No hurry, says Smitty. The stores here keep open all night in April. After a minute he opened up again. My uncle out in Nebraska ain't expected to live, he says. I ought to send a telegram. Would that save him? says Carry. No, it sure wouldn't, says Ike. But I ought to leave my old man know where I'm at. When did you hear about your uncle? says Carry. Just this morning, says Ike. Who told you? asked Carry. I got a wire from my old man, says Ike. Well, says Carry, your old man knows you're still here yet this afternoon if you was here this morning. Trains leaving Cincinnati in the middle of the day, don't carry no ball clubs. Yeah, says Ike, that's true, but he don't know where I'm going to be next week. Ain't he got no schedule? asked Carrie. I sent him one opening day, says Ike, but it takes me a long time to get to Idaho. I thought your old man lived in Kansas City, says Carrie. He does when he's home, says Ike. But now, says Carrie, I suppose he's went to Idaho so as he can be near your sick uncle in Nebraska. He's visiting my other uncle in Idaho. Then how does he keep posted about your sick uncle? asked Carrie. Well, he don't, says I. He don't even know my other uncle's sick. That's why I ought to wire and tell him. Good night, says Carrie. What town in Idaho is your old man at? I says. Ike thought it over. No town at all, he says, but he's near a town. Near what town, I says. Yuma, says I. Well, by this time he had lost two or three pots, and he was desperate. We was playing just as fast as we could, because we seen we couldn't hold him much longer. But he was trying so hard to frame an escape that he couldn't pay no attention to the cards, and it looked like would get his whole pile away from him if we could make him stick. The telephone saved him. The minute it began to ring, five of us jumped for it, 
but Ike was there first. Yes, he says, answering it. This is him. I'll come right down. And he slammed up the receiver and beat it out at the door without even saying goodbye. Smitty had ought to lock to the door, says Gary. What did he win? asked Gary. Well, we figured it up sixty odd bucks. And the next time we asked him to play, says Gary, his fingers will be so stiff he can't hold the cards. Well, we sat round a while, talking it over, and pretty soon the telephone rang again. Smitty answered it. It was a friend of his'n from Hamilton, and he wanted to know why Smitty didn't hurry down. He was the one that had called before, and Ike had told him he was Smitty. Ike ought to split with Smitty's friend, says Gary. No, I says, he'll need all he won. It costs money to buy collars and to send telegrams from Cincinnati to your old man in Texas and keep him posted on the health of your uncle in Cedar Rapids, D.C. Part 3 And you ought to hurt him out there on that field. They wasn't a day when he didn't pull six or seven, and it didn't make no difference whether he was going good or bad. If he popped up in the pinch, he should have made a base hit, and the reason he didn't was so-and-so. And if he cracked one for three bases, he ought to have had a home run, only the ball wasn't lively, or the wind brought it back, or he trimmed on a lump of dirt round in first base. There was one afternoon in New York when he beat all records. Big Mark Ward was working against us, and he was good. In the first inning, I hit one clear over that right field stand, but it was a few feet foul. Then he got another foul, and then the count came to two and two. Then Rube slipped one across on him, and he was called out. What do you know about that, he says afterward on the bench. I lost count. I thought it was three and one, and I took a strike. You took a strike all right, says Gary. Even the ump's nota was a strike. Yeah, says Ike, but you can bet I wouldn't have took it if I'd known it was the third one. The scoreboard had it wrong. That scoreboard ain't for you to look at, says Cap. It's for you to hit the old pill against. Well, says Ike, I could have hit that one over the scoreboard if I knew it was the third. Was it a good ball, I says? Well, no, it wasn't, says I. It was inside. How far inside, says Carrie? Oh, two or three inches or half a foot, says I. I guess you wouldn't have threatened the scoreboard with it then, says Cap. I'd have pulled it down the right foul line if I hadn't thought he'd call it a ball, says I. Well, in New York's part of the inning, Doyle cracked one and Ike ran back a mile and a half, and caught it with one hand. We was all saying what a whale of a play it was. But he had to apologize just the same as for getting struck out. That stands so high, he says, that a man couldn't never see a ball till it's right on top of you. Didn't you see that one? asked Cap. Not at first, says I, not till it raised up above the roof of the stand. Then why did you start back as soon as the ball was hit? says Cap. I knowed by the sound that he'd got a good hold of it, says I. Yes, says Cap, but how'd you know that what direction to run in? Doyle usually hits him that way, the way I run, says I. Why don't you play blindfold? says Carrie. Might as well with that big high stand to bother a man says I. If I could have saw the ball all the time, I'd have got it in my hip pocket. Along in the fifth, we was one run to the bad, and I got on with one out. On the first ball, throw to Smitty, Ike went down. The ball was outside, and Myers throwed Ike out by ten feet. You could see Ike's lips moving all the way to the bench, and when he got there, he had his piece learned. Why didn't he swing, he says. Why didn't you wait for his sign, says Cap. He gave me his sign, says I. What is his sign with you, says Cap. Picking up some dirt with his right hand, says Ike. 
well i didn't see him do it cap says he done it all right says ike well smitty went out and they wasn't no more argument till they came in for the next inning then cap opened it up you fellows better get your signs straight he says you mean me says smitty yes cap says what's your sign with ike sliding my left hand up to the end of the bat and back says smitty do you hear that ike asked cap what of it says ike you says his sign was picking up dirt and he says it's sliding his hand which is right i'm right says smitty but if you're arguing about him going last inning i didn't give him no sign you pulled your cap down with your right hand didn't you asked ike well suppose i did says smitty that don't mean nothing i never told you to take that for a sign did i i thought maybe you meant to tell me and forgot says ike they couldn't none of us answer that and they wouldn't have been no more said if ike had of shut up but while we was settin there carrie got on with two out and stole second clean there says ike that's what i was trying to do and i'd have got away with it if smitty had swang and bothered the indian oh says smitty you was trying to steal then was you i thought you claimed i gave you the hit and run i didn't say no such thing says ike i thought maybe you might have gave me the sign but i was going anyway because i thought i had a good start cap probably would have hit him with a bat only just about that time doyle booted one on hayes and carrie came across with a run that tied well we go into the ninth finally one and one and mark ward walks mcdonald with nobody out lay it down cap says to ike and ike goes up there with orders to bunt and cracks the first ball into that right field stand it was fair this time and we were ahead but i didn't think about that at the time i was too busy watching cap's face first he turned pale and then he got red as fire then he got blue and purple and finally he just laid back and busted out laughing so we wasn't afraid to laugh ourselves when we seen him doing it and when ike came in everybody on the bench was in hysterics but instead of taking advantage ike had to try and excuse himself his play was to shut up and he didn't know how to make it well he says if i hadn't hit quite so quick on that one i bet it would have cleared this center field fence cap stopped laughing it'll cost you plain fifty he says what for says i when i say bunt i mean bunt says cap you didn't say bunt says ike i says lay it down says cap if that don't mean bunt what does it mean lay it down means bunt all right says i but i understood you to say lay on it all right says cap and that little misunderstanding will cost you fifty he didn't say nothing for a few minutes then he had another bright idea i was just kidding about misunderstanding you he says i know you wanted me to bunt well then why didn't you bunt asked cap i was going to on the next ball says ike but i thought if i took a good wallop i'd have him all fooled so i walloped at the first one to fool him and i didn't have no intention of hitting it you tried to miss it did you says cap well, yes says i how'd you happen to hit it asked cap well i says i was looking for him to throw me a fast one and i was going to swing under it but he come with a hook and i met it right square where i was swinging to go under the fast one great says cap boys he says ike's learned how to hit marquardt's curve pretend a fast one's coming and then try to miss it it's a good thing to know and ike ought to be willing to pay for the lesson so i'm going to make it a hundred instead of fifty the game wound up three to one the fine didn't go because ike hit like a wild man all through that trip and we made pretty near a clean-up 
The night we went to Philly, I got him cornered in the car, and I says to him, Forget them alibis for a while, and tell me something. What'd you do that for? Swing that time against Mark Ward when you was told to bunt. I'll tell you, he says. That ball he throwed me looked just like the one I struck out on in the first inning, and I wanted to show Cap what I could have done to that other one if I'd known it was the third strike. But, I says, the one you struck out on in the first inning was a fastball. So was the one I cracked in the ninth, said Ike. End of chapter 3, part 1 Alibi Ike. Chapter 3, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Bonita Springs, Florida. Chapter 3, Alibi Ike, Section 2, Part 4. You saw Cap's wife, of course. Well, her sister's about twice as good-looking as her, and that's going some. Cap took his missus down to St. Louis the second trip, and the other one come down from St. Joe to visit her. Her name is Dolly, and some doll is right. Well, Cap was going to take the two sisters to a show, and he wanted a bow for Dolly. He left it to her, and she picked Ike. He had hit three on the nose that afternoon, often Sally, too. They fell for each other that first evening. Cap told us how it come off. She began flattering Ike for the star game he had played, and, of course, he began excusing himself for not doing better. So she thought he was modest, and it went strong with her. And she believed everything he said, and that made her solid with him, that and her make-up. They was together every morning and evening for the five days we was there. In the afternoons, Ike played the grandest ball you ever see, hitting and running the bases like a fool and catching everything that stayed in the park. I told Cap, I says, you ought to keep the doll with us and, and he'd make Cobb's figures look sick. But Dolly had to go back to St. Joe and we come home for a long series. Well, for the next three weeks, I had a letter to read every day, and hit set in the clubhouse reading it to morning practice half over. Cap didn't say nothing to him, because he was going so good. But I and Carrie wasted a lot of our time trying to get him to own up who the letters was from. Fine chanced. What are you reading? Carrie would say. A bill? No, I could say. Not exactly a bill. It's a letter from a fellow I used to go to school with. High school or college? I'd ask him. College, he'd say. What college? I'd say. Then he'd stall a while, and then he'd say, I didn't go to the college myself, but my friend went there. How did it happen? You didn't go? Carrie would ask him. Well, he'd say, there wasn't no colleges near where I lived. Didn't you live in Kansas City? I'd say to him. One time he'd say he did, and another time didn't. One time he says he lived in Michigan. Where at? says Carrie. Near Detroit, he says. Well, I says, Detroit's near Ann Arbor, and that's where they got the university. Yes, says I. They got it there now, but they didn't have it there then. I came pretty near to going to Syracuse, says I. Only there wasn't no railroads running through there in them days. Where'd this friend of yours go to college? says Gary. I forget now, says I. Was it Carlisle? asked Terry. No, says Ike. His folks weren't very well off. That's what barred me from Smith, I says. I was going to tackle Cornell's says Carrie, but the doctor told me I'd have hay fever if I didn't stay up north. Your friend writes long letters, I says. Yes, says I. He's telling me about a ball player. 
Where does he play? asked Carrie. Down in the Texas League, Fort Wayne, says I. It looks like a girl's writing, Carrie says. A girl wrote it, says Ike. That's my friend's sister writing for him. Uh, didn't they teach writing at this here college where he went, says Carrie. Sure, Ike says. They taught him writing, but he got his hand cut off in a railroad wreck. How long ago, I says. Right after he got out of college, says Ike. Well, I says, I should think he'd have learned to write with his left hand by this time. It was his left hand that was cut off, says I, and he was left-handed. You get a letter every day, says Carrie. They're all the same writing. Is he telling you about a different ball player every time he writes? No, says I, it's the same ball player. He just tells me what he does every day. From the size of the letters, they don't play nothing but double headers down there, says Carrie. We figured that Ike spent most of his evenings answering the letters from his friend's sister, so we kept trying to date him up for shows and parties to see how he'd duck out of them. He was bugs over spaghetti, so we told him one day that there was going to be a big feed of it over to Joe's that night, and he was invited. How long will it last, he says. Well, we says, we're going right over there after the game and stay until they close up. I can't go, he says, unless they leave me come home at eight bales. Nothing doing, says Gary. Joe'd get sore. Well, I can't go then, says I. Well, why not? I asked him. Well, he says, my landlady locks up the house at eight, and I left my key home. Ah, oh, you can come home and stay with me, says Gary. No, he says, I can't sleep in a strange bed. How do you get along when we're on the road, says I. I don't never sleep on the first night anywheres, he said. After that I'm all right. You left time to chase home and get your key right after the game, I told him. Well, the key ain't home, says I. I lent it to one of the other fellows, and he's went out of town and took it with him. Couldn't you borrow another key off the landlady? Carrie asked him. No, he said, that's the only one there is. Well, the day before we started east again, I came into the clubhouse all smiles. Your birthday? I asked him. No, he says. What do you feel so good about? I says. Got a letter from my old man, he says. My uncle's going to get well. Is that the one in Nebraska? Says I. Not right in Nebraska, says I. Near there. But afterward, we got the right dope from Cap. Dolly had blew in from Missouri and was going to make the trip with her sister. Part 5 Well, I want to alibi Carrie and I for what come off in Boston. If we'd have had any idea what we was doing, we'd never did it. There wasn't nobody outside of maybe Ike and the dame that felt worse over it than I and Carrie. The first few days we didn't see nothing of Ike and her except out to the park. The rest of the time they was sightseeing over to Cambridge and down to Revere and out to Brookline and all the other places where the rubes go. But when we came into the beanery after the third game, Cap's wife called us over. If you want to see something pretty, she says, look at the third finger on Sis's left hand. Well, of course, we know before we looked that it wasn't going to be no hangnail. Nobody was surprised when Dolly blew into the dining room with it, a rock that I had bought off in Diamond Joe the first trip to New York. Only, of course, it had been set in a lady-sized ring instead of the automobile tire he had been wearing. Cap and his missus and Ike and Dolly ate supper together, only Ike didn't eat nothing but just sat there blushing and spilling things on the tablecloth. I heard him excusing himself for not having no appetite. He says he could never eat when he was close to the ocean. He'd forgot about them sixty-five oysters he had destroyed the first night of the trip before. He was going to take her to a show, so after supper he went upstairs to change his collar. She had to doll up, too, and of course Ike was through long before her. If you remember the hotel in Boston, there's a little parlor where the piano's at, and 
Then there's another little parlor opening off of that. Well, when Ike came down, Smitty was playing a few chords, and I and Carrie was harmonizing. We'd seen Ike go up to the desk to leave his key, and we called him in. He tried to duck away, but we wouldn't stand for it. We asked him what he was all duded up for, and he says he was going to the theater. Going alone? says Carrie. No, he says, a friend of mine's going with me. And what do you say if we go along? says Carrie. I ain't only got two tickets, he says. Well, says Carrie, we can go down there with you and buy our own seats. Maybe we can all get together. No, no says I, they ain't no more seats. They're all sold out. I'll bet we can buy some off in the scalpers, says Carrie. I wouldn't if I was you, said I. They say the show's rotten. Well, what are you going for then, I asked. I didn't hear about it being rotten till I got the tickets, he says well i says you don't want to go i'll buy the tickets from you no says i i wouldn't want to cheat you i'm stung and i'll just have to stand for it what are you going to do with the girl leave her here at the hotel i says what girl says ike the girl you at supper with i says oh he says we just happened to go into the dining room together that's all Cap wanted I should sit down with him. I noticed, says Carrie, that she happened to be wearing that rock you bought off in Diamond Joe. Yes, says I, I lent it to her for a while. Did you lend her the new ring that goes with it? I says. Oh, she had that already, says I. She lost the set out of it. I wouldn't trust no strange girl with a rock of mine, says Carrie. Oh, I guess she's all right, I says. Besides, I was tired of the stone. When a girl asks you for something, what are you going to do? He started out toward the desk, but we flagged him. Wait a minute, Carrie says. I got a bet with Sam here, and it's up to you to settle it. Well, says Ike, make it snappy. My friend will be here any minute. I bet, says Carrie, that you and the girl was engaged to be married. Oh, nothing to it says ike now look here says carrie this is going to cost me real money if i lose cut out the alibi stuff and give it to us straight cap's wife just as good as told us you was roped ike blushed like a kid well boys he says i may as well own up you win carrie yet a boy says carrie congratulations got a swell girl ike i says she's a peach says smitty well i guess she's okay says i i don't know much about girls did you ever run around with them i says oh yeah plenty of them says i but i never seen none i'd fall for that is till you seen this one says carrie well says i this one's okay but i wasn't thinking about getting married yet a while who done the asking her says carrie oh no says i but sometimes a man don't know what he's getting into take a good looking girl and a man generally almost always does about what she wants him to do they couldn't no girl lasso me unless i wanted to be lassoed says smitty oh i don't know says i when a fellow gets to feeling sorry for one of them it's all off well we left him to go after shaking hands all around but he didn't take dolly to no show that night some time while he was talking she had came into that other parlor and she had stood there and heard us i don't know how much she heard but it was enough dolly and cap's missus took the midnight train for new york and from there cap's wife sent her on her way back to missouri she left the ring and a note for ike with the clerk but we didn't ask Ike if the note was from his friend in Fort Wayne, Texas. Part 6 When we had come to Boston, Ike was hitting plane 397. When we got back home, he had fell off to pretty near nothing. He hadn't drove one out of the infield in any of them other eastern parks, and he didn't even give no excuse for it. 
to show you how bad he was, he struck out three times in Brooklyn one day and never opened his trap when Cap asked him what was the matter. Before, if he had whiffed once in the game, he'd have wrote a book telling why. Well, we dropped him from first place to fifth in four weeks, and we was still going down. I and Carey was about the only ones in the club that spoke to each other, and all as we did was remind ourselves of what a boner we had pulled. It's going to beat us out of the big money, says Carey. Yes, I says, I don't want to knock my own ball club, but it sure looks like a one-man team, and when that one man's dauber's down, we couldn't trim our whiskers. We ought to knew better, says Carey. Yes, I says, but why should a man pull an alibi for being engaged to such a bearcat as she was? He shouldn't, says Carey, but I and you knowed he would, or else we'd never started talking to him about it. He wasn't no more ashamed of the girl than I am of a regular base hit, but he just can't come clean on no subject. Cap had the whole story, and I and Carey was as popular with him as an umpire. What do you want me to do, Cap? Carey would say to him before going up to hit. Use your own judgment, Cap told him. We want to lose another game. But finally, one night in Pittsburgh, Cap had a letter from his missus, and he come to us with it. You fellows, he says, is the one that put us on the bum, and if you're sorry, I think there's a chance for you to make good. The old lady's out to St. Joe, and she's been trying her hardest to fix things up. She explained that I don't mean nothing with his talk. I've wrote and explained that to Dolly, too, but the old lady says that Dolly says she can't believe it. But Dolly's still stuck on this baby and she's a pining away just the same as Ike. And the old lady says she thinks if you two fellows would write to the girl and explain how you was always kidding with Ike and leading him on, and how the ball club was all shot to pieces since Ike quit hitting, and how he acted like he was going to kill himself, and this and that, she'd fall for it and maybe soften down. Dolly, the old lady says, would believe you before she'd believe I and the old lady, because she thinks it's her we're sorry for, not him. Well, I and Carrie was only too glad to try and see what we could do, but it wasn't no snap. We wrote about eight letters before we got one that looked good. Then we give it to the stenographer and had it typed out on a typewriter, and both of us signed it. It was Carrie's idea that made the letter good. He stuck in something about the world's serious money that our wives wasn't going to spend unless she took a pity on the boy, who was so shy and modest that he was afraid to come right out and say that he had asked such a beautiful and handsome girl to become his bride. That's probably what got her, or maybe she wouldn't have held out much longer anyway. It was four days after we sent the letter that Cap heard from his missus again. We was in Cincinnati. We've won, he says to us. The old lady says that Dolly says she'll give him another chance. But the old lady says it won't do no good for Ike to write a letter. He'll have to go out there. Send him tonight, says Carrie. I'll pay half his fare, says I. I'll pay the other half, says Carrie. No, says Cap, the club will pay his expenses. I'll send him scouting. Are you going to send him tonight? Sure, says Cap but I'm going to break the news to him right now. It's time we win a ball game. So in the clubhouse, just before the game, Cap told him, and I certainly felt sorry for Rube Benton and the Red Ames that afternoon, and I and Carrie was standing in front of the hotel that night when Ike comes out with his suitcase. Sent home, I said to him. No, he says, I'm going scouting. Where to, I says, Fort Wayne? No, not exactly, he says. Well, says Carrie, have a good time. I ain't looking for no good time, says I. I says I was going scouting. Well, then, says Carrie, I hope you see somebody you like. And you better have a drink before you go, I says. Well, says I, they claim it helps the cold. End of chapter 3, part 2, Alibi Ike.
Chapter 4, Part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 4, The Golden Honeymoon, Part 1. Mother says that when I start talking, I never know when to stop. But I tell her the only time I get a chance is when she ain't around, so I have to make the most of it. I guess the fact is neither one of us would be welcome in a Quaker meeting. But as I tell Mother, what did God give us tongues for if he didn't want we should use them? Only she says he didn't give them to us to say the same thing over and over again like I do and repeat myself. But I say, Well, mother, I say, when people is like you and I have been married 50 years, do you expect everything I say will be something you ain't heard me say before? But it may be new to others as they ain't nobody else lived with me as long as you have. So she says, You can't bet they ain't, as they couldn't nobody else stand you that long. Well, I tell her, you look pretty healthy. Maybe I do, she will say, but I looked even healthier before I married you. You can't get ahead of mother. Yes, sir, we was married just 50 years ago, the 17th day of last December, and my daughter and son-in-law was over from Trenton to help us celebrate the golden wedding. My son-in-law is John H. Kramer, the real estate man. He made $12,000 one year and is pretty well thought of around Trenton. A good, steady, hard worker. The Rotarians was after him a long time to join, but he kept telling them his home was his club. But Edie finally made him join. That's my daughter. Well, anyway, they come over to help us celebrate the golden wedding, and it was pretty crimpy weather, and the furnace don't seem to heat up no more like it used to, and Mother made the remark that she hoped this winter wouldn't be as cold as the last, referring to the winter previous. So Edie said if she was us, and nothing to keep us home, she certainly wouldn't spend no more winters up here, and why didn't we just shut off the water and close up the house and go down to Tampa, Florida? You know, we was there four winters ago and stayed five weeks, but it cost us over $350 for a hotel bill alone. So Mother said we wasn't going no place to be robbed. So my son-in-law spoke up and said that Tampa wasn't the only place in the South. And besides, we didn't have to stop at no high-priced hotel, but could rent us a couple rooms and board out somewheres. And he had heard that St. Petersburg, Florida was the spot, and if we said the word, he would write down there and make inquiries. Well, to make a long story short, we decided to do it, and Edie said it would be our golden honeymoon, and for a present my son-in-law paid the difference between a section and a compartment, so as we could have a compartment and have more private to see. In a compartment, you have an upper and a lower berth, just like the regular sleeper. But it is a shut-in room by itself and got a wash bowl. The car we went in was all compartments and no regular berths at all. It was all compartments. We went to Trenton the night before and stayed at my daughter and son-in-law, and we left Trenton the next afternoon at 3.23 p.m. This was the 12th day of January. Mother sat facing the front of the train as it makes her giddy to ride backwards. I sat facing her, which does not affect me. We reached North Philadelphia at 4.03 p.m., and we reached West Philadelphia at 4.14, but did not go into Broad Street. We reached Baltimore at 6.30 and Washington, D.C. at 7.25. Our train laid over in Washington two hours till another train come along to pick us up, and I got out and strolled up the platform and into Union Station. When I come back, our car had been switched onto another track, but I remember the name of it, the LaBelle, 
as I once had visited my aunt out in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, where there was a lake of that name, so I had no difficulty in getting located. But Mother had nearly fretted herself sick for fear I would be left. Well, I said, I would have followed you on the next train. You could have, said Mother, and she pointed out that she had the money. Well, I said, we are in Washington, and I could have borrowed from the United States Treasury. I would have pretended I was an Englishman. Mother caught the point and laughed heartily. Our train pulled out of Washington at 9.40 p.m., and Mother and I turned in early, I taking the upper. During the night, we passed through the green fields of old Virginia, though it was too dark to tell if they was green or what color. When we got up in the morning, we was at Fayetteville, North Carolina. We had breakfast in the dining car, and after breakfast, I got in conversation with the man in the next compartment to ours. He was from Lebanon, New Hampshire, and a man about 80 years of age. His wife was with him and two unmarried daughters, and I made the remark that I should think the four of them would be crowded in one compartment. But he said they had made the trip every winter for 15 years and knowed how to keep out of each other's way. He said they was bound for Tarpon Springs. We reached Charleston, South Carolina at 12.50 p.m. and arrived at Savannah, Georgia at 4.20. We reached Jacksonville, Florida at 8.45 p.m. and had an hour and a quarter to lay over there, but Mother made a fuss about me getting off the train, so we had the darky make up our berths and retired before we left Jacksonville. I didn't sleep good as the train done a lot of hemming and hawing and Mother never sleeps good on a train as she says she is always worrying that I will fall out. She says she would rather have the upper herself as then she would not have to worry about me. But I tell her I can't take the risk of having it get out that I allowed my wife to sleep in an upper berth. It would make talk. We was up in the morning in time to see our friends from New Hampshire get off at Tarpon Springs, which we reached at 6.53 a.m. Several of our fellow passengers got off at Clearwater and some at Bel Air, where the train backs right up to the door of the Mammoth Hotel. Bel Air is the winter headquarters for the Gulf dudes, and everybody that got off there had their bag of sticks, as many as 10 and 12 in a bag, women and all. When I was a young man, we called it shinny and only needed one club to play with and about one game of it would have been a plenty for some of these dudes, the way we played it. The train pulled into St. Petersburg at 8.20 and when we got off the train, you would think there was a riot, what with all the darkies barking for the different hotels. I said, Mother, I said, it is a good thing we have got a place picked out to go to and don't have to choose a hotel as it would be hard to choose amongst them if every one of them is the best. She laughed. We found a jitney, and I gave him the address of the room my son-in-law had got for us, and soon we was there and introduced ourselves to the lady who owns the house, a young widow about 48 years of age. She showed us our room, which was light and airy, with a comfortable bed and bureau and washstand. It was $12 a week, but the location was good, only three blocks from Williams Park. St. Pete is what folks call the town, though they also call it the Sunshine City, as they claim there's no other place in the country where there's fewer days when old soul don't smile down on Mother Earth. And one of the newspapers gives away all their copies free every day when the sun don't shine. They claim to have only given them away some 60-odd times in the last 11 years. Another nickname they have got for the town is the Poor Man's Palm Beach. But I guess they's men that comes there that could borrow as much from the bank as some of the Willie Boys over to the other Palm Beach. During our stay, we paid a visit to the Lewis Tent City, which is the headquarters for the Tin Can Tourists. But maybe you ain't heard about them. Well, they are an organization that takes their vacation trips by auto and carries everything with them. That is, they bring along their tents to sleep in and cook in, and they don't patronize no hotels or cafeterias. But they have got to be bona fide auto campers that they can't belong to the organization. 
They tell me there's over 200,000 members to it, and they call themselves the Tin Canners on account of most of their food being put up in tin cans. One couple we seen in the tent city was a couple from Brady, Texas, named Mr. and Mrs. Pence which the old man is over 80 years of age, and they had come in their auto all the way from home, a distance of 1,641 miles. They took five weeks for the trip, Mr. Pence driving the entire distance. The tin canners hails from every state in the Union, and in the summertime they visit places like New England and the Great Lakes region. But in the winter, the most of them comes to Florida and scatters all over the state. While we was down there, there was a national convention of them at Gainesville, Florida, and they elected a Fredonia, New York man as their president. His title is Royal Tin Can Opener of the World. They've got a song wrote up which everybody has got to learn it before they are a member. The Tin Can Forever! Hurrah, boys, hurrah! Up with the tin can, down with the foe. We will rally round the campfire, we'll rally once again, shouting, We auto camp forever. That is something like it. And the members has also got to have a tin can fastened onto the front of their machine. I asked Mother how she would like to travel around that way, and she said, Fine, but not with an old rattle brain like you driving. Well, I said, I am eight years younger than this Mr. Pence who drove here from Texas. Yes, she said, but he is old enough to not be skittish. You can't get ahead of mother. Well, one of the first things we done in St. Petersburg was to go to the Chamber of Commerce and register our names and where we was from as there's great rivalry amongst the different states in regards to the number of their citizens visiting in town. And of course, our little state don't stand much of a show. But still, every little bit helps, as the fella says. All in all, the man told us there was 11,000 names registered, Ohio leading with some 1,500-odd, and New York State next with 1,200. Then comes Michigan, Pennsylvania, and so on down, with one man each from Cuba and Nevada. The first night we was there, they was a meeting of the New York, New Jersey Society of the Congregational Church and a man from Ogdensburg, New York State, made the talk. His subject was rainbow chasing. He's a Rotarian and a very convicting speaker, though I forget his name. Our first business, of course, was to find a place to eat, and after trying several places, we run on to a cafeteria on Central Avenue that suited us up and down. We eat pretty near all our meals there, and it averaged about $2 per day for the two of us. But the food was well cooked, and everything nice and clean. A man don't mind paying the price if things is clean and well cooked. On the third day of February, which is Mother's birthday, we spread ourselves and eat supper at the Poinsettia Hotel, and they charged us 75 cents for a sirloin steak that wasn't hardly big enough for one. I said to Mother, well, I said, I guess it's a good thing every day ain't your birthday, or we would be in the poorhouse. No, says Mother, because if every day was my birthday, I would be old enough by this time to have been in my grave long ago. You can't get ahead of Mother. In the hotel, they had a card room where there was several men and ladies playing 500 in this newfangled whist bridge. We also seen a place where they was dancing. So I asked Mother would she like to trip the light fantastic toe, and she said no. She was too old to squirm like you have got to do nowadays. We watched some of the young folks at it a while till Mother got disgusted and said we would have to see a good movie to take the taste out of our mouth. Mother is a great movie heroine, and we go twice a week here at home. But I want to tell you about the park. The second day we was there, we visited the park, which is a good deal like the one in Tampa, only bigger. And there's more fun goes on here every day than you could shake a stick at. In the middle, there's a big bandstand and chairs for the folks to sit and listen to the concerts, which they give you music for all tastes, from Dixie up to classical pieces like Hearts and Flowers. 
Then all around, there's places marked off for different sports and games, chess and checkers and dominoes for folks that enjoys those kind of games, and roke and horseshoes for the nimbler ones. I used to pitch a pretty fair shoe myself, but ain't done much of it in the last 20 years. Well, anyway, we bought a membership ticket in the club, which costs $1 for the season, and they tell me that up to a couple years ago it was 50 cents, but they had to raise it to keep out the riffraff. Well, Mother and I put in a great day watching the pitchers, and she wanted I should get in the game. But I told her I was all out of practice and make a fool of myself, though I seen several men pitching who I guess I could take their measure without no practice. However, they was some good pitchers, too, and one boy from Akron, Ohio, who could certainly throw a pretty shoe. They told me it looked like he would win the championship of the United States in the February tournament. We come away a few days before they held that, and I never did hear if he win. I forget his name, but he was a clean-cut young fella, and he has got a brother in Cleveland that's a Rotarian. Well, we just stood around and watched the different games for two or three days, and finally I sat down in a checker game with a man named Weaver from Danville, Illinois. He was a pretty fair checker player, but he wasn't no match for me, and I hope that don't sound like bragging. But I always could hold my own on a checkerboard, and the folks around here will tell you the same thing. I played with this weaver pretty near all morning for two or three mornings, and he beat me one game and the only other time it looked like he had the chance the noon whistle blowed and we had to quit and go to dinner. While I was playing checkers, Mother would sit and listen to the band as she loves music, classical, or no matter what kind. But anyway, she was sitting there one day, and between selections, the woman next to her opened up a conversation. She was a woman about Mother's own age, 70 or 71, and finally she asked Mother's name. And Mother told her her name and where she was from, and Mother asked the same question. And who do you think the woman was? Well, sir, it was the wife of Frank M. Hartzell, the man who was engaged to mother till I stepped in and cut him out 52 years ago. Yes, sir. You can imagine mother's surprise. And Mrs. Hartzell was surprised, too, when mother told her she had once been friends with her husband. The mother didn't say how close friends they had been, or that mother and I was the cause of Hartzell going out west. But that's what we was. Hartzell left his town a month after the engagement was broke off and ain't never been back since. He had went out to Michigan and become a veterinary, and that is where he had settled down in Hillsdale, Michigan, and finally married his wife. Well, Mother screwed up her courage to ask if Frank was still living, and Mrs. Hartzell took her over to where they was pitching horseshoes, and there was old Frank waiting his turn. And he knowed Mother as soon as he seen her, though it was over 50 years. He said he knowed her by her eyes. Why, it's Lucy Frost, he says, and he throwed down his shoes and quit the game. Then they came over and hunted me up, and I will confess I wouldn't have knowed him. Him and I is the same age to the month, but he seems to show it more some way. He is balder for one thing, and his beard is all white where mine has still got a streak of brown in it. The very first thing I said to him, I said, Well, Frank, that beard of yours makes me feel like I was back north. It looks like a regular blizzard. Well, he said, I guess yarn would be just as white if you had it dry cleaned. But Mother wouldn't stand that. Is that so, she said to Frank. Well, Charlie ain't had no tobacco in his mouth for over ten years. And I ain't. Well, I excused myself from the checker game, and it was pretty close to noon, so we decided to all have dinner together, and they was nothing for it, only we must try their cafeteria on 3rd Avenue. It was a little more expensive than ours, and not near as good, I thought. I and Mother had about the same dinner we had been having every day, and our bill was $1.10. Frank's check was for $1.20 for he and his wife. The same meal wouldn't have cost them more than a dollar at our place. 
After dinner, we made them come up to our house, and we all sat in the parlor, which the young woman had given us the use of to entertain company. We begun talking over old times, and Mother said she was a scared Mrs. Hartzell would find it tiresome listening to we three talk over old times. But as it turned out, there wasn't much chance for nobody else to talk with Mrs. Hartzell in the company. I have heard lots of women that could go it, but Hartzell's wife takes the cake of all the women I ever seen. She told us the family history of everybody in the state of Michigan and bragged for half an hour about her son, who she said is in the drug business in Grand Rapids and a Rotarian. When I and Hartzell could get a word in edgeways, we joked one another back and forth, and I chafed him about being a horse doctor. Well, Frank, I said you look pretty prosperous, so I suppose there's been plenty of glanders around Hillsdale. Well, he said, I've managed to make more than a fair living, but I've worked pretty hard. Yes, I said, and I suppose you get called out all hours of the night to attend births and so on. Mother made me shut up. Well, I thought they wouldn't never go home, and I and Mother was in misery trying to keep awake, as the both of us generally always takes a nap after dinner. Finally, they went, after we had made an engagement to meet them in the park the next morning, and Mrs. Hartzell also invited us to come to their place the next night and play 500. But she had forgot that they was a meeting of the Michigan Society that evening, so it was not till two evenings later that we had our first cart game. End of chapter four, part one. Chapter four, part two of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 4, The Golden Honeymoon, Part 2. Hartzell and his wife lived in a house on 3rd Avenue North and had a private setting room besides their bedroom. Mrs. Hartzell couldn't quit talking about their private setting room like it was something wonderful. We played cards with them, with Mother and Hartzell partners against his wife and I. Mrs. Hartzell is a miserable card player, and we certainly got the worst of it. After the game, she brought out a dish of oranges, and we had to pretend it was just what we wanted. The oranges down there is like a young man's whiskers. You enjoy them at first, but they get to be a pesky nuisance. We played cards again the next night at our place with the same partners, and I and Mrs. Hartzell was beat again. Mother and Hartzell was full of compliments for each other on what a good team they made. But the both of them knowed well enough where the secret of their success laid. I guess all in all we must have played ten different evenings, and they was only one night when Mrs. Hartzell and I come out ahead, and that one night wasn't no fault of hern. When we had been down there about two weeks, we spent one evening as their guest in the Congregational Church at a social give by the Michigan Society. A talk was made by a man named Bidding of Detroit, Michigan, on how I was cured of storytelling. He's a big man in the Rotarians and give a witty talk. A woman named Mrs. Oxford rendered some selections which Mrs. Hartzell said was grand opera music. But whatever they was, my daughter Edie could have give her cards and spades and not made such a hullabaloo about it neither. Then they was a ventriloquist from Grand Rapids and a young woman about 45 years of age that mimicked different kinds of birds. I whispered to mother that they all sounded like a chicken, but she nudged me to shut up. After the show, we stopped in a drugstore and I set up the refreshments. And it was pretty close to 10 o'clock before we finally turned in. Mother and I would have preferred tending the movies, but Mother said we mustn't offend Mrs. Herzl. Though I asked her, had we come to Florida to enjoy ourselves or to just not offend an old chatterbox from Michigan? 
I felt sorry for Hartzell one morning. The women folks both had an engagement down to the chiropodists, and I run across Hartzell in the park, and he foolishly offered to play me checkers. It was him that suggested it, not me, and I guess he repented himself before we had played one game. But he was too stubborn to give up and sit there while I beat him game after game, and the worst part of it was that a crowd of folks had got in the habit of watching me play, and there they all was looking on, and finally they seen what a fool Frank was making of himself, and they began to chafe him and pass remarks. Like one of them said, Whoever told you you was a checker player? And you might be good for tiddledywinks, but not checkers. I almost felt like letting him beat me a couple games, but the crowd would have known it was a put-up job. Well, the women folks joined us in the park, and I wasn't going to mention our little game, but Hartzell told about it himself and admitted he wasn't no match for me. Well, said Mrs. Hartzell, checkers ain't much of a game anyway, is it? She said, it's more of a children's game, ain't it? At least I know my boys' children used to play it a good deal. Yes, ma'am, I said, it's a children's game the way your husband plays it, too. Mother wanted to smooth things over, so she said, Maybe there's other games where Frank can beat you. Yes, said Mrs. Hartzell, and I bet he could beat you pitching horseshoes. Well, I said I would give him a chance to try, only I ain't pitched a shoe in over 16 years. Well, said Hartzell, I ain't played checkers in 20 years. You ain't never played it, I said. Anyway, says Frank, Lucy and I is your master at 500. Well, I could have told him why that was, but had decency enough to hold my tongue. It had got so now that he wanted to play cards every night, and when I or mother wanted to go to a movie, any one of us would have to pretend we had a headache and then trust to goodness that they wouldn't see us sneak into the theater. I don't mind playing cards when my partner keeps their mind on the game, but you take a woman like Hartzell's wife, and how can they play cards when they have got to stop every couple of seconds and brag about their son in Grand Rapids? Well, the New York, New Jersey Society announced that they was going to give a social evening, too. And I said to Mother, I said, Well, that is one evening when we will have an excuse not to play 500. Yes, she said, but we will have to ask Frank and his wife to go to the social with us, as they asked us to go to the Michigan social. Well, I said I had rather stay home than drag that chatterbox everywhere as we go. So Mother said, you are getting too cranky. Maybe she does talk a little too much, but she is good-hearted, and Frank is always good company. So I said, I suppose if he is such good company, you wished you had of married him. Mother laughed and said I sounded like I was jealous. Jealous of a cow doctor? Anyway, we had to drag them along to the social, and I will say that we give them a much better entertainment than they had given us. Judge Lane of Patterson made a fine talk on business conditions and a Mrs. Newell of Westfield imitated birds. Only you could really tell what they was the way she done it. Two young women from Red Bank sung a choral selection, and we clapped them back, and they gave us home to our mountains, and Mother and Mrs. Hartzell both had tears in their eyes, and Hartzell too. Well, some way or another, the chairman got wind that I was there and asked me to make a talk, and I wasn't even going to get up, but Mother made me. So I got up and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I said, I didn't expect to be called on for a speech on an occasion like this or no other occasion as I do not set myself up as a speech maker. So we'll have to do the best I can, which I often say is the best anybody can do. Then I told them the story about Pat and the motorcycle using the brogue, and it seemed to tickle them, and I told them one or two other stories, but altogether I wasn't on my feet more than 20 or 25 minutes, and you ought to have heard the clapping and hollering when I sat down. Even Mrs. Hartzell admitted that I am quite a speech of fire, and said if I ever went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, her son would make me talk to the Rotarians. 
When it was over, Hartzell wanted we should go to their house and play cards. But his wife reminded him that it was after 9.30 p.m., rather a late hour to start a card game. But he had went crazy on the subject of cards, probably because he didn't have to play partners with his wife. Anyway, we got rid of them and went home to bed. It was the next morning when we met over to the park that Mrs. Hartzell made the remark that she wasn't getting no exercise. So I suggested that why didn't she take part in the rope game? She said she had not played a game of rope in 20 years. But if Mother would play, she would play. Well, at first Mother wouldn't hear of it, but finally consented more to please Mrs. Hartzell than anything else. Well, they had a game with a Mrs. Ryan from Eagle, Nebraska, and a young Mrs. Morse from Rutland, Vermont, who Mother had met down to the chiropodists. Well, Mother couldn't hit a flea, and they all laughed at her, and I couldn't help from laughing at her myself. And finally she quit and said her back was too lame to stoop over. So they got another lady and kept on playing, and soon Mrs. Hartzell was the one everybody was laughing at as she had a long shot to hit the black ball, and as she made the effort, her teeth fell out onto the court. I never seen a woman so flustered in my life, and I never heard so much laughing. Only Mrs. Hartzell didn't join in, and she was madder than a hornet and wouldn't play no more, so the game broke up. Mrs. Hartzell went home without speaking to nobody. But Hartzell stayed around, and finally he said to me, he said, Well, I played you checkers the other day, and you beat me bad, and now what do you say if you and me play a game of horseshoes? I told him I hadn't pitched a shoe in 16 years. But Mother said, Go ahead and play. You used to be good at it, and maybe it will come back to you. Well, to make a long story short, I gave in. I oughtn't to have never tried it, as I hadn't pitched a shoe in 16 years, and I only done it to humor Hartzell. Before we started, Mother patted me on the back and told me to do my best. So we started in, and I seen right off that I was in for it, as I hadn't pitched a shoe in 16 years and didn't have my distance. And besides, the plating had wore off the shoes so that they was points right where they stuck into my thumb and I hadn't thrown more than two or three times when my thumb was raw and it pretty near killed me to hang on to the shoe, let alone pitch it. Well, Hartzell throws the awkwardest shoe I ever seen pitched. And to see him pitch, you wouldn't think he would ever come nowhere near, but he is also the luckiest pitcher I ever seen, and he made some pitches where the shoe lit five and six feet short and then schoonered up and was a ringer. There's no use trying to beat that kind of luck. They was a pretty fair-sized crowd watching us, and four or five other ladies besides mother. And it seems like when Hartzell pitches, he's got to chew, and it kept the ladies on the anxious seat as he don't seem to care which way he is facing when he leaves go. You would think a man as old as him would have learnt more manners. Well, to make a long story short, I was just beginning to get my distance when I had to give up on account of my thumb, which I showed it to Hartzell, and he seen I couldn't go on, as it was raw and bleeding. Even if I could have stood it to go on myself, Mother wouldn't have allowed it after she seen my thumb. So anyway, I quit and Hartzell said the score was 19 to 6. But I don't know what it was, or don't care neither. Well, Mother and I went home and I said I hoped we was through with Hartzells as I was sick and tired of them. But it seemed like she had promised we would go over to their house that evening for another game of their everlasting cards. Well, my thumb was giving me considerable pain, and I felt kind of out of sorts, and I guess maybe I forgot myself. But anyway, when we was about through playing, Hartzell made the remark that he wouldn't never lose a game of cards if he could always have Mother for a partner. So I said, Well, you had a chance 50 years ago to always have her for a partner, but you wasn't man enough to keep her. I was sorry the minute I said it, and Hartzell didn't know what to say, and for once his wife couldn't say nothing. Mother tried to smooth things over by making the remark that I must have had something stronger than tea or I wouldn't talk so silly. But Mrs. Hartzell had froze up like an iceberg and hardly said good night to us, and I bet her and Frank put in a pleasant hour after we was gone. 
As we was leaving, Mother said to him, Never mind Charlie's nonsense, Frank. He is just mad because you beat him all hollow pitching horseshoes and playing cards. She said that to make up for my slit, but at the same time she certainly riled me. I tried to keep a hold of myself, but as soon as we was out of the house she had to open up the subject and begun to scold me for the break I had made. Well, I wasn't in no mood to be scolded, so I said, I guess he is such a wonderful pitcher and card player that you wished you had married him. Well, she said, at least he ain't a baby to give up pitching because his thumb has got a few scratches. And how about you, I said, making a fool of yourself on the roke court and then pretending your back is lame and you can't play no more? Yes, she said, but when you hurt your thumb, I didn't laugh at you. And why did you laugh at me when I sprained my back? Who could keep from laughing, I said. Well, she said, Frank Hartzell didn't laugh. Well, I said, why didn't you marry him? Well, said Mother, I almost wished I had. And I wish so, too, I said. I'll remember that, said Mother. And that's the last word she said to me for two days. We seen the Hartzells the next day in the park, and I was willing to apologize, but they just nodded to us. And a couple of days later, we heard they had left for Orlando, where they have got relatives. I wish they had went there in the first place. Mother and I made it up sitting on a bench. Listen, Charlie, she said, this is our golden honeymoon, and we don't want the whole thing spoiled with a silly old quarrel. Well, I said, did you mean that about wishing you had married Hartzell? Of course not, she said. That is, if you didn't mean that you had wished I had too. So I said, I was just tired and all wrought up. I thank God you chose me instead of him, as there's no other woman in the world who I could have lived with all these years. How about Mrs. Hartzell, says Mother. Good gracious, I said. Imagine being married to a woman that plays 500 like she does and drops her teeth on the roke court. Well, said Mother, it wouldn't be no worse than being married to a man that expectorates towards ladies and is such a fool in a checker game. So I put my arm around her shoulder and she stroked my hand and I guess we got kind of spoony. They was two days left of our stay in St. Petersburg, and the next to the last day Mother introduced me to a Mrs. Kendall from Kingston, Rhode Island, who she had met at the Chiropodists. Mrs. Kendall made us acquainted with her husband, who was in the grocery business. They have got two sons and five grandchildren and one great-grandchild. One of their sons lives in Providence and is way up in the Elks as well as a Rotarian. We found them very congenial people, and we played cards with them the last two nights we was there. They was both experts, and I only wished we had met them sooner instead of running into the Hartzells. But the Kendalls will be there again next winter, and we will see more of them. That is, if we decide to make the trip again. We left the Sunshine City on the 11th day of February at 11 a.m., This give us a day trip through Florida, and we seen all the country we had passed through at night on the way down. We reached Jacksonville at 7 p.m. and pulled out of there at 8.10 p.m. We reached Fayetteville, North Carolina at 9 o'clock the following morning and reached Washington, D.C. at 6.30 p.m., laying over there half an hour. We reached Trenton at 11.01 p.m. and had wired ahead to my daughter and son-in-law, and they met us at the train, and we went to their house, and they put us up for the night. John would have made us stay up all night telling about our trip, but Edie said we must be tired and made us go to bed. That's my daughter. The next day, we took our train for home and arrived safe and sound, having been gone just one month and a day. Here comes Mother. So I guess I better shut up. End of chapter four, part two, The Golden Honeymoon. Chapter five, part one of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Chapter 5 Champion Part 1 An example of the mystery story. The mystery is how it came to get printed. Mitch Kelly scored his first knockout when he was 17. The knocky was his brother Connie, three years his junior and a cripple. The purse was a half dollar given to the younger Kelly by a lady whose electric had just missed bumping his soul from his frail little body. Connie did not know Midge was in the house, else he never would have risked laying the prize on the arm of the least comfortable chair in the room, the better to observe its shining beauty. As Midge entered from the kitchen, the crippled boy covered the coin with his hand, but the movement lacked the speed requisite to escape his brother's quick eye. "'What you got there?' demanded Midge. "'Nothing,' said Connie. "'You're a one-legged liar,' said Midge. He strode over to his brother's chair and grasped the hand that concealed the coin. "'Let loose,' he ordered. Connie began to cry. "'Let loose and shut up your noise,' said the elder, and jerked his brother's hand from the chair arm. The coin fell onto the bare floor. Midge pounced on it. His weak mouth widened in a triumphant smile. "'Nothing, huh?' he said. "'All right. If it's nothing, you don't want it.' "'Give that back!' sobbed the younger. "'I'll give you a red nose, you little sneak. Where'd you steal it?' "'I didn't steal it. It's mine. A lady gave it to me after she pretty near hit me with a car.' "'It's a crime she missed you,' said Midge. Midge started for the front door. The cripple picked up his crutch, rose from his chair with difficulty, and, still sobbing, came toward Midge. The latter heard him and stopped. "'You better stay where you're at,' he said. "'I want my money,' cried the boy. "'I know what you want,' said Midge. Doubling up the fist that held the half-dollar, he landed with all his strength on his brother's mouth. Connie fell to the floor with a thud, the crutch tumbling on top of him. Midge stood beside the prostrate form. "'Is that enough?' he said. "'Or do you want this too?' And he kicked him in the crippled leg. "'I guess that'll hold you,' he said. There was no response from the boy on the floor. Midge looked at him a moment, then at the coin in his hand, and then went out into the street, whistling. An hour later, when Mrs Kelly came home from her day's work at Faulkner's steam laundry, she found Connie on the floor, moaning. Dropping on her knees beside him, she called him by name a score of times, then she got up and, pale as a ghost, dashed from the house. Dr. Ryan left the Kelly abode about dusk and walked toward Halstead Street. Mrs. Dorgan spied him as he passed her gate. "'Who's sick, doctor?' she called. "'Poor little Connie,' he replied. "'He had a bad fall. "'How did it happen? "'I can't say for sure, Margaret, but I'd almost bet he was knocked down.' "'Knocked down?' exclaimed Mrs. Dorgan. "'Why, who?' "'Have you seen the other one lately?' "'Michael, not since morning. You can't be thinking.' "'I wouldn't put it past him, Margaret,' said the doctor gravely. "'The lad's mouth is swollen and cut, and his poor skinny little leg is bruised. "'He surely didn't do it to himself, and I think Helen suspects the other one.' "'Lord, save us,' said Mrs. Dorgan. "'I'll run over and see if I can help.' "'That's a good woman,' said Dr. Ryan, and went on down the street.' Near midnight, when Midge came home, his mother was sitting at Connie's bedside. She did not look up. Well, said Midge, what's the matter? She remained silent. Midge repeated his question. Michael, you know what's the matter, she said at length. I don't know nothing, said Midge. Don't lie to me, Michael. What did you do to your brother? Nothing. You hit him. Well then, I hit him. What of it? It ain't the first time. Her lips pressed tightly together, her face like chalk. Ellen Kelly rose from her chair and made straight for him. Midge backed against the door. Lay off on me, Ma. I don't want to fight no woman. Still she came on, breathing heavily. Stop where you're at, Ma, he warned. There was a brief struggle, and Midge's mother lay on the floor before him. You ain't hurt, Ma. You're lucky I didn't land good, and I told you to lay off on me. God forgive you, Michael. 
Midge found Hap Collins in the showdown game at the Royal. Come on out a minute, he said. Hap followed him out on the walk. I'm leaving town for a while, said Midge. What for? Well, I had a little run-in up to the house. The kid stole a half-buck off of me, and when I went after it he cracked me with his crutch, so I nailed him, and the old lady came at me with a chair, so I took it off from her and she fell down. How is Connie hurt? Not bad. What are you running away for? Who the hell said I was running away? I'm sick and tired of getting picked on, that's all, so I'm leaving for a while and I want a piece of money. I ain't only got six bits, said Happy. You're in bad shape, aren't you? Well, come through with it. Happy came through. You oughtn't to hit the kid, he said. I ain't asking you who I can hit, snarled Midge. You try to put something over on me and you'll get the same dose. I'm going now. Go as far as you like, said Happy, but not until he was sure that Kelly was out of hearing. Early the following morning, Midge boarded a train for Milwaukee. He had no ticket, but no one knew the difference. The conductor remained in the caboose. On a night six months later, Midge hurried out of the stage door of the Star Boxing Club and made for Duane Saloon, two blocks away. In his pocket were twelve dollars, his reward for having battered up one Demon Dempsey through the six rounds of the first preliminary. It was Midge's first professional engagement in the manly art. Also, it was the first time in weeks that he had earned twelve dollars. On the way to Duane's, he had to pass Nyman's. He pulled his cap over his eyes and increased his pace until he had gone by. Inside Nyman's stood a trusting bartender, who for ten days had staked Midge to drinks and allowed him to ravage the lunch on a promise to come in and settle the moment he was paid for the prelim. Midge strode into Duane's and aroused the napping bartender by slapping a silver dollar on the festive board. Give me a shot, said Midge. The shooting continued until the wind-up at the star was over and part of the fight crowd joined Midge in front of Duane's bar, a youth in the early twenties. Standing next to young Kelly, finally summoned sufficient courage to address him. "'Wasn't that you in the first bout?' he ventured. "'Yeah,' Midge replied. "'My name's Hirsch,' said the other. Midge received the startling information in silence. "'I don't want to butt in,' continued Mr Hirsch, but I'd like to buy you a drink. All right, said Midge, but don't overstrain yourself. Mr. Hirsch laughed uproariously and beckoned to the bartender. You certainly give that whopper trimming tonight, said the buyer of the drink when they had been served. I thought you'd killed him. I would if I hadn't let up, Midge replied. I'll kill them all. You got the wallop all right, the other said admiringly. Have I got the wallop, said Midge. Say, I could kick like a mule. Did you notice their muscles in my shoulders? Notice them? I couldn't help from noticing them, said Hirsch. I says to the fella sitting alongside of me, I says, look at them shoulders. No wonder he can hit, I says to him. Just let me land and it's goodbye, baby, said Mitch. I'll kill them all. The oral manslaughter continued until Duane's closed for the night. At parting, Midge and his new friend shook hands and arranged for a meeting the following evening. For nearly a week, the two were together almost constantly. It was Hirsch's pleasant role to listen to Midge's modest revelations concerning himself and to buy every time Midge's glass was empty. But there came an evening when Hirsch regretfully announced that he must go home to supper. "'I got a date for eight bells,' he confided. I could stick till then, only I must clean up and put on the Sunday clothes, cos she's the prettiest little thing in Milwaukee. Can't you fix it for two? asked Midge. I don't know who to get, Hirsch replied. Wait, though, I've got a sister, and if she ain't busy, it'll be OK. She's no bum for looks herself. So it came about that Midge and Emma Hirsch and Emma's brother and the prettiest little thing in Milwaukee forgathered at walls and danced half the night away, and Mitch and Emma danced every dance together, for though every little one-step seemed to induce a new thirst of its own, Lou Hirsch stayed too sober to dance with his own sister. The next day, 
penniless, at last, in spite of his phenomenal ability to make someone else settle, Midge Kelly sought out Doc Hammond, matchmaker for the star, and asked to be booked for the next show. I could put you on with Tracy for the next bout, said Doc. What's they in it? asked Midge. Twenty if you cop, Doc told him. Have a heart, protested Midge. Didn't I look good the other night? You looked all right, but you aren't Freddie Welsh yet by a considerable margin. I ain't scared of Freddie Welsh or none of them, said Midge. Well, we don't pay our boxers by the size of their chests, Doc said. I'm offering you this Tracy bout. Take it or leave it. All right, I'm on, said Midge, and he passed a pleasant afternoon at Duane's on the strength of his booking. Young Tracy's manager came to Midge the night before the show. How do you feel about this go? he asked. Me, said Midge. I feel all right. What do you mean, how do I feel? I mean, said Tracy's manager, that we're mighty anxious to win because the boy's got a chance in Philly if he cops this one. What's your proposition? asked Midge. Fifty bucks, said Tracy's manager. What do you think I am, a crook? Me lay down for fifty bucks, not me. Seventy-five, then, said Tracy's manager. The market closed on eighty, and the details were agreed on in short order, and the next night Midge was stopped in the second round by a terrific slap on the forearm. This time Midge passed up both Nyman's and Duane's, having a sizable account at each place, and sought his refreshment at Stein's farther down the street. When the profits of his deal with Tracy were gone, he learned, by first-hand information from Doc Hammond and the matchmakers at the other clubs, that he was no longer desired for even the cheapest of preliminaries. There was no danger of his starving or dying of thirst while Emma and Lou Hirsch lived. But he made up his mind, four months after his defeat by young Tracy, that Milwaukee was not the ideal place for him to live. I can lick the best of them, he reasoned but there ain't no more chance for me here. I can maybe go east and get on somewheres, and besides. But just after Midge had purchased a ticket to Chicago, with money he had borrowed from Emma Hirsch, to buy shoes, a heavy hand was laid on his shoulders, and he turned to face two strangers. Where are you going, Kelly? inquired the owner of the heavy hand. Nowheres, said Midge. What the hell do you care? The other stranger spoke. Kelly, I'm employed by Emma Hirsch's mother to see that you do right by her, and we want you to stay here till you've done it. You won't get nothing but the worst of it, monkeying with me, said Midge. Nevertheless, he did not depart for Chicago that night. Two days later, Emma Hirsch became Mrs. Kelly, and the gift of the groom, when once they were alone, was a crushing blow on the bride's pale cheek. Next morning, Midge left Milwaukee as he had entered it by fast freight. There's no use kidding ourselves any more, said Tommy Haley. He might get down to thirty seven in a pinch, but if he done below that, a mouse could stop him. He's a welter, that's what he is, and he knows it as well as I do. He's growed like a weed in the last six months. I told him, I says, if you don't quit growing, they won't be nobody for you to box, only Willard in them. He says, well, I wouldn't run away from Willard if I weighed twenty pounds more. He must hate himself, said Tommy's brother. I never seen a good one that didn't, said Tommy. And Mitch is a good one. Don't make no mistake about it. I wish we could have got Welsh before the kid growed so big. But it's too late now. I won't make no holler, though, if we can match him up with a Dutchman. Who do you mean? Young Goats, the welter champ. We might not get so much dough for the bout itself, but I'd roll in afterward. What a drawing card we'd be, because the people pays their money to see the fellow with the wallop, and that's Midge, and we'd keep the title just as long as Midge could make the weight. Can't you land no match with goats? Sure, cos he needs the money, but I won't careful with the kid so far, and look at the results I got. So what's the use of taking a chance? The kid's coming every minute, and goats is going back faster than Big Johnson did. I think we could lick him now. I'd bet my life on it. But six months from now and there won't be no risk. He'll have licked himself before that time. Then all we have to do is sign up with him and wait for the referee to stop it. But Midge is so crazy to get at him now that I can hardly hold him back. 
The brothers Haley were lunching in a Boston hotel. Dan had come down from Hollyoke to visit with Tommy and to watch the latter's protégé go twelve rounds or less with Bud Cross. The bout promised little in the way of a contest, for Midge had twice stopped the Baltimore youth, and Bud's reputation for gameness was all that had earned him the date. The fans were willing to pay the price to see Midge's haymaking left, but they wanted to see it used on an opponent who would not jump out of the ring the first time he felt its crushing force. But Cross was such an opponent, and his willingness to stop boxing gloves with his eyes, ears, nose and throat had long enabled him to escape the horrors of honest labour. A game boy was Bud, and he showed it in his battered, swollen, discoloured face. I should think, said Dan Haley, that the kid'll do whatever you tell him, after all you've done for him. Well, said Tommy, he's took my dope pretty straight so far, but he's so sure of himself that he can't see no reason for waiting. He'll do what I say, though. He'd be a sucker not to. You got a contract with him? No, I don't need no contract. He knows it was me that drug him out of the gutter, and he ain't going to turn me down now, when he's got the dough and bound to get more. Where'd he have been if I hadn't listened to him when he first came to me? That's pretty near two years ago now, but it seems like last week. I was setting in the saloon room across from Pleasant Club and Philly, waiting for McCann to count the dough and come over, when this little bum blowed in and tried to stand the house off for a drink. They told him nothing doing, and to beat it out of there. Then he seen me, and come over to where I was setting, and asked me wasn't I a boxing man, and I told him who I was. Then he asked me for money to buy a shot, and I told him to set down, and I'd buy it for him. Then we got to talking things over, and he told me his name, and told me about fighting a couple of prelims out to Milwaukee. So I says, well boy, I don't know how good or how rotten you are, but you won't never get nowhere's training on that stuff. So he says he'd cut it out if he'd get on in about, and I says I would give him a chance if he played square with me, and didn't touch no more to drink. So we shook hands, and I took him up to the hotel with me, and gave him a bath, and the next day I brought him some clothes, and I staked him to eats and sleeps for over six weeks. He had a hard time breaking away from the polish, but finally I thought he was fit, and I gave him his chance. He went on with Smiley Sayer, and stopped him so quick that Smiley thought sure he was poisoned. Well, you know what he's did since. The only beating in his record was by Tracy in Milwaukee before I got hold of him, and he's licked Tracy three times in the last year. I gave him all the best of it in a money way, and he's got 7,000 bucks in cold storage. How's that for a kid that was in the gutter two years ago? And he'd have still more yet if he wasn't so nuts over clothes, and got to stop at the good hotels and so forth. Where's his home at? Well, he ain't really got no home. He came from Chicago, and his mother canned him out of the house for being no good. She gave him a raw deal, I guess, and he says he won't have nothing to do with her unless she comes to him first. She's got a pile of money, he says, so he ain't worrying about her. The gentleman, under discussion, entered the café and swaggered to Tommy's table, while the whole room turned to look. Mitch was the picture of health, despite a slightly coloured eye and an ear that seemed to have no opening, but perhaps it was not his healthiness that drew all eyes. His diamond horseshoe tie-pin, his purple cross-striped shirt, his orange shoes and his light blue suit fairly screamed for attention. "'Where have you been?' he asked Tommy. "'I've been looking all over for you.' "'Set down,' said his manager. "'No time,' said Midge. I'm going down to the wharf to see him unload the fish. Shake hands with my brother, Dan, said Tommy. Mid shook with the holly oak Haley. If you're Tommy's brother, you're OK with me, said Midge, and the brothers beamed with pleasure. Dan moistened his lips and murmured an embarrassed reply, but it was lost on the young gladiator. Leave me take twenty, Mitch was saying. I probably won't need it, but I don't like to be caught short. Tommy parted with a twenty-dollar bill and recorded the transaction in a small black book the insurance company had given him for Christmas. But, he said, it won't cost you no twenty to look at them fish. Want me to go along? No, said Midge hastily. You and your brother here probably got a lot more to say to each other. Well, said Tommy, don't take no bad money and don't get lost, and you'd better be back at four o'clock and lay down a while. I don't need no rest to beat this guy, said Midge. 
he'll do enough laying down for the both of us and laughing even more than the jest called for he strode out through the fire of admiring and startled glances the corner of boylston and tremont was the nearest midge got to the wharf but the lady awaiting him was doubtless a more dazzling sight than the catch of the luckiest massachusetts fisherman she could talk to probably better than the fish oh you kid she said flashing a few silver teeth among the gold oh you fighting man midge smiled up at her we'll go somewheres and get a drink he said one won't hurt end of chapter five part one champion Chapter 5, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Chapter 5, Champion, Part 2. In New Orleans, five months after he had rearranged the map of Bud Cross for the third time, Midge finished training for his championship bout with the Dutchman. Back in his hotel after the final workout, Midge stopped to chat with some of the boys from up north, who had made the long trip to see a champion dethroned, for the result of this bout was so nearly a foregun conclusion that even the experts had guessed it. Tommy Haley secured the key and the mail and ascended to the Kelly suite, he was bathing when Midge came in, half an hour later. "'Any mail?' asked Midge. "'There, on the bed,' replied Tommy from the tub. Midge picked up the stack of letters and postcards and glanced them over. From the pile he sorted out three letters and laid them on the table. The rest he tossed into the waste basket. Then he picked up the three and sat for a few moments holding them, while his eyes gazed off into space. At length he looked again at the three unopened letters in his hand, then he put one in his pocket, tossed the other two at the basket. They missed their target and fell on the floor. Hell, said Mitch, and stooping over picked them up. He opened one postmarked Milwaukee and read, Dear husband, I have wrote to you so many times and got no answer, and I don't know if you have got them, so I'm writing again in the hopes that you will get this letter and answer. I don't like to bother you with my troubles, and I should not only for the baby, and I am not asking you should write to me, but only send a little money, and I am not asking for myself, but the baby has not been well a day since last August, and the doctor told me she can't live much longer unless I give her better food, and that's impossible the way things are. Lou has not been working for a year, and what I make don't hardly pay for the rent. I am not asking for you to give me any money, but only you should send what I loaned when convenient, and I think it amounts to about thirty-six dollars. Please try and send that amount, and it will help me, but if you can't send the whole amount, try and send something. Your wife, Emma. Midge tore the letter into a hundred pieces and scattered them over the floor. Money, 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 he said. They must think I'm made of money. I suppose the old woman's after it, too. He opened his mother's letter. Dear Michael, Connie wanted me to write and say you must beat the Dutchman, and he's sure you will, and wanted me to say we want you to write and tell us about it. But I guess you haven't no time to write or we heard from you long before this, but I wish you would write just a line or two, boy, because it would be better for Connie than a bar of medicine. It would help me to keep things going if you send me money now and then when you can spare it, but if you can't send her money, try and find time to write a letter. Only a few lines, and it will please Connie. Just think, boy, he hasn't got out of bed in three years. Connie says good luck. Your mother, Ellen F. Kelly. I thought so, said Midge. They're all alike. The third letter was from New York. It read, Hun, this is the last letter you'll get from me before your champ but I will send you a telegram Saturday, but I can't say as much in a telegram as in a letter, and I am writing this to let you know I am thinking of you and praying for good luck. Lick him good, hun, and don't wait no longer than you have to, and don't forget to wire me as soon as it's over. Give him that little old left of yours on the nose, hun, and don't be afraid of spoiling his good looks, because it couldn't be no homelier than he is. But don't let him spoil my baby's pretty face. You won't, will you, hun? Well, hun, I would give anything to be there and see it, but I guess you love Haley better than me, or you wouldn't let him keep me away. But when you're champion, we can do as we please and tell Haley to go to the devil. Well, hun, I will send you a telegram Saturday, and I almost forgot to tell you I will need some more money, 
A couple hundred, say, and you'll have to wire it to me as soon as you get this. You will, won't you, hun? I'll send you a telegram Saturday. And remember, hun, I am pulling for you. Well, goodbye, sweetheart, and good luck, Grace. They're all alike, said Midge. Money, money, money. Tommy Haley, shining from his ablutions, came in from the adjoining room. I thought you'd be laying down, he said. I'm going to, said Midge, unbuttoning his orange shoes. I'll call you at six, and you can eat up here with no bugs to pester you. I got to go down and give them birds their tickets. Did you hear from Goldberg? asked Midge. Didn't I tell you? Sure, fifteen weeks at five hundred if we win, and we can get a guarantee of twelve thousand with privileges either in New York or Milwaukee. Who with? Anybody that will stand up in front of you. You don't care who it is, do you? Not me. I'll make them all look like a monkey. Well, you better lay down a while. Oh, say, wire two hundred to Grace for me, will you? Right away, the New York address. Two hundred? You just sent her three hundred last Sunday. Well, what the hell do you care? All right, all right, don't get sore about it. Anything else? That's all, said Midge, and dropped onto the bed. And I want the deed done before I come back, said Grace as she rose from the table. You won't fall down on me, will you, hun? Leave it to me, said Midge, and don't spend no more time than you have to. Grace smiled a farewell and left the cafe. Midge continued to sip his coffee and read his paper. They were in Chicago, and they were in the middle of Midge's first week in vaudeville. He had come straight north to reap the rewards of his glorious victory over the broken-down Dutchman. A fortnight had been spent in learning his act, which consisted of a gymnastic exhibition and a ten minutes monologue on the various excellences of Midge Kelly, and now he was twice daily turning him away from the Madison Theatre. His breakfast over and his paper read, Mitch sauntered into the lobby and asked for his key. He then beckoned to the bellboy, who had been hoping for that very honour. Find Ailey, Tommy Ailey, said Mitch. Tell him to come to my room. Yes, sir, Mr Kelly, said the boy, and proceeded to break all his former records for diligence. Mitch was looking out of his seventh-storey window when Tommy answered the summons. What'll it be? inquired his manager. There was a pause before Mitch replied. Ailey, he said. Twenty-five per cent's a whole lot of money. I guess I got it coming, ain't I? said Tommy. I don't see how you figure it. I don't see where you're worth it to me. Well, said Tommy, I didn't expect nothing like this. I thought you were satisfied with the bargain. I didn't want to beat nobody out of nothing, but I don't see where you could have got anybody else that would have did all I'd done for you. Sure, that's all right said the champion. You done a lot for me and Philly, and you got good money for it, didn't you? I ain't making no holler. Still and all, the big money's still ahead of us yet, and if it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't have never got within grabbing distance. Oh, I guess I could have went along all right, said Midge. Who is it that hung that left on the Dutchman's jaw, me or you? Yes, but you wouldn't have been in the ring with the Dutchman if it wasn't for how I handled you. Well, this won't get us nowhere. The idea is that you ain't worth no 25% now, and it don't make no difference what come off a year or two ago. Don't it? said Tommy. I'd say it made a whole lot of difference. Well, I say it don't, and I guess that settles it. Look here, Mitch, Tommy said. I thought I was fair with you, but you don't think so. I'm willing to hear what you think is fair. I don't want nobody calling me a Sherlock. Let's get down to business and sign up a contract. What's your figure? I ain't naming no figure, Mitch replied. I'm saying that twenty-five's too much. Now what are you willing to take? How about twenty? Twenty's too much, said Kelly. What ain't too much? asked Tommy. Well, Haley, I might as well give it to you straight. There ain't nothing that ain't too much. You mean you don't want me at no figure? That's the idea. There was a minute's silence. Then Tommy Haley walked towards the door. Mitch, he said in a choking voice, you're making a big mistake, boy. You can't throw down your best friends and get away with it. That damn woman will ruin you. Mitch sprang from his seat. You shut your mouth, he stormed. Get out of here before they have to carry you out. You've been sponging off of me long enough. Say one more word about that girl or about anything else and you'll get what the Dutchman's got. Now get out. 
and Tommy Haley, having a very vivid memory of the Dutchman's face as he fell, got out. Grace came in later, dropped her numerous bundles on the lounge, and perched herself on the arm of Midge's chair. Well, she said. Well, said Midge, I got rid of him. Good boy, said Grace, and now I think you might give me that twenty-five per cent. Besides the seventy-five you're already getting, said Midge. Don't be no grouch, hun. You don't look pretty when you're grouchy. It ain't my business to look pretty, Midge replied. Wait till you see how I look with the stuff I brought this morning. Midge glanced at the bundles on the lounge. There's Hurley's twenty-five per cent, he said, and then some. The champion did not remain long without a manager. Haley's successor was none other than Jerome Harris, who saw in Midge a better meal ticket than his popular-priced musical show had been. The contract, giving Mr Harris 25% of Midge's earnings, was signed in Detroit the week after Tommy Haley had heard his dismissal read. It had taken Midge just six days to learn that a popular actor cannot get on without the ministrations of a man who thinks, talks and means business. At first Grace objected to the new member of the firm, but when Mr Harris had demanded and secured from the Vaudeville's people a $100 increase in Midge's weekly stipend, she was convinced that the champion had acted for the best. "'You and my missus will have some great old times,' Harris told Grace. "'I'd have wired her to join us here, only I seen the kids booking take us to Milwaukee next week, and that's where she is.' But when they were introduced in the Milwaukee Hotel, Grace admitted to herself that her feeling for Mrs. Harris could hardly be called love at first sight. Midge, on the contrary, gave his new manager's wife the many times over, and seemed loath to end the feast of his eyes. "'Some doll,' he said to Grace when they were alone. "'Doll is right,' the lady replied, "'and sawdust where her brains ought to be.' "'I'm liable to steal that baby,' said Midge, and he smiled as he noted the effect of his words on his audience's face. On Tuesday of the Milwaukee week, the champion successfully defended his title in a bout that the newspapers never reported. Midge was alone in his room that morning when a visitor entered without knocking. The visitor was Lou Hirsch. Midge turned white at the sight of him. "'What do you want?' he demanded. "'I guess you know,' said Lou Hirsch. "'Your wife's starving to death, and your baby's starving to death, "'and I'm starving to death, and you're dirty with money.' "'Listen,' said Midge. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't never have saw your sister. And if you ain't man enough to hold a job, what's that to me? The best thing you can do is keep away from me. You give me a piece of money and I'll go. Midge's reply to the ultimatum was a straight right to the brother-in-law's narrow chest. Take that home to your sister. And after Lou Hirsch had picked himself up and slunk away, Midge thought, It's lucky I didn't give him my left, or I'd have croaked him and if I'd hit him in the stomach, I'd have broke his spine. There was a party after each evening performance during the Milwaukee engagement. The wine flowed freely, and Mitch had more of it than Tommy Haley ever would have permitted him. Mr Harris offered no objection, which was possibly just as well for his own physical comfort. In the dancing between drinks, Mitch had his new manager's wife for a partner as often as Grace. The latter's face as she floundered round in the arms of the portly Harris belied her frequent protestations that she was having the time of her life. Several times that week, Midge thought Grace was on the point of starting the quarrel he hoped to have, but it was not until Friday night that she accommodated. He and Mrs Harris had disappeared after the matinee, and when Grace saw him again at the close of the night show, she came to the point at once. "'What are you trying to pull off?' she demanded. It's none of your business, is it? said Midge. You bet it's my business, mine and Harris's. You cut it short or you'll find out. Listen, said Midge, have you got a mortgage on me or something? You talk like we was married. We're going to be too, and tomorrow's as good a time as any. Just about, Midge said. You've got as much chance of marrying me tomorrow as the next day or next year, and that ain't no chance at all. We'll find out, said Grace. You're the one that's got something to find out. What do you mean? I mean I'm married already. You lie. You think so, do you? Well, suppose you go to this here address and get acquainted with my missus. Midge scored a number on a piece of paper and handed it to her. She stared at it unseeingly. Well, said Midge, I ain't kidding you. You go there and ask for Mrs. Michael Kelly 
and if you don't find her, I'll marry you tomorrow before breakfast. Still Grace stared at the scrap of paper. To Midge it seemed an age before she spoke again. You lied to me all this while. You never asked me if was I married. What's more, what the hell difference did it make to you? You got a split, didn't you? Better in fifty-fifty. He started away. Where are you going? I'm going to meet Harris and his wife. I'm going with you. You're not going to shake me now. Yes, I am too, said Midge quietly. When I leave town tomorrow night, you're going to stay here. And if I see where you're going to make a fuss, I'll put you in a hospital where they'll keep you quiet. You can get your stuff tomorrow morning, and I'll slip you a hundred bucks, and then I don't want to see no more of you. And don't try and tag along now, or I'll have to add another KO to the old record. When Grace returned to the hotel that night, she discovered that Midge and the Harrises had moved to another. And when Midge left town the following night, he was again without a manager, and Mr Harris was without a wife. Three days prior to Midge Kelly's ten-round bout with young Milton in New York City, the sporting editor of The News assigned Joe Morgan to write two or three thousand words about the champion to run with a picture layout for Sunday. Joe Morgan dropped in at Midge's training quarters Friday afternoon. Midge, he learned, was doing road work, but Midge's manager, Wally Adams, stood ready and willing to supply reams of dope about the greatest fighter of the age. Let's hear what you've got, said Joe, and then I'll try to fix up something. So Wally stepped on the accelerator of his imagination and shot away. Just a kid, that's all he is, a regular boy. Get what I mean? Don't know the meaning of bad habits. Never tasted liquor in his life and would probably get sick if he smelled it. Clean living put him up where he's at. Get what I mean? And modest and unassuming as a score girl. He's so quiet you wouldn't never know he was around, and he'd go to jail before he'll talk about himself. No job at all to get him in shape, because he's always that way. The only trouble we have with him is getting him to light into those poor bums they'll match him up with. He's scared he'll hurt somebody. Get what I mean? He's tickled to death over this match with Milton, because everybody says Milton can stand the gaff. Mitchell may maybe be able to cut loose a little this time, but the last two bouts he had, the guys hadn't no business in the ring with him, and he was holding back all the while for the fear he'd kill somebody. Get what I mean? Is he married? inquired Joe. Say you'd think he was married to hear him brave about them kiddies he's got. His family's up in Canada to their summer home, and Midge is wild to get up there with him. He thinks more of that wife and them kiddies than all the money in the world. Get what I mean? How many children has he got? I don't know. Four or five, I guess. All boys and every one a dead rigger for their dad. Is his father living? No, the old man died when he was a kid. But he's got a grand old mother and a kid brother out in Shi. They're the first ones he thinks about after a match, them and his wife and kiddies. And he don't forget to send the old woman a thousand bucks after every bout. He's going to buy her a new home as soon as they pay him off for this match. How about his brother? Is he going to tackle the game? Sure, and Mitch says he'll be a champion before he's twenty years old. They're a fighting family, and all of them honest and straight as a die. Get what I mean? A fella, that I can't tell you his name, come to Mitch in Milwaukee, unked, and wanted him to throw a fight, and Mitch give him such a trimming on the street that he couldn't go on that night. That's the kind he is. Get what I mean? Joe Morgan hung around the camp until Mitch and his trainers returned. One of the boys from the news, said Wally, by way of introduction, I've been giving him your family's history. Did he give you the good dope? he inquired. He's some historian, said Joe. Don't call me no names, said Wally, smiling. Call us up if there's anything more you want, and keep your eyes on us Monday night. Get what I mean? The story in Sunday's news was read by thousands of lovers of the manly art. It was well written and full of human interest. Its slight inaccuracies went unchallenged, though three readers, besides Wally Adams and Midge Kelly, saw and recognised them. The three were Grace, Tommy Haley and Jerome Harris, and the comments they made were not for publication. Neither the Mrs Kelly in Chicago nor the Mrs Kelly in Milwaukee knew that there was such a paper as the New York News, and even if they had known of it, and that it contained two columns of reading matter about Midge, Neither mother nor wife could have bought it, for the news on Sunday is a nickel a copy. Joe Morgan could have written more accurately, no doubt, 
if instead of Wally Adams he had interviewed Ellen Kelly and Connie Kelly and Emma Kelly and Lou Hirsch and Grace and Jerome Harris and Tommy Haley and Hap Collins and two or three Milwaukee bartenders. But a story built on their evidence would never have passed the sporting editor. Suppose you can prove it, that gentleman would have said. It wouldn't get us anything but abuse to print it. The people don't want to see him knocked. He's a champion. End of chapter 5, part 2, Champion. Chapter 6, part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 6. My Roomie. Part 1. My Roomie. A house party in a fashionable Third Avenue laundry and the predicament of a hero who has posed as a famous elevator starter form the background of this delightful tale of life in the Kiwanis Club. 6. My Roomie 1. No, I ain't signed for next year, but there won't be no trouble about that. The dough part of it is all fixed up. John and me talked it over and I'll sign as soon as they send me a contract. All I told him was that he'd have to let me pick my own roommate after this. And not sick no wild man onto me. You know I didn't hit much the last two months of the season. Some of the boys I noticed wrote some stuff about me getting old and losing my batting eye. That's all bunk. The reason I didn't hit was because I wasn't getting enough sleep. And the reason for that was Mr. Elliot. He wasn't with us after the last part of May. But I roomed with him long enough to get the insomni. I was the only guy in the club game enough to stand for him. But I was sorry afterward that I'd done it, because it sure did put a crimp in my little old average. And do you know where he is now? I got a letter today, and I'll read it to you. No, I guess I better tell you something about him first. You fellers never got acquainted with him, and you ought to hear the dope to understand the letter. I'll make it as short as I can. He didn't play no league last year. He was with some semi-pros over in Michigan, and somebody writes John about him. So John sends Needham over to look at him. Tom stayed there Saturday and Sunday and seen him work twice. He was playing the outfield, but as luck would have it, they wasn't a fly ball hit in his direction in both games. A base hit was made out his way, and he booted it, and that's the only report Tom could get on his feeling. But he wallops two over the wall in one day, and they catch two line drives off him. The next day, he gets four blows, and two of them is triples. So Tom comes back and tells John the guy is a whale of a hitter and fast as cob, but he don't know nothing about his fielding. Then John signs him to a contract, 1200 or something like that. We'd been in Tampa a week before he showed up. Then he comes to the hotel and just sits round all day without telling nobody who he was. Finally, the bellhops was going to chase him out, and he says he's one of the ball players. Then the clerk gets John to go over and talk to him. He tells John his name and says he hasn't had nothing to eat for three days because he was broke. John told me afterward that he drew about 300 in advance last winter sometime. Well, they took him in the dining room, and they tell me he inhaled about four meals at once. That night, they roomed him with Hein. Next morning, Hein and me walks out to the grounds together, and Hein tells me about him. He says, Don't never call me a bug again. 
they got me rooming with the champion of the world. Who is he? I says. I don't know, and I don't want to know, says Hein. But if they stick him in there with me again, I'll jump to the Federals. To start with, he ain't got no baggage. I asked him where his trunk was, and he says he didn't have none. Then I asked him if he didn't have no suitcase, and he says, no, what do you care? I was going to lend him some pajamas, but he put on the shirt of the uniform John give him last night and slept in that. He was asleep when I got up this morning. I seen his collar laying on the dresser, and it looked like he had wore it in Pittsburgh every day for a year. So I throwed it out the window, and he comes down to breakfast with no collar. I asked him what size collar he wore, and he says he didn't want none, because he wasn't going out nowheres. After breakfast, he beat it up to the room again and put on his uniform. When I got up there, he was looking in the glass at himself, and he done it all the time I was dressing. When we got out to the park, I took my first look at him. Pretty good-looking guy, too, in his uni. Big shoulders and well put together. Built something like Hine himself. He was talking to John when I come up. What position do you play? John was asking him. I play anywhere, says Elliot. You're the kind I'm looking for, says John. Then he says, you was an outfielder up there in Michigan, wasn't you? I don't care where I play, says Elliot. John sends him to the outfield and forgets all about him for a while. Pretty soon Miller comes in and says, I ain't going to shag for no bush outfielder. John asked him what was the matter. And Miller tells him that Elliot ain't doing nothing but just standing out there. That he ain't making no attempt to catch the fungos and that he won't even chase them. Then John starts watching him, and it was just like Miller said. Larry hit one pretty near in his lap, and he stepped out of the way. John calls him in and asks him, Why don't you go after them fly balls? Because I don't want them, says Elliot. John gets sarcastic and says, What do you want? Of course we'll see that you get anything you want. Give me a ticket back home, says Elliot. Don't you want to stick with the club, says John? And the busher tells him, no, he certainly did not. Then John tells him he'll have to pay his own fare home, and Elliot don't get sore at all. He just says, well, I'll have to stick then, because I'm broke. We was having batting practice, and John tells him to go up and hit a few. And you ought to have seen him bust them. Lavender was in there working, and he'd been pitching a little all winter, so he was in pretty good shape. He lobbed one up to Elliot, and he hit it way up in some trees outside the fence. About a mile, I guess. And John tells Jimmy to put something on the ball. Jim comes through with one of his fast ones, and the kid slams it again the right field wall on a line. Give him your spitter, yells John. And Jim handed him one. He pulled it over first base so fast that Bert, who was standing down there, couldn't hardly duck in time. If it had hit him, it had killed him. Well, he kept on hitting everything Jim gave him. And Jim had something, too. Finally, John gets Pierce warmed up and sends him out to pitch, telling him to hand Elliot a flock of curveballs. He wanted to see if left-handers was going to bother him. But he slammed him right along, and I don't believe he hit more than two the whole morning that wouldn't have been base hits in a game. They send him out to the outfield again in the afternoon, and after a lot of coaxing, Leach got him to go after fly balls. But that's all he did do. Just go after him. One hit him on the bean, another on the shoulder. He run back after the short ones and way in after the ones that went over his head. He catched just one, a line drive that he couldn't get out of the way of, and then he acted like it hurt his hands. I came back to the hotel with John. He asked me what I thought of Elliot. Well, I says, he'd be the greatest ball player in the world if he could just play ball. He sure can bust him. 
John says he was afraid he couldn't never make an outfielder out of him. He says, I'll try him on the infield tomorrow. They must be someplace he can play. I never seen a left-handed hitter that looks so good again left-handed pitching, and he's got a great arm, but he acts like he'd never seen a fly ball. Well, he was just as bad on the infield. They put him at short, and he was like a sieve. You could have drove a hearse between him and second base without him getting near it. He'd stoop over for a ground ball about the time it was bouncing up again the fence. And when he tried to cover the bag on a peg, he'd trip over it. They tried him at first base, and sometimes he'd run way over in the coacher's box, and sometimes out in right field looking for the bag. Once Hind shot one across at him on a line, and he never touched it with his hands. It went bam right in the pit of his stomach, and the lunch he'd ate didn't do him no good. Finally, John just give up and says he'd have to keep him on the bench and let him earn his pay by busting him a couple of times a week or so. We all agreed with John that this bird would be a whale of a pinch hitter, and we was right, too. He was hitting way over 500 when the blow-off come, along about the last of May. 2. Before the training trip was over, Elliot had roomed with pretty near everybody in the club. Hine raised an awful holler after the second night down there, and John put the bug in with Needham. Tom stood him for three nights. Then he doubled up with Archer and Schulte and Miller and Leach and Sayer and the whole bunch in turn averaging about two nights with each one before they put up a kick. Then John tried him with some of the youngsters, but they wouldn't stand for him no more than the others. They all said he was crazy, and they was afraid he'd get violent some night and stick a knife in him. He always insisted on having the water run in the bathtub all night, because he said it reminded him of the sound of the dam near his home. The fellers might get up four or five times a night and shut off the faucet, but he'd get right up after him and turn it on again. Carter, a big bush pitcher from Georgia, started a fight with him about it one night, and Elliot pretty near killed him. So the rest of the bunch, when they'd saw Carter's map next morning, didn't have the nerve to do nothing when it come their turn. Another of his habits was the thing that scared him, though. He'd brought a razor with him, in his pocket, I guess, and he used to do his shaving in the middle of the night. Instead of doing it in the bathroom, he'd lather his face and then come out and stand in front of the looking glass on the dresser. Of course, he'd have all the lights turned on, and that was bad enough when a feller wanted to sleep. But the worst of it was that he'd stop shaving every little while and turn around and stare at the guy who was making a failure of trying to sleep. Then he'd wave his razor round in the air and laugh and begin shaving again. You can imagine how comfortable his roomies felt. John had bought him a suitcase and some clothes and things and charged them up to him. He drew so much dough in advance that he didn't have nothing coming till about June. He never thanked John and he'd wear one shirt and one collar till someone throwed him away. Well, we finally gets to Indianapolis and we was going from there to Cincy to open. The last day in Indianapolis, John come and asked me how I'd like to change roomies. I says I was perfectly satisfied with Larry. Then John says, I wished you'd try Elliot. The other boys all kicks on him, but he seems to hang round you a lot, and I believe you could get along all right. Why don't you room him alone, I asked. The boss of the hotels won't stand for us rooming alone, says John. You go ahead and try it and see how you make out. If he's too much for you, let me know. But he likes you. And I think he'll be different with a guy who can talk to him like you can. So I says I'd tackle it, because I didn't want to throw John down. When we got to Cincy, they stuck Elliot and me in one room, and we was together till he quit us. 3. I went to the room early that night because we was going to open next day, and I wanted to feel like something. 
first thing I'd done when I got undressed was turn on both faucets in the bathtub. They was making an awful racket when Elliot finally come in about midnight. I was laying awake and I opened right up on him. I says, don't shut off that water because I like to hear it run. Then I turned over and pretended to be asleep. The bug got his clothes off and then what did he do but go in the bathroom and shut off the water. Then he come back in the room and says, I guess no one's going to tell me what to do in here. But I kept right on pretending to sleep and didn't pay no attention. When he'd got into his bed, I jumped out of mine and turned on all the lights and begun stropping my razor. He says, what's coming off? Some of my whiskers, I says. I always shave along about this time. No, you don't, he says. I was in your room one morning down in Louisville, and I seen you shaving then. Well, I says, the boys tell me you shave in the middle of the night, and I thought if I'd done all the things you do, maybe I'd get so's I could hit like you. You must be superstitious, he says, and I told him I was. I'm a good hitter, he says, and I'd be a good hitter if I never shaved at all. That don't make no difference. Yes, it does, I says. You probably hit good because you shave at night. But you'd be a better fielder if you shaved in the morning. You see, I was trying to be just as crazy as him, though that wasn't hardly possible. If that's right, says he, I'll do my shaving in the morning. Because I seen in the papers where the boy says that if I could play the outfield like I can hit, I'd be as good as Cobb. They tell me Cobb gets 20000 a year. No, I says, he don't get that much, but he gets about ten times as much as you do. Well, he says, I'm going to be as good as him, because I need the money. What do you want with money, I says. He just laughed and didn't say nothing. But from that time on, the water didn't run in the bathtub nights. And he done his shaving after breakfast. I didn't notice, though, that he looked any better in fielding practice. 4. It rained one day in Cincy, and they trimmed us two out of the other three. But it wasn't Elliot's fault. They had Larry beat 4-1 to one in the ninth inning of the first game. Archer gets on with two out, and John sends my roomie up to hit though Benton, a left-hander, is working for them. The first thing Benton serves up there, Elliot cracks it a mile over Hobby's head. It would have been good for three easy, only Archer, playing safe, of course, pulls up at third base. Tommy couldn't do nothing, and we was licked. The next day, he hits one out of the park off Indian, but we was way behind, and there was nobody on at the time. We copped the last one without using no pinch hitters. I didn't have no trouble with him nights during the whole series. He come to bed pretty late while we was there, and I told him he'd better not let John catch him at it. What would he do, he says. Fine you fifty, I says. He can't find me a dime, he says, because I ain't got it. Then I told him he'd be fined all he had coming if he didn't get in the hotel before midnight. But he just laughed and says he didn't think John had a kick coming so long as he kept busting the ball. Some day you'll go up there and you won't bust it, I says. That'll be an accident, he says. That stopped me and I didn't say nothing. What could you say to a guy who hated himself like that? The accident happened in St. Louis the first day. We needed two runs in the eighth, and Sayer and Brid was on with two out. John tells Elliot to go up in Pierce's place. The bug goes up, and Griner gives him two bad balls way outside. I thought they was going to walk him, and it looked like good judgment because they'd heard what he'd done in Cincy, but no. Griner comes back with a fast one right over, and Elliot pulls it down the right foul line, about two-foot foul. He hit it so hard you'd have thought they'd sure walk him then, but Griner gives him another fast one. 
He slammed it again just as hard, but foul. Then Griner gives him one way outside, and it's two and three, John says on the bench. If they don't walk him now, he'll bust that fence down. I thought the same, and I was sure Griner wouldn't give him nothing to hit. But he come with a curve, and Wrigler calls Elliot out. From where we sat, the last one looked low, and I thought Elliot would make a kick. He come back to the bench smiling. John starts for his position, but stopped and asked the bug what was the matter with that one. Any busher I ever knowed would have said, It was too low, or it was outside, or it was inside. Elliot says, Nothing at all. It was right over the middle. Why didn't you bust it then, says John. I was afraid I'd kill somebody, says Elliot, and laugh like a big boob. John was pretty near choking. What are you laughing at, he says. I was thinking of a nickel show I seen in Cincinnati, says the bug. Well, says John, so mad he couldn't hardly see, that show and that laugh will cost you fifty. We got beat, and I wouldn't have blamed John if he'd find him his whole season's pay. Up in the room that night, I told him he'd better cut out that laughing stuff when we was getting trimmed, or he would never have no payday. Then he got confidential. Payday wouldn't do me no good, he says. When I'm all squared up with the club and begin to have a payday, I'll only get a hundred bucks at a time, and I'll owe that to some of you fellers. I wish we could win the pennant and get in on that World Series dough. Then I'd get a bunch at once. What would you do with a bunch of dough, I asked him. Don't tell nobody, sport, he says. But if I ever get 500 at once, I'm going to get married. Oh, I says, and who's the lucky girl? She's a girl up in Muskegon, says Elliot, and you're right when you call her lucky. You don't like yourself much, do you, I says. I got reason to like myself, says he. You'd like yourself, too, if you could hit him like me. Well, I says, you didn't show me no hitting today. I couldn't hit because I was laughing too hard, says Elliot. What was it you was laughing at, I says. I was laughing at that pitcher, he says. He thought he had something, and he didn't have nothing. He had enough to whiff you with, I says. He didn't have nothing, says he again. I was afraid if I busted one off him, they'd can him, and then I couldn't never hit again him no more. Naturally, I didn't have no come back to that. I just sort of gasped and got ready to go to sleep, but he wasn't through. I wished you could see this bird, he says. What bird, I says. This dame that's nuts about me, he says. Good looker? I asked. No, he says, she ain't no bear for looks. They ain't nothing about her for a guy to rave over till you hear her sing. She sure can holler some. What kind of voice has she got? I asked. A bear, says he. No, I says, I mean, is she a berry tone or an air? I don't know, he says, but she's got the loudest voice I ever hear on a woman. She's pretty near got me beat. Can you sing, I says, and I was sorry right afterward that I asked him that question. I guess it must have been bad enough to have the water running night after night and to have him waving that razor round, but that couldn't have been nothing to his singing. Just as soon as I'd pulled that boner, he says, listen to me, and starts in on silver threads among the gold. Mind you, it was after midnight, and there was guests all round us trying to sleep. They used to be noise enough in our club when we had Hoffman and Sheckard and Richie harmonizing, but this bug's voice was louder and all there combined. We once had a pitcher named Martin Walsh, brother of Big Ed's, and I thought he could drown out the subway. But this guy made a boiler factory sound like Dummy Taylor. 
If the whole hotel wasn't awake when he'd howled the first line, it's a pipe they was when he cut loose, which he'd done when he come to always young and fair to me. Them words could have been heard easy in East St. Louis. He didn't get no encore from me, but he goes right through it again, or starts to. I knowed something was going to happen before he finished, and something did. The night clerk and the house detective come banging at the door. I let him in, and they had plenty to say. If we made another sound, the whole club would be canned out of the hotel. I tried to salve him, and I says, he won't sing no more. But Elliot swelled up like a poisoned pup. Won't I, he says, I'll sing all I want to. You won't sing in here, says the clerk. They ain't room for my voice in here anyways, he says. I'll go outdoors and sing. And he puts his clothes on and ducks out. I didn't make no attempt to stop him. I heard him bellowing silver threads down the corridor and down the stairs with the clerk and the dick chasing him all the way and telling him to shut up. Well, the guests make a holler the next morning, and the hotel people tells Charlie Williams that he'll either have to let Elliot stay somewhere else, or the whole club will have to move. Charlie tells John, and John was thinking of settling the question by releasing Elliot. I guess he'd about made up his mind to do it. But that afternoon they had us three to one in the ninth, and we got the bases full with two down at Larry's turn to hit. Elliot had been sitting on the bench saying nothing. Do you think you can hit one today, says John. I can hit one any day, says Elliot. Go up and hit that left-hander then, says John, and remember there's nothing to laugh at. Sally was working, and working good. But that didn't bother the bug. He cut into one, and it went between oaks and witted like a shot. He came into third standing up, and we was a run to the good. Sally was so sore he kind of forgot himself and took pretty near his full wind-up pitching to Tommy. And what did Elliot do but steal home and get away with it clean? Well, you couldn't can him after that, could you? Charlie gets him a room somewheres, and I was relieved of his company that night. The next evening, we beat it for shy to play about two weeks at home. He didn't tell nobody where he roomed there, and I didn't see nothing of him except out to the park. I asked him what he did with himself nights, and he says, Same as I do on the road. Borrow some dough someplace and go to the nickel shows. You must be stuck on him, I says. Yes, he says, I like the ones where they kill people, because I want to learn how to do it. I may have that job some day. Don't pick on me, I says. Oh, says the bug, you never can tell who I'll pick on. It seemed as if he just couldn't learn nothing about fielding, and finally John told him to keep out of the practice. A ball might hit him in the temple and croak him, says John. But he busted up a couple of games for us at home, beating Pittsburgh once and Cincy once. End of chapter 6. My Roomie, part 1. Chapter 6, part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 6, My Roomie, Part 2, 5. They give me a great big room at the hotel in Pittsburgh, so the fellers picked it out for the poker game. We was playing along about ten o'clock one night when in come Elliot, the earliest he'd showed up since we'd been rooming together. They was only five of us playing, and Tom asked him to sit in. I'm busted, he says. Can you play poker, I asked him. There's nothing I can't do, he says. 
Slip me a couple of bucks and I'll show you. So I slipped him a couple of bucks and honestly hoped he'd win, because I knowed he'd never had no dough. Well, Tom dealt him a hand and he picks it up and says, I only got five cards. How many do you want, I says. Oh, he says, if that's all I get, I'll try to make them do. The pot was cracked and raised, and he stood the raise. I says to myself, there goes my two bucks. But no, he comes out with three queens and won the dough. It was only about seven bucks, but you'd have thought it was a million to see him grab it. He laughed like a kid. Guess I can't play this game, he says, and he had me fooled for a minute. I thought he must have been kidding when he complained of only having five cards. He copped another pot right afterward and was sitting there with about 11 bucks in front of him when Jim opens a rudal pot for a buck. I stays and so does Elliot. Him and Jim both drawed one card and I took three. I had kings or queens, I forget which. I didn't help him none. So when Jim bets a buck, I throws my hand away. How much can I bet, says the bug. You can raise Jim a buck if you want to, I says. So he bets two dollars. Jim comes back at him. He comes right back at Jim. Jim raises him again and he tilts Jim right back. Well, when he'd boosted Jim with the last buck he had, Jim says, I'm ready to call. I guess you got me beat. What have you got? I know what I've got, all right, says Elliot. I've got a straight. And he throws his hand down. Sure enough, it was a straight, eight high. Jim pretty near fainted, and so did I. The bug had started pulling in the dough when Jim stops him. Here, wait a minute, says Jim. I thought you had something. I filled up. Then Jim lays down his nine full. You beat me, I guess, says Elliot, and he looked like he'd lost his last friend. Beat you, says Jim. Of course I beat you. What did you think I had? Well, says the bug, I thought you might have a small flush or something. When I regained consciousness, he was begging for two more bucks. What for, I says, to play poker with? You're barred from the game for life. Well, he says, I can't play no more. I want to go to sleep. And you fellers will have to get out of this room. Did you ever hear a nerve like that? This was the first night he'd come in before 12, and he orders the bunch out so he can sleep. We politely suggested to him to go to Brooklyn. Without saying a word, he starts in on his silver threads. And it wasn't two minutes till the game was busted up and the bunch, all but me, was out of there. I'd have beat it too, only he stopped yelling as soon as they went. You're some buster, I says. You bust up ball games in the afternoon and poker games at night. Yes, he says, that's my business, busting things. And before I knowed what he was about, he picked up the pitcher of ice water that was on the floor and throwed it out the window, through the glass and all. Right then I give him a plain talking to. I tells him how near he come to getting canned down in St. Louis because he raised so much cane singing in the hotel. But I had to keep my voice in shape, he says. If I ever get dough enough to get married, the girl and me'll go out singing together. Out where, I asked. Out on the vaudeville circuit, says Elliot. Well, I says, if her voice is like yours, you'll be wasting money if you travel round. Just stay up in Muskegon and we'll hear you all right. I told him he wouldn't never get no dough if he didn't behave himself. That even if we got in the World Series, he wouldn't be with us, unless he cut out the foolishness. We ain't going to get in no World Series, he says, and I won't never get a bunch of money at once, so it looks like I couldn't get married this fall. Then I told him we played a city series every fall. He'd never thought of that, and it tickled him to death. I told him the losers always got about 500 apiece and that we were about due to win it and get about 800. But, I says, 
we still got a good chance for the old pennant. If I was you, I wouldn't give up hope of that yet. Not where John can hear you, anyway. No, he says, we won't win no pennant, because he won't let me play regular. But I don't care so long as we're sure of that City Series dough. You ain't sure of it if you don't behave, I says. Well, says he, very serious, I guess I'll behave. And he did, till we made our first Eastern trip. 6. We went to Boston first, and that crazy bunch goes out and piles up a three-run lead on us in seven innings the first day. It was the pitcher's turn to lead off in the eighth, so up goes Elliot to bat for him. He kisses the first thing they hands him for three bases. And we says on the bench, Now we'll get him, because, you know, a three-run lead wasn't nothing in Boston. Stay right on that bag, John hollers to Elliot. Maybe if John hadn't said nothing to him, everything would have been all right. But when Purdue starts to pitch the first ball to Tommy Elliott, starts to steal home. He's out as far as from here to Seattle. If I'd been carrying a gun, I'd have shot him right through the heart. As it was, I thought John had kill him with a bat because he was standing there with a couple of them waiting for his turn. But I guess John was too stunned to move. He didn't even seem to see Elliot when he went to the bench. After I'd cooled off a little, I says, Beat it, and get into your clothes before John comes in. Then go to the hotel and keep out of sight. When I got up in the room afterward, there was Elliot looking as innocent and happy as though he'd won fifty bucks with a pair of trays. I thought you might have killed yourself, I says. What for, he says. For that swell play you made, says I. What was the matter with the play, asked Elliot, surprised. It was all right when I'd done it in St. Louis. Yes, I says, but there was two out in St. Louis, and we wasn't no three runs behind. Well, he says, if it was all right in St. Louis, I don't see why it was wrong here. It's a different climate here, I says, too disgusted to argue with him. I wonder if they'd let me sing in this climate, says Elliot. No, I says, don't sing in this hotel because we don't want to get fired out of here. The eats is too good. All right, he says, I won't sing. But when I starts down to supper, he says, I'm liable to do something worse than sing. He didn't show up in the dining room and John went to the boxing show after supper. So it looked like him and Elliot wouldn't run into each other till the murder had left John's heart. I was glad of that because a Massachusetts jury might not consider it justifiable homicide if one guy croaked another for giving the Boston Club a game. I went down to the corner and had a couple of beers, and then I come straight back intending to hit the hay. The elevator boy had went for a drink or something, and there was two old ladies already waiting in the car when I stepped in. Right along after me comes Elliot. Where's the boy that's supposed to run this car, he says. I told him the boy'd be right back, but he says, I can't wait, I'm much too sleepy. And before I could stop him, he'd slam the door, and him and I and the poor old ladies was shooting up. Let us off at the third floor, please, says one of the ladies, her voice kind of shaken. Sorry, madam, says the bug, but this is an express, and we don't stop at no third floor. I grabbed his arm and tried to get him away from the machinery. But he was as strong as an ox, and he throwed me again the side of the car like I was a baby. He went to the top faster than I ever rode in an elevator before. And then we shot down to the bottom, hitting the bumper down there so hard I thought we'd be smashed to splinters. The ladies was too scared to make a sound during the first trip. But while we was going up and down the second time, even faster in the first, they begun to scream. I was hollering my head off at him to quit, and he was making more noise than the three of us, pretending he was the locomotive and the whole crew of the train. Don't never ask me how many times we went up and down. The women fainted on the third trip, and I guess I was about as near it as I'll ever get. The elevator boy and the bellhops and the waiters and the night clerk and everybody was jumping around the lobby screaming, but no one seemed to know how to stop us. Finally, 
on about the tenth trip i guess he slowed down and stopped at the fifth floor where we was rooming he opened the door and beat it for the room while i though i was trembling like a leaf run the car down to the bottom the night clerk knowed me pretty well and knowed i wouldn't do nothing like that so him and i didn't argue but just got to work together to bring the old woman to while we was doing that, Elliot must have run down the stairs and slipped out of the hotel because they sent the officers up to the room after him he'd blowed. They was going to fire the club out, but Charlie had a good stand-in with Amos, the proprietor, and he fixed it up to let us stay, providing Elliot kept away. The bug didn't show up at the ballpark the next day, and we didn't see no more of him till we got on the Rattler for New York. Charlie and John both bawled him, but they give him a berth, an upper, and we pulled into the Grand Central Station without him having made no effort to wreck the train. 7. I'd studied the thing pretty carefully, but hadn't come to no conclusion. I was sure he wasn't no stew, because none of the boys had ever saw him even take a glass of beer, and I couldn't never detect the odor of booze on him, and if he'd been a dope, I'd have knew about it, rooming with him. There wouldn't have been no mystery about it if he'd been a left-hand pitcher. But he wasn't. He wasn't nothing but a whale of a hitter, and he throwed with his right arm. He hit left-handed, of course, but so did Sayer and Brid and Schulte and me and John himself, and none of us was violent. I guessed he must have been just a plain nut and liable to break out any time. There was a letter waiting for him at New York, and I took it, intending to give it to him at the park because I didn't think they'd let him room at the hotel. But after breakfast, he'd come up to the room with his suitcase. It seems he'd promised John and Charlie to be good and made it so strong they believed him. I give him his letter, which was addressed in a girl's writing and come from Muskegon. From the girl, I says? Yes, he says, and without opening it, he tore it up and throwed it out the window. Had a quarrel, I asked. No, no, he says, but she can't tell me nothing I don't know already. Girls always writes the same junk. I got one from her in Pittsburgh, but I didn't read it. I guess you ain't so stuck on her, I says. He swells up and says, of course I'm stuck on her. If I wasn't, do you think I'd be going around with this bunch and getting insulted all the time? I'm sticking here because of that serious dough so's I can get hooked. Do you think you'd settle down if you was married, I asked him. Settle down, he says, sure I'd settle down. I'd be so happy that I wouldn't have to look for no excitement. Nothing special happened that night except he come in the room about one o'clock and woke me up by picking up the foot of the bed and dropping it on the floor sudden-like. Give me a key to the room, he says. You must have had a key, I says, or you couldn't have got in. That's right, he says, and beat it to bed. One of the reporters must have told Elliot that John had asked for waivers on him, and New York had refused to waive, because next morning he come to me with that dope. New York's going to win this pennant, he says. Well, I says, they will if someone else don't, but what of it? I'm going to play with New York, he says, so as I can get the World Series dough. How you going to get away from this club, I asked. Just watch me, he says. I'll be with New York before this series is over. Well, the way he goes after the job was original, anyway. Rube had had one of his good days the day before, and we got a trimming. But this second day, the score was tied up at two runs apiece in the tenth, and Big Jeff had been wobbling for two or three innings. Well, he walks Sayer and me with one out and Max sends for Maddie, who was warmed up and ready. John sticks Elliot in in Brid's place and the bug pulls one into the right field stand. It's a cinch McGraw thinks well of him then, and might have went after him if he hadn't went crazy the next afternoon. We're tied up in the ninth and Maddie's working. John sends Elliot up with the bases choked, but he doesn't go right up to the plate. He walks over to their bench and calls McGraw out. Mac tells us about it afterward. I can bust up this game right here, says Elliot. Go ahead, says Mac, but be careful he don't whiff you. Then the bug pulls it. If I whiff, he says, will you get me on your club? Sure, says Mac, just as anybody would. 
By this time, Bill Cohen was hollering about the delay. So up goes Elliot and gives the worst burlesque on trying to hit that you ever see. Maddie throws one a mile outside and high, and the bug swings like it was right over the heart. Then Maddie throws one at him, and he ducks out of the way, but swings just the same. Maddie must have been wise by this time, for he pitches one so far outside that the chief almost has to go to the coacher's box after it. Elliot takes his third healthy and runs through the field down to the clubhouse. We got beaten the 11th, and when we went in to dress, he has his street clothes on. Soon as he seen John coming, he says, I got to see McGraw, and he beat it. John was going to the fights that night, but before he leaves the hotel, he had waivers on Elliot from everybody and had sold him to Atlanta. And, says John, I don't care if they pay for him or not. My roomie blows in about nine and got the letter from John out of his box. He was going to tear it up, but I told him there was news in it. He opens it and reads where he's sold. I was still sore at him, so I says, Thought you was going to get on the New York club? No, he says, I got turned down cold. McGraw says he wouldn't have me in his club. He says he'd had Charlie Faust, and that was enough for him. He had a kind of crazy look in his eyes. So when he starts up to the room, I follows him. What are you going to do now, I says. I'm going to sell this ticket to Atlanta, he says, and go back to Muskegon, where I belong. I'll help you pack, I says. No, says the bug, I come into this league with this suit of clothes and a collar. They can have the rest of it. Then he sits down on the bed and begins to cry like a baby. No series dough for me, he blubbers, and no wedding bells. My girl will die when she hears about it. Of course, that made me feel kind of rotten, and I says, Brace up, boy. The best thing you can do is go to Atlanta and try hard. You'll be up here again next year. You can't tell me where to go, he says, and he wasn't crying no more. I'll go where I please, and I'm liable to take you with me. I didn't want no argument, so I kept still. Pretty soon he goes up to the looking glass and stares at himself for five minutes. Then all of a sudden he hauls off and takes a wallop at his reflection in the glass. Naturally, he smashed the glass all to pieces, and he cut his hand something awful. Without looking at it, he comes over to me and says, Well, goodbye, sport, and holds out his other hand to shake. When I starts to shake with him, he smears his bloody hand all over my map, and then he laughed like a wild man and run out of the room and out of the hotel. 8. Well, boys, my sleep was broke up for the rest of the season. It might have been because I was used to sleeping in all kinds of racket and excitement, and I couldn't stand for the quiet after he'd went, or it might have been because I kept thinking about him and feeling sorry for him. I often wondered if he'd settle down and be something if he could get married. And finally I got to believe in he would. So when we was dividing the city series, though, I was thinking of him and the girl. Our share of the money, the losers, as usual, was 12760 bucks or something like that. There was 21 of us, and that meant 607 bucks a piece. We was just going to cut it up that way when I says, Why not give a divvy to poor old Elliot? About 15 of them at once told me that I was crazy. You see, when he got canned, he owed everybody in the club. I guess he'd stuck me for the most, about 70 bucks but I didn't care nothing about that. I knowed he hadn't never reported to Atlanta, and I thought he was probably busted and a bunch of money might make things all right for him and the other songbird. I made quite a speech to the fellers, telling him how he'd cried when he left us and how his heart had been set on getting married on the series dough. I made it so strong that they finally fell for it. Our shares was cut to 580 apiece, and John sent him a check for a full share. For a while, I was kind of worried about what I did. I didn't know if I was doing right by the girl to give him the chance to marry her. He told me she was stuck on him, and that's the only excuse I had for trying to fix it up between them. 
But believe me, if she was my sister or a friend of mine, I'd just as soon have had her manage the Cincinnati Club as marry that bird. I thought to myself, if she's all right, she'll take acid in a month, and it'll be my fault. But if she's really stuck on him, they must be something wrong with her, too. So what's the difference? Then along comes this letter that I told you about. It's from some friend of his and up there, and there's a note from him. I'll read them to you, and then I got to beat it for the station. Dear Sir, they have got poor Elliot locked up, and they are going to take him to the asylum at Kalamazoo. He thanks you for the check, and we will use the money to see that he is made comfortable. When the poor boy come back here, he found that his girl was married to Joe Bishop, who runs a soda fountain. She had wrote to him about it, but he did not read her letters. The news drove him crazy. Poor boy and he went to the place where they was living with a baseball bat and very nearly killed them both. Then he marched down the street singing silver threads among the gold at the top of his voice. They was going to send him to prison for assault with intent to kill, but the jury decided he was crazy. He wants to thank you again for the money. Yours truly, Jim. I can't make out his last name, but it don't make no difference. Now I'll read you his note. Old Rumi, I was at bat twice and made two hits, but I guess I did not meet them square. They tell me they are both alive yet, which I did not mean them to be. I hope they got good curveball pitchers where I am going. I sure can bust them curves, can't I, sport? Yours, B. Elliot. P.S. The B stands for Buster. That's all of it, fellers, and you can see I had some excuse for not hitting. You can also see why I ain't never going to room with no bug again. Not for John or nobody else. End of chapter 6. My Roomie, part 2. Chapter 7, part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Madison Rutherford. Chapter 7, Part 1, A Caddy's Diary. Preface. Critics have charged that this story is a direct steal from some of Barry's earlier tales of adventures on the golf course. The author denies this, but admits his indebtedness to Gertrude Atherton for some of the scenes in the barber shop. Curiosity has often been expressed as to the identity of the man from whom the leading character is drawn, and guesses have ranged all the way from Al Jennings to Saavedra Miguel de Cervantes. The author takes this opportunity to announce that the original of the caddy is Wilkie Collins, and the story is based on the latter's actual experiences while he was night order clerk at the Pennsylvania Hotel. Wednesday. April 12th. I am 16 of age and am a caddy at the Pleasant View Golf Club, but only temporary, as I expect to soon land a job somewhere as assistant pro, as my game is good enough now to be a pro, but too young looking. My pal Joe Bean also says I have not got enough swell head to make a good pro, but suppose that will come in time. Joe is a wisecracker. But first we'll put down how I come to be writing this diary. We have got a member named Mr. Colby who writes articles in the newspapers, and I hope for his sakes that he is a better writer than he plays golf. But anyway, I catted for him a good many times last year, and today he was out for the first time this year and I catted for him and we got talking about this and that and something was mentioned in regards to the golf article by Alex Laird that comes out every Sunday in the paper Mr. Colby writes his articles for, so I asked Mr. Colby, did he know how much Laird got paid for the articles, and he said he did not know, but supposed that Laird had to split 50-50 with whoever wrote the articles for him. So I said, don't he write the articles himself? And Mr. Colby said, why no, he guessed not. Laird may be a mastermind in regards to golf, he said, but that is no sign he can write about it, as very few men can write decent, let alone a pro. Writing is a nag. How do you learn it, I asked him. Well, he said, read what other people write, and study them and write things yourself, and maybe you will get on to the nag, and maybe you won't. Well, Mr. Colby, I said, do you think I could get on to it? Why, he said, smiling, I did not know that was your ambition to be a writer. 
Not exactly, was my reply, but I am going to be a golf pro myself, and maybe someday I will get good enough so as the papers will want, I should write them articles, and if I can learn to write them myself, why I will not have to hire another writer and split it with them. Well, said Mr. Colby, smiling, you have certainly got the right temperament for a pro. They are all big-hearted fellows. But listen, Mr. Colby, I said, if I want to learn it would not do me no good to copy down what other writers have wrote. What I would have to do would be write things out of my own head. That is true, said Mr. Colby. Well, I said, what could I write about? Well, said Mr. Colby, why don't you keep a diary, and every night after your supper sit down and write what happened that day, and write who you catted for, and what they done only leave me out of it. And you can write down what people say and what you think in ETC. It will be the best kind of practice for you, and once in a while you can bring me your writings, and I will tell you the truth if they are good or rotten. So that is how I come to be writing this diary is, so as I can get some practice writing, and maybe if I keep at it long enough, I can get on to the nag. Friday, April 14th. We've been having April showers for a couple days, and nobody out on the course, so there has been nothing happened that I could write down in my diary. But don't want to leave it go too long, or I will never learn the trick. So we'll try and write a few lines about a caddy's life and some of our members and ETC. Well, I and Joe Bean is the two oldest caddies in the club, and I've been caddying now for five years and quit school three years ago, though my mother did not like it for me to quit. But my father said, he can read and write and figure, so what is the use in keeping him there any longer, as Greek and Latin don't get you no credit at the grocer? So they lied about my age to the trunce officer. And I've been catting every year from March till November, and the rest of the winter I work around Heisman's store in the village. During the time I am catting, I generally always manage to play at least nine holes a day myself on weekdays, and sometimes 18, and am never more than two or three over par figures on our course, but it is a cinch. I played the engineer's course one day last summer in 75, which is some golf and some of our members who has been playing 20 years would give their right eye to play as good as myself. I used to play around with our pro Jack Andrews till I got so as I could beat him pretty near every time we played, and now he won't play with me no more. He is not a very good player for a pro, but they claim he is a good teacher. Personally, I think golf teachers is a joke, though I am glad people is suckers enough to fall for it, as I expect to make my living that way. We have got a member, Mr. Dunham, who must have took 500 lessons in the past three years, and when he starts to shoot, he tries to remember all the junk Andrews has learned him, and he gets dizzy and there is no telling where the ball will go, and about the safest place to stand when he is shooting is between he and the hole. I don't believe the club pays Andrews much salary, but of course he makes pretty fair money giving lessons, but his best craft is a three, some which he plays two and three times a week with Mr. Purdue and Mr. Lewis and he gives Mr. Lewis a stroke a hole, and they generally break somewheres near even. But Mr. Purdue made a 83 one time, so he thinks that is his game, so he insists on playing jack even. Well, they always play for $5 a hole, and Andrews makes $20 to $30 per round, and if he wanted to cut loose and play his best, he could make $50 to $60 per round. But a couple of wallops like that, Mr. Purdue might get cured, so Jack figures a small steady income is safer. I have got a pal named Joe Bean. And we pal around together, and he is about my age, and he says some comical things, and sometimes will whisper something comical to me while we are catting, and it is all I can do to help from laughing out loud. That is one of the first things a caddy has got to learn is never laugh out loud, only when a member makes a joke. However, on the days when these ladies on the course, I don't get a chance to caddy with Joe, because for some reason or another, the woman folks don't like Joe to caddy for them, while on the other hand, they are always after me though I am no Othello for looks, or do I seek their favors, in fact. It is just the op, and I try to keep in the background when the fair sex appears on the scene, as catting for ladies means you will get just so much money and no more, as there is no chance of them loosening up. As Joe says, the rule against tipping is the only rule the woman folks keeps. There is one lady, however, who I like to caddy for, as she looks like Lillian Gish, and it is a pleasure to just look at her and I would caddy for her for nothing, though it is hard to keep your eye on the ball when you are caddying for this lady. Her name is Mrs. Doan. Saturday, April 15th. This was a long day, and am pretty well wore out, but must not get behind in my riding practice. I and Joe carried all day for Mr. Thomas and Mr. Blake. Mr. Thomas is the vice president of one of the big banks downtown, and he always slips you a dollar extra per round, but believe me, you earn it caddying for Mr. Thomas. There is just 16 clubs in his bag, including five wood clubs, though he has not used the wood in three years, but says he has got to have them along in case his irons goes wrong on him. I don't know how bad his irons will have to get before he will think they have went wrong on him, 
but personally, if I made some of the tee shots he made today, I would certainly consider some kind of a change of weapons. Mr. Thomas is one of the kind of players that when it took him more than six shots to get on the green, he will turn to you and say, how many have I had, caddy? And then you are supposed to pretend like you was thinking a minute, and then say four. Then he will say to the man he is playing with, well, I did not know if I had shot four or five, but the caddy says it is four. You see, in this way, it is not him that is cheating, but the caddy. But he makes it up to the caddy afterwards with a one dollar tip. Mr. Blake gives Mr. Thomas a stroke a hole, and then they play a ten dollar NASA, and neither one of them wins much money from the other one, but even if they did, why ten dollars is chicken's food to men like they. But the way they crab and squawk about different things, you would think their last one dollar was at stake. Mr. Thomas started out this AM with a 8 and a 7, and of course they spoilt the day for him and me too. There's lots of men that if they don't make a good score on the first two holes, they will founder all the rest of the way around and raise H with their caddy. If I was laying out a golf course, I would make the first two holes so darn easy that you could not help from getting a 4 or better on them. And in that way, everybody would start off good-natured and it would be a few holes at least before they'd begun to turn sour. Mr. Thomas was beat both in the AM and the PM in spite of my help, as Mr. Blake is a pretty fair counter himself, and I heard him say he got a 88 in the PM, which is about a 94, but anyway, it was good enough to win. Mr. Blake's regular game is about a 90, taking his own figures, and he is one of the cocky guys that takes his own game serious and sneers at men that can't break a 100, and if you was to ask him if he had ever been over a 100 himself, he would say, why not since the first year he begun to play. Well, I have watched a lot of those guys like he, and I will tell you how they keep from getting over a hundred, namely by doing just what he done this AM, when he come to the thirteenth hole. Well, he missed his tee shot and dubbed along, and finally he got in the trap on his fourth shot, and I seen him take six wallops in the trap, and when he had took the sixth one, his ball was worse off than when he started, so he picked it up and marked AX down on his scorecard. Well, if he had have played out the hole, why, the best he could have got was a eleven by holding his next niblick shot but he would have probably got about a 20, which would have made him around 108, as he admitted taking an 88 for the other 17 holes. But I bet if you was to ask him what score he had made, he would say, oh, I was terrible and I picked up on one hole, but if I had have played them all out, I guess I would have had about a 92. These is the kind of men that laughs themselves hoarse when they hear of some dub taking 10 strokes for a hole, but if they was made to play out every hole and mark down their real score, their card would be decorated with many a big casino. Well, as I say, I had a hard day and was pretty sore along towards the finish, but still I had to laugh at Joe being on his 15th hole, which is a par 3 and you can get there with a fair drive and personally I am generally hole high with mid-iron. But Mr. Thomas topped his tee shot and dubbed a couple with his mashie and was still quite a ways off the green and he stood studying the situation a minute and said to Mr. Blake, well, I wonder what I better take here. So Joe Bean was standing by me and he said under his breath, take my advice and quit, you old rascal. Monday, April 17th. Yesterday was sun and I was to wore out last night to write as I catted 45 holes. I catted for Mr. Colby in the a.m. and Mr. Langley in the p.m. Mr. Thomas thinks golf is wrong on the Sabbath, though as Joe Bean says it is wrong any day the way he plays it. This AM, they was nobody on the course, and I played 18 holes by myself and had a 5 for a 76 on the 18th hole, but the wind got a hold of my drive and it went out of bounds. This PM, they was three of us had a game of rummy started, but Miss Rennie and Mrs. Thomas came out to play and asked for me to caddy for them. They are both terrible. Mrs. Thomas is Mr. Thomas' wife, and she is big and fat and shakes like gel, and she always says she plays golf just to make her skinny, and she don't care how rotten she plays as long as she is getting the exercise. Well, maybe so, but when we find her ball in the bad lie, she ain't never sure it is hers till she picks it up and smells it. And when she puts it back, believe me, she don't cram it down no gopher hole. Miss Rennie is a good looker and young, and they say she is engaged to Chase Crane. He is one of our members and is the best player in the club and don't cheat hardly at all, and he has got a job in the bank where Mr. Thomas is the vice president. Well, I have catted for Miss Rennie when she was playing with Mr. Crane, and I have catted for her when she was playing alone or with another lady. And I often think if Mr. Crane could hear her talk when he was not around, he would not be so stuck on her. You would be surprised at some of the words that falls from those fair lips. Well, the two ladies played for two bits a hole, and Miss Rennie was having a terrible time while Mrs. Thomas was shot with luck on the greens and sunk three or four putts that was murder. Well, Miss Rennie used some expressions which was best not repeated, but towards the last the luck changed around it was Miss Rennie that was sinking the long ones, and when they got up to the 18th tee, Mrs. Thomas was only one up. 
Well, we had started pretty late, and when we left the 17th green, Miss Rennie made the remark that we would have to hurry to get the last hole played. Well, it was her honor, and she got the best drive she made all day, about 120 yards down the fairway. Well, Mrs. Thomas got nervous and looked up and missed her ball afoot, and then done the same thing right over, and when she finally hit it, she only knocked it about 20 yards, and this made her lay three. Well, her fourth went wild and lit over in the rough in the apple trees. It was a cinch that Miss Rennie would win the hole unless she dropped dead. Well, we all went over to hunt for Mrs. Thomas' ball, but we would have been lucky to find it even in the daylight, but now you cannot hardly see under the trees, so Miss Rennie said, drop another ball and we will not count no penalty. Well, it is some job any time to make a woman give up hunting for a lost ball, and all the more so when it is going to cost her two bits to play the hole out, so... There we stayed for at least ten minutes till it was so dark we could not see each other, let alone a lost ball, and finally Mrs. Thomas said, Well, it looks like we cannot finish. How do we stand? Just like she did not know how they stood. You had me one down up to this hole, said Miss Rennie. Well, that is finishing pretty close, said Mrs. Thomas. I will have to give Miss Rennie credit that whatever word she thought of for this occasion she did not say it out loud, but when she was paying me she said I might have give you a quarter tip, only I have to give Mrs. Thomas a quarter she don't deserve, so you don't get it. Fat chance I would have had anyway. Thursday, April 20th. Well, we've been having some more bad weather, but today the weather was all right, but that was the only thing that was all right. This p.m. I catted double for Mr. Thomas and Chase Crane, the club champion who is stuck on Miss Rennie. It was a foursome with he and Mr. Thomas against Mr. Blake and Jack Andrews the pro. They was only playing best ball, so it was really just a match between Mr. Crane and Jack Andrews, and Mr. Crane win by one up. Joe being catted for Jack and Mr. Blake. Mr. Thomas was terrible, and I put in a swell PM lugging that heavy bag of his besides Mr. Crane's bag. Mr. Thomas did not go off the course as much as usual, but he kept hitting behind the ball, and he run me ragged replacing his divots. But still, I had to laugh when we was playing the fourth hole, which you have to drive over a ravine, and every time Mr. Thomas misses his tee shot on this hole, why he makes a squawk about the ravine and says it ought not to be there in ETC. Today, he had a terrible time getting over it, and afterwards he said to Jack Andrews, this is a joke hole and ought to be changed. So Joe Bean whispered to me, if Mr. Thomas kept on playing like he was, then the whole course would have to be changed. Then, a little while later, when we came to the long ninth hole, Mr. Thomas got a fair tee shot, but then he whiffed twice missing the ball by a foot, and the third time he hit it, but it only went a little ways, and Joe Bean said, that is three tries and no gain, he will have to punt. But I must write down about my tough luck. Well, we finally got through the 18 holes, and Mr. Thomas reached down in his pocket for the money to pay me, and he generally pays for Mr. Crane too, when they play together, as Mr. Crane is just an employee in the bank and don't have much money. But this time all Mr. Thomas had was a $20 bill, so he said to Mr. Crane, I guess you will have to pay the boy, Charlie. So Charlie dug down and got the money to pay me, and he paid just what it was and not a dime over. Where if Mr. Thomas had have had the change, I would have got a $1 extra at least, and maybe I was not sore in Joe Bean too, because of course Andrews never gives you nothing, and Mr. Blake don't tip his caddy unless he wins. They are a fine bunch of tightwads, said Joe, and I said, well, Crane is all right, only he just has not got no money. He ain't all right no more than the rest of them, said Joe. Well, at least he don't cheat on his score, I said. And you know why that is, said Joe. Neither does Jack Andrews cheat on his score, but that is because they play too good. Players like Crane and Andrews that goes around an 80 or better can't cheat on their score because they make the most of the holes in around four strokes, and the four strokes includes their tee shot and a couple of putts, which everybody is right there to watch them when they make them and count them right along with them. So if they make a four and claim a three, why people would just laugh in their face and say, how did the ball get from the fairway to the green? Did it fly? But the boys that take seven and eight strokes to a hole can shave their score and you know they are shaving it. But you have to let them get away with it because you can't prove nothing. But that is one of the penalties for being a good player. You can't cheat. To hear Joe tell it pretty near everybody are born crooks, well, maybe he is right. End of chapter seven, part one, A Caddy's Diary. Recording by Madison Rutherford. Chapter 7, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Madison Rutherford. Chapter 7, A Caddy's Diary, Part 2. Wednesday, 
April 26. Today Mrs. Stone was out for the first time this year and asked me to caddy for her, and you bet I was on the job. Well, how are you, Dick, she said. She always calls me by name. She asked me what had I been doing all winter and was I glad to see her in ETC. She said she had been down south all winter and played golf pretty near every day and would I watch her and notice how much she had improved. Well, to tell the truth, she was no better than last year and won't never be no better and I guess she is just too pretty to be a golf player. But of course when she asked me did I think her game was improved, I had to reply yes indeed as I would not hurt her feelings and she laughed like my reply pleased her. She played with Mr. and Mrs. Carter, and I carried the two ladies' bags while Joe being catted for Mr. Carter. Mrs. Carter is a ugly dame with things on her face, and it must make Mr. Carter feel sore when he looks at Mrs. Stone to think he married Mrs. Carter, but I suppose they could not all marry the same one. And besides, Mrs. Stone would not be a sucker enough to marry a man like he who drinks all the time and is pretty near always stood, though Mr. Stone, who she did marry, ain't such an H of a man himself, though dirty with money. They all gave me the laugh on the third hole when Mrs. Dawn was making her second shot and the ball was in the fairway but laid kind of bad and she just ticked it and then she asked me if winter rules was in force and I said yes so we teed her ball up so as she could get a good shot at it and they gave me the laugh for saying winter rules was in force. You have got the caddy's bride, Mr. Carter said to her. But she just smiled and put her hand on my shoulder and said Dick is my pal. That is enough of a bribe to just have her touch you. And I would caddy all day for her and never ask for a cent, only to have her smile at me and call me her pal. Saturday, April 29th. Today they had the first club tournament of the year, and they have a monthly tournament every month, and today was the first one. It is a handicap tournament, and everybody plays in it, and they have prizes for low net score and low gross score and ETC. I catted for Mr. Thomas today, and will tell what happened. They played a four, and besides Mr. Thomas, we had Mr. Blake and Mr. Carter and Mr. Dunham. Mr. Dunham is the worst man player in the club, and the other men would not play with him, especially on a Saturday, only him and Mr. Blake is partners together in business. Mr. Dunham has got the highest handicap in the club, which is 50, but it would have to be 150 for him to win a prize. Mr. Blake and Mr. Carter has got a handicap of about 15 apiece, I think, and Mr. Thomas is 30. The first prize for the low net score for the day was a dozen golf balls, and the second low score a half dozen golf balls in ETC. Well, we had a great battle, and Mr. Kobe ought to have been along to write it up for some good writer. Mr. Carter and Mr. Dunham played partners against Mr. Thomas and Mr. Blake, which meant that Mr. Carter was playing Thomas and Blake's best ball, while Mr. Dunham took the honor and the first ball he hit went straight off to the right and over the fence outside of the grounds, while he'd done the same thing three times. Well, when he finally did hit one in the course, why Mr. Carter said, why not let us not count them three first shots in Mr. Dunham, as they was just practice. Like H, we won't count them, said Mr. Thomas. We must count every shot and keep our scores correct for the tournament. All right, said Mr. Carter. Well, we got down to the green, and Mr. Dunham had about 11, and Mr. Carter sunk a long putt for a par 5. Mr. Blake already had five strokes, and so did Mr. Thomas, and when Mr. Carter sunk his putt, why Mr. Thomas picked his ball up and said Carter wins the hole, and I and Blake will take sixes. Like H, you will, said Mr. Carter. This is a tournament, and we must play every hole out and keep our scores correct. So Mr. Dunham putted and went down in 13, and Mr. Blake got a six, and Mr. Thomas missed two easy putts and took a eight, and maybe he was not boiling. Well, it was still their honor, and Mr. Dunham had one of his dizzy spells on the second tee, and he missed the ball twice before he hit it, and then Mr. Carter drove the green, which is only a mid-iron shot, and then Mr. Thomas stepped up and missed the ball just like Mr. Dunham. He was wild and yelled at Mr. Dunham, no man could play golf playing with a man like you, you would spoil anybody's game. Your game was already spoiled, said Mr. Dunham. It turned sour on the first green. You would turn anybody sour, said Mr. Thomas. Well, Mr. Thomas finally took a 8 for the hole, which is a par 3, and it certainly looked bad for him winning a prize when he started out with two eights. and he and Mr. Dunham had another terrible time on number 3, and while they was messing things up, a two-some come up behind us and hollered 4, and we let them go through, though it was Mr. Clayton and Mr. Joyce, and as Joe Bean said, they was probably disappointed when we let them go through, as they are the kind that feels like the day is lost if they can't write to some committee and prefer charges. Well, Mr. Thomas got a 7 on the 3rd, and he said, well, it is no wonder I'm off my game today, as I was up half the night with my teeth. Well, said Mr. Carter, if I had your money, why on the night before a big tournament like this, I would hire somebody else to set up with my teeth. Well, I wish I could remember all that was said and done, 
But anyway, Mr. Thomas kept getting sore and sore, and we got to the seventh tee, and he had not made a decent tee shot all day. So Mr. Blake said to him, Why don't you try the wood, as you can't do no worse? By Geo, I believe I will, said Mr. Thomas, and took his driver out of the bag, which he had not used it for three years. Well, he swung, and Zowie away went the ball, pretty near eight inches distance, with the head of the club broke off clean and sailed fifty yards down the course. Well, I have got a hold on myself, so I don't never laugh out loud, and I believe the other men was scarred to laugh, or he would have killed them, so we all stood there in silence, waiting for what would happen. Well, without saying a word, he come to where I was standing and took his other four wood clubs out of the bag and took them to a tree which stands a little ways from the tea box, and one by one he swung them with all his strength against the trunk of the tree and smashed them to H and gone. All right, gentlemen, that is over, he said. Well, to cut it short, Mr. Thomas' score for the first nine was a even 60, and then we started out on the second nine, and you would not think it was the same man playing. On the first three holes, he made two fours into five and beat Mr. Carter even, and followed up with a six into five, and that is how he kept going up to the 17th hole. What has gone into you, Thomas, said Mr. Carter? Nothing, said Mr. Thomas. Only I broke my hoodoo when I broke them five wood clubs. Yes, I said to myself. And if you had broke them five wood clubs three years ago, I would not have broke my back lugging them around. Well, we come to the 18th tee, and Mr. Thomas had a 39, which gave him a 99 for 17 holes. Well, everybody drove off, and as we was following along, why Mr. Kleber came walking down the course from the clubhouse on his way to the 17th green to join some friends. And Mr. Thomas asked him what had he made, and he said he had turned in a 93, but his handicap is only a 12, so that give him a 81. That won't get me nowheres, he said, as Charlie Crane made a 75. Well, said Mr. Thomas, I can tie Crane for low net if I get a 6 on this hole. Well, it come his turn to make a second, and Zowie, he hit the ball pretty good, and they was a hook on it, and away she went into the woods on the left. The ball laid in behind a tree, so as they was only one thing to do, and that was waste a shot getting it back on the fair. So that is what Mr. Thomas done, and it took him two more to reach the green. How many have you had, Thomas? said Mr. Carter when we was all on the green. Let me see, said Mr. Thomas, and then turned to me. How many have I had, Caddy? I don't know, I said. Well, it is either four or five, said Mr. Thomas. I think it is five, said Mr. Carter. I think it is four, said Mr. Thomas, and turned to me again and said, How many have I had, Caddy? So I said four. Well, said Mr. Thomas, personally I was not sure myself, but my Caddy says four, and I guess he is right. Well, the other men looked at each other, and I and Joe Bean looked at each other, but Mr. Thomas went ahead and putted and was down in two putts. Well, he said, I certainly come to life on them last nine holes. So he turned his score in as 105, and with his handicap of 30, why, that gave him a net of 75, which was the same as Mr. Crane. So, instead of Mr. Crane getting one dozen golf balls and Mr. Thomas getting half a dozen golf balls, why, they will split the first and second prize making nine golf balls apiece. Tuesday, May 2nd. This was the first ladies day of the season, and even Joe Bean had to carry for the fair sex. We catted for a foursome, which was Miss Rennie and Mrs. Thomas against Mrs. Doan and Mrs. Carter. I guess if they had have kept their score right, the total for the four of them would have ran well over a thousand. Our course has a great many trees, and they seem to have attraction for our four ladies today, and we was in amongst the trees more than we was on the fairway. Well, said Joe Bean, they's one thing about catting for these dames, it keeps you out of the hot sun. And another time he said he felt like a boy scout studying woodcraft. These dames is always up against a stump, he said. And another time, he said that it was not fair to charge these dames regular ladies' dues in the club, as they hardly ever use the course. Well, it seems like they was a party in the village last night, and of course the ladies was talking about it. And Mrs. Stone said what a lovely dress Miss Rennie wore to the party, and Miss Rennie said she did not care for the dress herself. Well, said Mrs. Stone, if you want to get rid of it, just hand it over to me. I won't give it to you, said Miss Rennie, but I will sell it to you at half what it cost me, and it was a bargain that that only cost me a hundred dollars, and I will sell it to you for fifty dollars. I have not got fifty dollars just now to spend, said Mrs. Stone, and besides, I don't know would it fit me. Sure it would fit you, said Miss Rennie. You and I are exactly the same size and figure. I tell you what I will do with you, I will play you golf for it, and if you beat me, you can have the gown for nothing, and if I beat you, why you will give me fifty dollars for it. All right, but if I lose, you may have to wait for your money, said Mrs. Doan. So this was on the fourth hole, and they started from there to play for the dress, and they was both terrible and worse than usual on account of being nervous, as this was the biggest stakes they had either of them ever played for, though the Doans has got a barrel of money and $50 is chicken's food. 
Well, we was on the sixteenth hole, and Mrs. Doan was one up, and Miss Rennie sliced her tee shot off in the rough, and Mrs. Doan landed in some rough over on the left, so they was clear across the course from each other. Well, I and Mrs. Doan went over to her ball, and as luck would have it, it had come to rest in a kind of groove where a good player could not hardly make a good shot of it, let alone Mrs. Doan. Well, Mrs. Thomas was out in the middle of the course for once in her life, and the other two ladies was over on the right side, and Joe being with them, so they was nobody near Mrs. Doan and I. Do I have to play it from there, she said. I guess you do, was my reply. Why, Dick, have you went back on me, she said, and give me one of her looks. Well, I looked to see if the others was looking, and then I kind of gave the ball a shove with my toe, and it come out of the groove and laid where she could get a swipe at it. This was the sixteenth hole, and Mrs. Doan win it by eleven strokes to ten, and that made her two up and two to go. Miss Rennie win the seventeenth, but they both took a ten for the eighteenth, and that gave Mrs. Doan the match. Well, I won't never have a chance to see her in Miss Rennie's dress, but if I did, I ain't sure that I would like it on her. Friday, May 5th Well, I never thought we would have so much excitement in the club and so much to write down in my diary, but I guess I better get busy writing it down as here it is Friday and it was Wednesday a.m. when the excitement broke loose and I was getting ready to play around when Harry Lear, the caddy master, come running out with the paper in his hand and showed it to me on the first page. It told how Chase Crane, our club champion, had went south with $8,000, which he had stole out of Mr. Thomas Bank, and a swell-looking dame that was a stenographer in the bank had eloped with him. And they had her picture in the paper, and I will say, she is a pip. But who would have thought a nice, quiet young man like Mr. Crane was going to prove himself a gay Romeo, and especially as he was engaged to Miss Rennie, though she now says she broke their engagement a month ago. But anyway, the whole affair has certainly give everybody something to talk about. And one of the caddies, Lou Crow, busted Fat Brunner in the nose because Fat claimed to have been the last one that catted for Crane. Lou was really the last one and catted for him last Sunday, which was the last time Crane was at the club. Well, everybody was thinking how sore Mr. Thomas would be and they would better not mention the affair around him and ETC. But who would show up to play yesterday but Mr. Thomas himself? And he played with Mr. Blake and all they talked about the whole PM was Crane and what he had pulled. Well, Thomas, said Mr. Blake, I am curious to know if the thing come as a surprise to you or if you ever had a hunch that he was liable to do a thing like this. Well, Blake, said Mr. Thomas, I will admit that the whole thing come as a complete surprise to me, as Crane was almost like my son, you might say, and I was going to see that he got along all right, and that is what makes me sore, is not only that he has proved himself dishonest, but that he could be such a sucker as to give up a bright future for a sum of money like $8,000 and a doll-faced girl that can't be no good or she would not have let him do it. When you think how young he was and the career he might have had, why it certainly seems like he sold his soul pretty cheap. That is what Mr. Thomas had to say, or at least part of it, as I can't remember half of all he said. But anyway, this PM I catted for Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Stone, and that is all they talked about too. And Mrs. Thomas talked along the same lines like her husband and said she had always thought Crane was too smart a young man to pull a thing like that and ruin his whole future. He was getting $4,000 a year, said Mrs. Thomas, and everybody liked him and said he was bound to get ahead, so that is what makes it such a silly thing for him to have done, sell his soul for $8,000 in a pretty face. Yes, indeed, said Mrs. Doan. Well, all that time I was listening to Mr. Thomas and Mr. Blake and Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Doan, why, I was thinking about something which I wanted to say to them, but it would have meant me losing my job, so I kept it to myself, but I sprung it on my pal Joe Bean on the way home tonight. Joe, I said, what do these people mean when they talk about Crane selling his soul? Why, you know what they mean, said Joe. They mean that a person that does something dishonest for a bunch of money or a gal or any kind of reward, why, the person that does it is selling his soul. All right, I said, and it don't make no difference, does it, if the reward is big or little? Why no, said Joe, only the bigger it is, the less of a sucker the person is that goes after it. Well, I said, here is Mr. Thomas, who is vice president of a big bank and worth a barrel of money, and it is just a few days ago when he lied about his golf score in order so as he would win nine golf balls instead of a half a dozen. Sure, said Joe. And how about his wife, Mrs. Thomas, I said, who plays for two bits a hole and when her ball don't like it, why she picks it up and pretends to look at it to see if it is hers? and then she puts it back in a good lie where she can sock it. And how about my friend Mrs. Stone that made me move her ball out of a rut to help her beat Miss Rennie out of party dress? Well, said Joe, what of it? Well, I said, it seems to me like these people have got a lot of nerve to pan Mr. Crane and call him a sucker for doing what he done. It seems to me like $8,000 and a swell dame is a pretty fair reward compared with what some of these other people sells their soul for, and I would like to tell them about it. Well, said Joe, Go ahead and tell them, but maybe they will tell you something right back. What will they tell me? 
Well, said Joe, they might tell you this, that when Mr. Thomas asks you how many shots he has had, and you say four when you know he has had five, why, well, you are selling your soul for a one dollar tip. And when you move Mrs. Stone's ball out of a rut and give it a good lie, what are you selling your soul for? Just a smile. Oh, keep your mouth shut, I said to him. I'm going to, said Joe, and would advise you to do the same. End of chapter 7, A Caddy's Diary, part 2. Recording by Madison Rutherford. Chapter 8, part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 8. A Frame-Up. Part 1. A Stirring Romance of the Hundred Years' War. Detailing the adventures in France and Castile of a pair of well-bred weasels. The story is an example of what can be done with a stub pen. 1. I suppose you could call it a frame but it wasn't like no frame that was ever pulled before. They's been plenty where one guy was paid to lay down. This is the first I heard of where a guy had to be bribed to win. And it's the first where a bird was bribed and didn't know it. You know, they've postponed the match with Britain. Nate said at first that his boy wasn't ready yet, but the papers all kidded him. Because anybody that's seen Burke in the Kemp fight knows he's ready. So Nate had to change his story and say Burke had hurt one of his hands on Kemp's egg. And he wasn't going to take no chance boxing again till he was okay. Which mightn't be for a couple of months. Say, Kemp's head may be hard, but it ain't hard enough to hurt one of them hands of Burkey's. He could play catch with Big Bertha. No, there's another reason why Nate asked for a postponement of the Britain date. It's got to be another frame-up that may take a long while to fix. And he ain't got no plans yet. Until he's all set, he'd be a dumbbell to send Burke against a man as good as Jack Britton. The papers has printed a lot of stuff about Burke. How he ain't only been boxing a little over a year and won't be 21 till next July. And five or six bouts is all he's been in. And now look at him offered a match for the welterweight championship. And $10,000 win, lose, or draw. But if they knew Burke like some of us knows him, they could write a book. Because he certainly is Duke of the Cuckoos and the world's greatest sap. How they got him ready for the Kemp bout is a story in itself, but it won't come out till he's through with the game. So what I tell you is between you and I. It was one afternoon about a year ago. Bill Brennan was in Kid Howard's gymnasium in Shy working out, and they was a gang looking on. Howard seen one boy in the crowd that you couldn't help from noticing. He was made up for one of the hicks in way down east. He'd bought his collar in Akron, and his coat sleeves died just south of his elbow. From his pants to his vest was a toll call. He had never shaved, and his whiskers was just the right number and length to string a violin. Thinks Howard to himself, If you seen a stage group dressed like that, you'd say it was overdone. Well, it got late and the gang thinned out till finally there wasn't nobody left but Howard and this sap. So Howard asked him if he wanted to see somebody. Yes, said the kid. I want to see a man that can learn me to fight. So Howard asked him if he meant box. Box or fight, I don't care which, just so as I can learn the rules, said the hick. Did you ever box, says Howard? No says the kid, but I can learn quick, and I'm willing to pay for it. I got plenty of money. I got pretty close to $700. Howard asked him what was his name and where he come from in his business. My name's Burke, and I work on my old man's farm, he says. It's across the lake outside of Benton Harbor. We raise beaches. Has your old man got money, asked Howard. Plenty, says the kid. 
Well, said Howard, if you work on a farm, you're getting plenty of exercise, and if your old man's rich, you ain't after the sugar. So what's the idea of going into this game? I don't want to go in no game, he says. I just want to learn good enough so I can win this one match, and then I'm through. What one match, says Howard? With Charlie Porter, says Burke. Well, of course you've heard of Charlie Porter. He's a Benton Harbor boy, too. He'd fought Lewis twice and Britain once, and he'd give them both a sweet battle. He was considered about fourth or fifth best amongst the welters. So it struck Howard funny that this green rube that hadn't never boxed should think he could take a few lessons and then be good enough to beat a boy like Porter. You're an ambitious kid, he says to him. But if I was you, I'd take my 700 men and invest it some other way. Porter's had 40 fights, and that's what counts. You could take all the lessons in the world, and he'd make a monkey out of you. Unless you're a boy wonder or something. But even if you are, you couldn't get no match with Porter till you'd proved it. And that means you'd have to beat some other good boys first. So Burke said, All I come to Chicago for is to take some boxing lessons. They told me you was the man to come and see. If I'm willing to pay the money, it shouldn't ought to make no difference to you if I get a match with Porter or not, or if I lick him or not. That's right, said Howard. Only I ain't no burglar or no con man. I'm in this business for money, but I don't want to take nobody's money without they get what they think they're paying for. And if you had seven million smackers, I couldn't guarantee to make you a good boxer. Not good enough to land you a match with Porter. I ain't asking you to land no match, says Burke. I'll tend to that part. He'll fight me as soon as I think I'm ready. If he don't, I'll run him out of Michigan. He wouldn't dast stay round if everybody was saying I had him scared. And that's what they'd say if he wouldn't fight me. Why would they, says Howard. He's in the game for money, too. And he couldn't get no money for a bout with a guy like you that nobody ever heard of. They wouldn't no club match you up. I won't have no trouble getting matched up, says Burke. Fitzsimmons will put us on right there in Benton Harbor. The town's nuts over Porter, and they'll pay to see him any time. And whatever purse they offer is all his. I'll fight him for nothing. Oh, says Howard, that makes it different. You're sore at him. No, says the hick, I'm not sore at him. You just don't like him, says Howard. I don't know if I like him or not, said Burke. I don't even know him. But for some reason you want to give him a trimming, says Howard. Well, listen, boy, I understand there's no capital punishment in your state, so it looks to me like you'd run less risk of getting killed if you'd sneak in Porter's house some night while he's asleep and kiss him on the brow with a meat axe. Burke didn't crack a smile. That wouldn't get me nowheres, he said. There's a reason I got to box him. If you can learn me all right. If not, I'll go somewheres else. So Howard made a date for him to come back the next day. Two. Well, when the kids stripped for action, Howard's eyes popped out. With them comic clothes on, he'd looked awkward. He was a picture with them off. Howard says he felt like inviting the best sculptures in Shy to come and take a look. I was going to box with him myself, says Howard, but not after I seen them shoulder muscles. I figured I didn't have enough insurance to justify me putting on the gloves with this bird. So I made Joe Rivers take him. Well, they could see in a minute that the rube was a born boxer. He was fast as a streak, and in one lesson he learned more than most boys picks up in a month. They just showed him how to stand, and the rest seemed to come natural. In a little while, Joe, with all his experience, was having trouble to land, whereas Berkey was hitting Joe as often as he felt like. Only he didn't put no zip in his punches. He pulled them all. Cut loose once, says Howard. Let's see if you can knock him down. Oh, no, said Berkey. This ain't in earnest. Rivers looked just as well satisfied. But Howard says, 
You got to be in earnest even when you're just working out. There's lots of boys as strong as you that don't know how to get their strength into their punch. That's a thing that's got to be learnt, and I can't learn you if I can't see you wallop. No, says Burke, I ain't going to hurt nobody for nothing. And all Howard's coaxing done no good. He wouldn't cut loose. But at the end of the six weeks, he stuck round Howard's. He was one of the sweetest boxers you ever seen, and Howard thought so well of him that he tried to sign him up. Let me handle you, Berkey, he says. I'll get you on in Milwaukee, and I'll take you down east and make you some money. And if you're handled right, there's no reason why you shouldn't be welterweight champion someday. I don't want to be welterweight champion, said Burke. I just want to be champion of Charlie Porter. And when I beat him, I'm through. All right, says Howard. You know what you want. But let me tell you one thing. You won't beat Porter or no one else if you just pet them. You've got a hit. The kid smiled. I'll hit when it's time, he says. So that was the last Howard heard of him till pretty near a month later when he picked up a paper and read where young Burke, a farmer boy living outside of Benton Harbor, had stopped Charlie Porter, an aspirant for the welterweight title, in one round. Three. About a month more went by before Burke showed up in Shy again and called on Nate. As soon as he mentioned his name and where he was from, Nate was interested, because Howard had told him about his experience with the kid. But Berkey wasn't made up no more like Howard had described him. He was wearing the best suit of clothes twenty dollars could buy. I went to see Howard, he says, but he's out of town, so I come to you. I want to go in the fight game. I understood from Howard, says Nate, that you was going to quit after that one bout. I thought I was, says Berkey, but it's different now. You see, I and my old man has busted up, so I got to make a living. What was the bust up over, asked Nate. Didn't he like you boxing? He didn't care nothing about that, says the kid. But they was a gal he wanted I should marry, and I gave her the air, so he done the same to me. Why did you quit the gal, asked Nate. I figured I could do better, he says. She's just a gal round home there, and why should I marry her? I can pretty near pick who I want to marry. Everybody can pick who they want to marry, says Nate. Yes, but who I pick I can pretty near have, says the kid. I thought I was stuck on this gal, but I found I wasn't. I had seen hardly any other gals, and she was always around. So I thought she was about the only gal in the world. I know better now. But I did like her, and my old man liked her, and kept after me to ask her. So I asked her, and she told me she was stuck on somebody else. So I asked her who it was, and she said Charlie Porter. She didn't know him, but she'd seen him on the street a lot of times, and he'd smiled at her. She thought he was handsome and made a hero out of him. He was the best fighter in the world to her mind. So I said I could beat him, and she laughed at me. She says, you might beat him plowing. So I said, I can beat him boxing. So she says, all right, you do it, and I'll like you better than him. So I came up here and took a few lessons and knocked him cockeyed. When she seen me afterwards, she throwed her arms around my neck and said I was the best man in the world, and we got engaged. But during the time I was up here and shy learning to box, I learned to dance, too, and I bought me these good clothes. So after I trimmed Porter, I got to going over to St. Joe to the pavilion nights, and I seen all the gals was nuts over me. So I said to myself, What's the idea of tying up to this rube gal when you can marry somebody that is somebody? Maybe one of these rich Chicago society dames. So I gave this hick the air and my old man throwed me out of the house. Well, Nate's handled a lot of boxers and never seen one yet that despised himself. But after he'd listened to this bird a while, he began to think that all the rest of them was lilies of the valley. 
Which Chicago Society gal have you picked out, he says to lead him on. I don't know yet, says Berkey. Some of them at the dances in St. Joe look good, but I want to see them all before I tie myself up. If you've ever been to St. Joe, you know the Chicago Society gals that attends them dances. If you want to see one of them in the middle of the week, go up to the draperies and ask for men. You got the right dope, Nate says. You'd be a sucker to make a choice till you'd looked over the whole field. And in the meanwhile, I'll try to get you fixed up with a couple of matches so as you can grab some spending money. But Burke was still thinking of the dames. I read a great story the other day, he says. It was a young fellow that was a boxer. And one night he was walking along the street and he heard a gal scream. She was up on the porch of a big house and there was a dude there trying to make love to her. So she didn't like him. And that's why she screamed. So this young fellow went in and grabbed the dude and knocked him for a long trip. So the gal got stuck on this young fella, the boxer, and married him. And she turned out to be a millionaire. A great story, said Nate. I certainly wish I could have read it. But suppose he'd married her and then found out that her old man made automobiles and owed everybody. A young fella can't be too careful who he lets marry him. And if I was you, I'd go slow. In the first place, most of the gals with the real class and the big money lives in New York. So why not wait till you win a couple of bouts in Milwaukee or somewheres so as I can get you dated up in the big town? Then you can walk up and down 8th Avenue and help yourself to the cream. This was to stall him along so he'd forget the skirts for a while and tend to business. Nate made him work out every day and box with some of the boys. But he was just as shy of a punch as when Howard had him. Cut loose and slug, Nate told him. What for, he says. To show me if you've got a haymaker, says Nate. Ask Porter if I have, said the kid. Finally, Nate got him matched with Red Harris in a semi-wind-up at Milwaukee. Harris can wallop, but he's slow. Well, Berkey made him look like he was handcuffed. Red never laid a glove on him the whole bout while Nate's boy played him like a piano. But it was soft music, and when it was over, neither of them had a mark. The crowd liked Burke at first on account of his speed. But they razzed him the last few rounds because it looked like he wasn't trying. The papers couldn't do nothing but give him the best of it but said he wouldn't never get nowhere till he learned to punch. Nate had begged him all through to tear in and end it, but he might as well have tried to argue with Central. Well, Fitzsimmons was putting on a show over to Benton Harbor, and he wired Nate and asked him if he'd bring Burke there for a wind-up with a Grand Rapids boy named Hap Stein. This kid had met some of the best boys round Michigan and beat them all, and of course Burke could draw good in his hometown, especially after what he'd done to Porter. So Nate took Berkey over there, and Fitz asked Nate how the kid was coming, and Nate told him, one of the sweetest boxers I ever seen. But he ain't showed enough of a wallop to annoy a soap bubble. It's a funny thing, said Fitz, because he hit Porter just once and broke his jaw. And Charlie's jaw ain't glass, neither. I know a punch when I see one, and I doubt if Dempsey could hit harder than this bird plugged this baby. Well, says Nate, I wished we had the prescription. He made a monkey out of Harris at Milwaukee, but he wouldn't even slap him hard. And the boys he works out with, I've had them rough him so's he'd get mad, but it didn't do no good. I don't suppose so, says Fitz, because he wasn't sore at Porter. Charlie didn't even know him. But he had a reason to show Porter up, said Nate, and he told Fitz about the Rube gal. That's news to me, said Fitz. Maybe he'll only fight when there's a dame for a prize. Why don't you hire some chorus doll to vamp him and have her tell him she's his as soon as he's knocked all the other welters for a corpse? You don't know this bird, said Nate. Course gals would be beneath his notice. He wants a millionaire society bell, and I'd have a fat chance of getting one of them to play the part. Well, the bout with Stein was a farce. 
Berkey was so fast that Hap thought they'd ganged on him. But nothing Nate could say or do had any effect. He couldn't make the kid cut loose and punch. 4. When they'd be back in shy a couple of months and Burke had one more fight in Milwaukee, he made a monkey out of Jimmy Mason. Well, he began fretting and wanted to know how soon Nate was going to take him east. As soon as I can get you matched, said Nate. But if I do date you up down there, you'll have to cut out the cuddling and really fight, or they won't want you a second time. Maybe I'll be different down there, said Berkey. So along late in the fall, Nate got him matched with Battling Ego in Boston. Now here's your chance, Nate told him. I got Rickard's promise that if you trim Ego, he'll put you on in New York with Willie Kemp. And the man that beats Willie Kemp will get a whack at Britain and the big money. All Burke said was, How's Boston for gals? Any class to them? Not enough for you, says Nate. You'd be throwing yourself away. There's no doubt but that you could go down to Scully Square or Revere Beach and take your pick. But you'd be a sucker to do it. New York's the place. And suppose you get tied up to some Boston countess and then went to New York and went a couple of big bouts and got invited round to some of them big mansions on Mott Street or the Tenderloin. And next thing you know, you'd probably meet a dozen gals that never even heard of Boston. Then you'd wished you'd have been more careful and not financed yourself to no bean shooter. You read about the ego bout? I seen it. When they was all in the ring beforehand, Nate said to Ego, he says, Well, Bat, we've decided to let you stay three rounds. That'll be enough to give you a boxing lesson. But in the fourth round, you're going to hear music that'll rock you to sleep. Nate had heard that the battler wasn't no Lionheart, and this kind of gab fretted him. I'll rock him to sleep myself, he said, but his teeth was shimmy. Burke was just the same like in his other bouts. He wrote his name and address all over Ego's pan and convinced the battler that any time he wanted, he could knock him for a row of stumps. That went on for three rounds with Nate, as usual, begging the kid to put over a haymaker and Burke paying no attention. So when the bell rung for the fourth, Nate hollered, Good night, Bat! And Ego thought sure he meant business. And he wasn't named after Nelson. So the first time Burke hit him in this round, he folded up like a bass singer's chin and flopped on the floor yelling foul. Well, we all seen the blow. It landed just under the green spot where he parks his collar button. And besides that, they wasn't no force to it. But Ego was through for the evening and the kid had win another soft one. Personally, I'd have rather took 50 socks on the jaw than the razzing the crowd gave Bat. Well, Nate was going to New York and stay a while, and he wanted to send Burke back to Shy to wait till they'd chose a date for the fight with Kemp. But Berkey said no. He could lay around New York as easy as Chicago, and if Nate wouldn't take him there, he was through. He says, Here I am, a coming champion, and what does it get me? I ain't having no fun. I want to meet some gals and dance with them and kid them. All right, come along, says Nate. But I wished you'd remember one thing. When you do meet them swell East Side Janes, don't treat them like toys. They've got feelings as well as riches and wealth, and I would rather see Kemp or Britain knock you lopsided than see you win fame and leave a trail of broken hearts. I'm no flirt, says Berkey. I can't help what they feel towards me, but I won't lead them on, not unless I'm serious myself. Now you're talking like a man, says Nate. So they come to New York and stopped at the Spencer. Nate had a lot of business to tend to and guys to see, and he didn't want this rube chasing around with him all the while, so he turned him over to Jack Grace, the old lightweight. You know Jack, or at least you've heard of him. He'd kid Thomas A. Edison. Nate had tipped off Jack about Berkey, and the second day they was in the big town, Jack took the boy for a walk. Every time they passed a car with a good-looking gal in it, Burke would ask, Who's that? And Jack pretended like he knew them all. 
That's Gwendolyn Weasel, he'd say. Her old man owns part of the Grand Central Station, the lower level. And that one's Mildred Whiffletree, a niece of Bud Fisher, the ukulele king. And there's Honey Hive. She's a granddaughter of Old Man Bumble, the bee man. They got a big country place on Ellis Island. Where could a man meet these gals, asked Berkey. Nowhere's only at their home, said Jack. And there's no chance of you getting invited round yet for a while. Nobody knows who you are. But wait till you've hung one on this Kemp guy's chin, and I bet you'll have more invitations than a roach catcher. Well, Nate landed the Kemp match sooner than he expected. Rickard said he'd put Burke on with Willie for the wind-up three weeks from then, and he'd guarantee the winner a match with Britain. Nate had got what he was after, but he was worried sick. I know he can beat Kemp if he fights, he says, but I never yet been able to make him fight. And if he just babies along like he done in these other bouts, one of these New York referees is liable to say he ain't trying and stop the bout. Or if it does go to the limit, Kemp will get the decision because he'll punch harder. And Kemp will hit Burke, too. He's firing away the best boy my kid's ever been against. Too good to get showed up even by as fast and clever a boxer as Berkey. Our only chance is to make this little farmer slug, tear in there and sock him like he did Porter. But how we're going to do it is more than I know. End of Chapter 8, A Frame-Up, Part 1. Chapter 8, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 8. A Frame-Up. Part 2. 5. Jack Grace is the one that deserves the credit. He went to work the night of Miss Morgan's big show when the receipts was turned over to devastated France. Nate had to buy four tickets, and I and Jack and Berkey went with him. Well, as you know, our best people was there that night. The old garden was full of the folks that generally goes there to the horse show, not to boxing bouts. A soup and fish was everywheres, and gals that would knock your eye out dressed pretty near as warm as the fighters themselves. We couldn't keep Burke in his seat. He was scared that he wouldn't see all the Janes, and just as scared that they wouldn't all see him. The guys behind him was yelling murder, and the ushers bawled him out a dozen times. Then, all of a sudden, his eyes jumped right out of his head, and he gave a gasp and flopped down in his chair. The three of us looked where he was looking. And no wonder he wilted. What a gal! She was with a middle-aged man, probably her dad, and she sat in the road just ahead of us and across the aisle. I guess it was the first time she'd ever been to this kind of a party, and she was all flushed up with excitement. But she'd have been pretty enough without that. There she is, says Burke. There's the gal I want. Who don't, says Nate. Who is she, Burke asked, and Nate was going to tell him he didn't know. But Jack Grace cut in. It's Esther Fester, he said. That's her father with her, Lester Fester. He's the second richest man in New York. They claim he made three or four billion during the war selling waffle irons to Belgium. And she's his only kid. Every young millionaire in town has proposed to her, but she won't have nothing to do with them. Calls them all loafers. She says the man she marries will have to be a champion of something, whether it's football or boxing or Helma. She don't care what, just so he's better in one line than anybody else. She's quite a boxing fan, says Nate. I've seen her here several times before. She maybe wants to look all the boys over and see which one she likes the best. 
I understand she's a great admirer of Willie Kemp, says Jack. She's always here when he boxes, and she probably come tonight expecting to see him in the audience. Maybe he'll be introduced before the main bout, and if he is, we'll watch her close and see if she's interested. Why can't I get introduced, asked Burke. You can, said Nate. Wait till they're getting ready for the wind-up, and then climb in the ring and tell Joe Humphreys who you are. Well, he couldn't hardly wait till the preliminaries was over so as he could get up there and have her see him. And when he bowed, it was right at her. Young Burke, the Michigan Flash, says Humphreys. He is matched to box Willie Kemp in this ring two weeks from Friday night. The winner will meet Jack Britton for the welterweight title. Coming back to his seat, Berkey had to pass the gal. He smiled right in her face, and she smiled back. I guess it was all she could do to keep from laughing. I don't suppose there's been more than three or four fights better than that Leonard Mitchell scrap. It was certainly the best I ever seen, but I don't believe Burke knew they was fighting. When it was over and the gang started out, he would have overtook the gal and spoke to her only for Nate holding him. It'd make her sore and spoil everything, said Nate. How could it make her sore, said Burke. Didn't she smile at me? Well, it'd make her old man sore, says Nate. What could he do, says Berkey? If he looked cross-eyed at me, I'd bust him. That'd be a sweet way to start a courtship, said Jack. Even New York gals ain't so far ahead of the times that they fall in love with every handsome young bud that introduces himself to their father with a smash in the jaw. But I just want her phone number, says the kid. You can get it at the hotel, says Jack. The phone company got out a book three or four years ago that gives the names of a few of their rich subscribers and what their number used to be. And if you call it up, they'll tell you what it's been changed to. So as soon as we was back at the Spencer, Berkey run for the book, and he couldn't find no Lester Fester. I didn't think it'd be in there, says Jack. There are very few New York millionaires has their number in the phone book. If they did, their wives would bother them to death calling up. But they must be some way to locate them, said the kid. Somebody must know where they stay. A man as rich as him must have a big mansion somewheres and you got to find out where it's at. If you don't find out for me tomorrow, why, I'm through. I won't box Kemp or no one else. And they knew he was cuckoo enough to mean it. But Jack Grace had his plans made already. I'll locate them tomorrow, he said. That is, unless you hear from the gal herself. But she don't know where I'm staying, says Burke. She might maybe call up Rickard and find out, says Jack. So the kid went to bed, and Nate and Jack set up and talked it over. It looks like we got him, said Jack. If we can make him think him and Kemp as rivals, he'll fight. But that gal can't be framed, says Nate. I don't know who she is, but she ain't the kind we could get any help from. We don't need her help, says Jack. He'll get a special delivery tomorrow afternoon with her name signed to it. That is what he thinks is her name. I'll dope out the letter yet tonight. If necessary, he'll get a letter every day till the day of the bout. And then what, says Nate? Why nothing, says Jack. What do you care if it does the work? It doesn't seem right, said Nate. I don't want to break the kid's heart. You got as much chance of breaking his head, says Jack. What about the gal in Benton Harbor that he was so stuck on and got over it in a day? But as far as that's concerned, we don't have to kill this gal off when we're through with Kemp. We can keep her going till he meets Britain. We'll have her tell him first that he's got to trim Kemp. And if that works, we'll send her to Europe or somewhere, leaving him a farewell note that she's been called away. But she'll be back in time to see him win the title. He's a sap, said Nate. But I doubt if he's dumbbell enough to swallow this. You don't appreciate him, said Jack. Where him and the fair sex is concerned, there's something so raw that he won't eat it up. But suppose he don't. You ain't got nothing to lose. Just him, that's all, says Nate. Well, he's no loss if he won't fight, said Jack. 
and this may be the way to make him. 6. Burke had started training at Daly's. When he got back from there the next afternoon, there was a special delivery waiting for him. It said, Dear Mr. Burke, You will probably be surprised getting a letter from one who you have never met. But still, I suppose you get many letters from silly girls of my sex that has seen you and admires you. Hope you won't think bad of me writing to you, but am a girl that sets on their impulse and sometimes am sorry afterwards that I'd done so and wished I was not so silly. But you know how girls are, and especially in regards to affairs of the heart. Well, Mr. Burke, you don't know me, but I was to the garden last night with my daddy and sat right near you and noticed you when I first come in but didn't dast look at you and didn't know who you was till you was introduced from the ring. And then when you was returning to your seat, I thought you smiled at me and I smiled back. Oh, Mr. Burke, was it me you was smiling at? If not, I will feel very foolish for smiling at you and hope you won't think the worst of me for doing so. Well, anyway, it's too late to mend. And this a.m. I had my secretary get where you are staying from Mr. Rickard, and I'm writing you this letter, and suppose you will say it's just another fool girl writing mash notes, but I flatter myself that I am a little higher class than most girls, as I am a society girl and don't write these kind of letters as a rule. So please don't think I am a fool and tear this up. I'm just a girl that sometimes lets their feelings run away with them. I'm going to make Pa take me to see the bout between you and Willie Kemp, but I'm afraid you are going to be beaten that night, Mr. Burke, as have seen Mr. Kemp fight and believe he is going to be the champion. I admire him very much, and up to last night admired him more than any other man, but now I am not so sure. There I am afraid I have been too bold, and you will think I am a perfect fool. Well, Mr. Burke will not take up no more of your time, though I don't suppose you have read this far, but hope you don't think I am a fool, but know you do. Pa don't approve of me writing to men who I am not engaged, and would be very angry was he to find out I had wrote to you, so can't let you answer this letter or call me up for fear he would find it out and be very angry. But maybe we'll write you again and certainly we'll see you fight Mr. Kemp. And if you see me that night, please smile at me again, so will not think you consider me a fool. But maybe you will not feel like smiling after you have boxed Mr. Kemp, as I think he is a wonder. Well, Mr. Burke, goodbye for this time, and please don't think I am a fool. Your would-be friend, Esther Fester. Well, Jack Grace had guessed right. Berkey swallowed it whole. He began reading it down in the lobby, but when he looked back and seen the name signed to it, he took it up to the room to finish it. And if he read it once, he read it twenty times and looked sillier every time he read it. He surprised us one way, though. We was expecting he would show it to everybody, but he kept it to himself. Of course, we'd read it before it got to him. Jack had wrote it and had one of the phone gals copy it off. Nate asked the kid at supper how he felt. Great, he says. You want to keep working to improve your win, says Nate. This is your first 15-round bout, and you may get tired. I won't have time to get tired, he says. I'll knock him dead in a round. It was the first time he'd ever made a speech like that. Looks like you was right, says Nate to Jack afterwards. He's eat it up. The only thing now is to be sure and not overplay it. Just give him a couple more short notes between now and the bout. What shall I say in them, says Jack. You don't need my advice, says Nate. I think you wrote that one from memory. You must have got a few mash notes yourself. No, says Jack. All the time I was boxing, I only got letters from one gal, and she always said the same thing. If you're a man, you'll pay me back that $8.60 you stole. Well, Burke pestered the clerks to death, asking if they was sure no mail had come for him, 
and he went for the phone every time it rung and was scared to go out for fear a call would come while he wasn't there. Finally, it got so that Nate couldn't hardly drag him to Daly's for his workout, and they seen they'd have to spill another note or he'd worry himself out of shape. The second one was short and said, Dear Mr. Burke, It has been all as I could do to keep from writing you before this, but was afraid if I wrote too often you would think I was a fool. Well, Mr. Burke, it's only five days now till you're bowed with Mr. Kemp, and suppose you are excited. I know I am and can't hardly wait for the big event, though to be perfectly honest, am in a funny position as I don't know if I want you or he to win. You see, I am an admirer of the both of you. Suppose you will say to yourself, I must be a funny girl to not know her own mind. But you see, I have admired Mr. Kemp a long time and only seen you the other night for the first time, so don't know which I like best. Guess I will let you two decide the question for me, and may the best man win. Pa is going to take me to the fight and only hope I will not faint or something with excitement. Suppose you will think me a fool for feeling this way in regards to two parties who I have never met. But as I told you before, am a girl that always lets their feelings get the best of them, though sometimes am sorry when it is too late. Hope you won't make me sorry, Mr. Burke. That is, if you win. I'm afraid for your sake, however, that you are doomed with defeat. As Mr. Kemp has a punch and you are just a boxer that can't hit hard. Well, Mr. Burke... Must say ta-ta for this time, as I'm going to a toddle party at the Ritz. Yours, Esther. And the morning of the big day, he got this one. Dear Mr. Burke, Just a line to let you know I'm thinking of you, and if you best Mr. Kemp, we'll call you up and see if we can't meet somewheres and have a dance. Or maybe you don't care for la danse but we can have a little chat if you don't think me too much a fool. Well, Mr. Burke, I won't bother you when you must be already worried and nervous over the bout and will just say that I will be at the garden and will see you even if you don't see me and wish I could tell you where I will sit, but I don't know. Well, Mr. Burke, good luck and may the best man win. Esther. On the way down from the hotel that night, Berkey asked Jack and I if we'd bet on him. We told him no. So he says, If you want to make some easy money, bet some of these wisecrackers that I'll stab this burden around. I'll slap him dead. 7. So I and Jack did get down a couple of bets, 50 apiece. We bet the kid would win by a knockout, and we got 3 to 1. The smart guys had looked over his record and didn't see how he could stop Kemp. But when they got in the ring, I wished for a minute I hadn't bet. Instead of paying any attention to what was coming off, Berkey was looking all over the house trying to locate the little peach. I was scared he'd still be doing it yet when the bout started, and Kemp had sock him before he got down to business. But Jack Gray seen the danger leaned over and whispered to the kid, You remember that fester gal? She's up in a box with her old man. Where at? asked Burke, all excited. It's pretty dark, says Jack, but I'll try and point her out between rounds. As you know, they wasn't no between rounds. In the first two minutes, Kemp made five trips to the floor, and he liked it so well the last time that he decided to sleep there. And in the excitement, Jack pretended he'd lost sight of the gal. 8. Berkey stayed in the room all the next day waiting for the phone call. The papers had went nuts over him and said he was the Benny Leonard of the Welters, and that it was just a question of the date when the title would change hands. But for all the effect it had on Burke, they might as well have said he'd opened a bird store. Meanwhile, Nate and Jack Grace talked it over and decided to go through with Jack's scheme. Keep Esther alive till the Britain bout, and send her to Europe, where she wouldn't be so much trouble. 
So late in the evening, while Berkey was still waiting for his call, a special delivery come for him that said, Dear Mr. Burke, have bad news, or at least hope you will agree with me and think it is bad. By the time you receive this note, we'll be on the old pond with Pa, bound for Europe. He got a cable this a.m. calling him to the other side and insisted on me going along. So we hustled round and got rooms on the ship that sails this p.m. I cried when he said I would have to go and hope you feel as bad as I do. But it's only for a short time and we'll be back in time to see you beat Britain and win the title. After that, well, Mr. Burke, I won't say no more. You was wonderful last night and I'm proud of you. Wish I could tell you in person how much I admire you, but we'll do that later on. We'll drop you a note just the minute we get back. In the meantime, don't forget one who is proud of you and wished I could meet my coming champion, Esther. Well, it was a blow to the kid, but it would have worked out all right only for the toughest kind of break. Nate had to hurry back to Shy, but before he left, he seen Rickard and closed for the Britain bout. Burke's end was to be $10,000. So the second day after the Kemp bout, they was taking the century home, and I and Jack Grace was over to see them off. They just shook hands and was starting through the gate when Burke seen her, the gal he'd went wild over at Miss Morgan's show. She was saying goodbye to another pip. Wait, says Berkey, and before Nate could stop him, he'd grab the gal by the arm. Esther, he says, Miss Fester, you didn't go after all. The poor gal was speechless. Don't you know me, said the kid. I'm Burke, the boy that beat Kemp, the boy you've been writing to. She jerked her arm loose and found her tongue. I'm not interested in who you are, she said. I don't know you, and I don't believe I want to. By this time, Nate had him. Come on, boy, he said. You've made a mistake. And he dragged him through the gate, while the crowd stared goggle-eyed. Well, says our gal to her chum, you're going to have a thrill, a trip with a crazy man. Burke was numb, Nate tells me, till the train was way out of New York. Then he said, Maybe she didn't recognize me, or maybe she just didn't want her friend to know. That was probably it, says Nate. Why did she lie to me and say she was going to Europe, says the kid. After a while, he got up from his seat. Her friend's on this train, he said. I'm going to find her and ask her something. Nate tried to coax him out of it, but he wouldn't listen. So Nate went with him to see that he didn't get in no trouble. They found the gal's pal a couple of cars back. The kid stopped and said, I beg your pardon, lady, but I want to ask you just one question. That gal that's seen you off, is her name Esther Fester? The Jane laughed and says, I'm afraid it's nothing as poetical as that. Her name is plain Mary Holt. Without another word, Burke followed Nate back to their own sleeper. He didn't open his clam again till they hit Albany. Then he made some remark about wanting some fresh air and got off the train. That's the last Nate seen of him till the other day when he showed up in shy after money. So you see why the Britain show had to be postponed? There's no plot for it. End of Chapter 8 A Frame-Up Part 2 Chapter 9, Part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ben Prince, San Francisco, California Chapter 9, Harmony, Part 1 Even a baseball writer must sometimes work. Regretfully, I yielded my seat in the PG, walked past the section where Art Graham, Bill Cole, Lefty Parks, and Young Waldron were giving expert tonsorial treatment to Sweet Adeline, 
and flopped down beside Ryan, the manager. Well, Cap, I said, we're due in Springfield in a little over an hour, and I haven't written a line. Don't let me stop you, said Ryan. Well, I want you to start me, I said. Lord, said Ryan, you oughtn't to have any trouble grinding out stuff these days with the club in first place and young Waldron gone crazy. He's worth a story any day. That's the trouble, said I. He's been worked so much that there's nothing more to say about him. Everybody in the country knows that he's hidden 420, that he's made nine home runs, 12 triples and 20-some doubles, that he's stolen 25 bases, and that he can play the piano and sing like Caruso. They've run his picture oftener than Billy Sunday and Mary Pickford put together. Of course, you might come through with how you got him. Oh, that's the mystery, said Ryan. So I've heard you say, I retorted, but it wouldn't be a mystery if you'd let me print it. Well, said Ryan, if you're really hard up, I suppose I might as well come through. Only, there's really no mystery at all about it. It's just what I consider the most remarkable piece of scouting ever done. I've been making a mystery of it just to have a little fun with Dick Hodges. You know, he's got the Jackson Club, and he's still so sore about my stealing Walter, and he'll hardly speak to me. I'll give you the dope if you want it, though it's a boost for Art Graham, not me. There's lots of people think the reason I've kept the thing a secret is because I'm modest. They give me credit for having found Walter myself. But Graham is the bird that deserves the credit, and I'll admit that he almost had to get down on his knees to make me take his tip. Yes, sir, Art Graham was the scout, and now he's sitting on the bench, and the boy he recommended has got his place. Well, that sounds pretty good, I said. And how did Graham get wise? I'm going to tell you. You're in a hurry, so I'll make it snappy. You weren't with us last fall, were you? Well, we had a day off in Detroit, along late in the season. Graham's got relatives in Jackson, so he asked me if he could spend the day there. I told him he could, and asked him to keep his eyes peeled for good young pitchers if he happened to go to the ball game. So he went to Jackson, and the next morning he came back all excited. I asked him if he'd found me a pitcher, and he said he hadn't, but he'd seen the best natural hitter he'd ever looked at, a kid named Waldron. Well, I said, you're the last one that ought to be recommending outfielders. If there's one good enough to hold a regular job, it might be your job he'd get. But Art said that that didn't make any difference to him. He was looking out for the good of the club. Well, I didn't see my way clear to asking the old man to dig up good money for an outfielder nobody had ever heard of when we were pretty well stocked with him. So I tried to stall Art, but he kept after me and kept after me till I agreed to stick in a draft for the kid just to keep Art quiet. So the draft went in and we got him. Then, as you know, Hodges tried to get him back, and that made me suspicious enough to hold on to him. Hodges finally came over to see me and wanted to know who'd tipped me to Waldron. That's where the mystery stuff started, because I saw that Hodges was all heated up and wanted to kid him along. So I told him we had some mighty good scouts working for us, and he said he knew our regular scouts and they couldn't tell a ball player from a torn ligament. Then he offered me fifty bucks if I'd tell him the truth, and I just laughed at him. I said, a fella happened to be in Jackson one day and saw him work. But I won't tell you who the fellow was, because you're too anxious to know. Then he insisted on knowing what day the scout had been in Jackson. I said I'd tell him that if he'd tell me why he was so blame curious. So he gave me his end of it. It seems his brother, up in Ludington, had seen this kid play ball in the lots and had signed him right up for Hodges and taken him to Jackson. And of course, Hodges knew he had a world beater the minute he saw him. But he also knew he wasn't going to be able to keep him in Jackson, and naturally he began to figure out how he could get the most money for him. It was already August when the boy landed in Jackson, so there wasn't much chance of getting a big price last season. He decided to teach the kid what he didn't know about baseball and to keep him undercover till this year. Then everybody would be touting him and there'd be plenty of competition. Hodges could sell to the highest bidder. He had Waldron out practicing every day, but wouldn't let him play in a game, and every player on the Jackson Club had promised to keep the secret till this year. So Hodges wanted to find out from me which one of his players had broken the promise. Then I asked him if he was perfectly sure that Waldron hadn't played in a game, and he said he had gone in to hit for somebody just once. I asked him what date that was, and he told me it was the day Art had been in Jackson. So I said, there's your mystery solved. That's the day my scout saw him, and you'll have to give the scout a little credit for picking a star after seeing him make one base hit. Then Hodges said, that makes it all the more a mystery, because in the first place he batted under a fake name, and in the second place he didn't make a base hit. He popped out. That's about all there is to it. You can ask Art how he picked the kid out for a star from seeing him pop out once. I've asked him myself, and he's told me that he liked the way Waldron swung. Personally, I believe one of those Jackson boys got to Gabby, but Art swears not. That is a story, I said gratefully. 
An old outfielder who must know he's slipping recommends a busher after seeing him pop out once, and the busher jumps right in and gets his job. I looked down the aisle toward the songbirds, Art Graham, now a bench warmer, and young Waldron, whom he had touted and who was the cause of his being sent to the bench, were harmonizing at the tops of their strong and not too pleasant voices. And probably the strangest part of the story, I added, is that Art doesn't seem to regret it. He and the kid appear to be the best of friends. Anybody who can sing is Art's friend, said Ryan. I left him and went back to my seat to tear off my seven hundred words before we reached Springfield. I considered for a moment the advisability of asking Graham for an explanation of his wonderful bit of scouting, but decided to save that part of it for another day. I was in a hurry, and, besides, Waldron was just teaching them a new wallop, and it would have been folly for me to interrupt. "'It's on the word you,' Waldron was saying. "'I come down a tone, Lefty goes up half a tone, and Bill comes up two tones. Art just sings it like always. Now try her again,' I heard him direct the songbirds. They tried her again, making a worse noise than ever. I only know I love you, love me and the world, the world is mine, the world is mine. No, said Waldron, Lefty missed it. If you fellas knew music, I could teach it to you with the piano when we get to Boston. On the word love, in the next to the last line, we hit a regular F chord. Bill's singing the low F in the bass, and Lefty's hitting middle C in the baritone, and Art's on high F, and I'm up to A. Then, on the word U, I come down to G, and Art hits E, and Lefty goes up half a tone to C sharp, and Cole comes up from F to A in the bass. That makes a good wallop. It's the change from the F chord to the A chord. Now, let's try her again, Waldron urged. They tried her again. I only know I love you. No, no, said young Waldron. Art and I were all right, but Bill came up too far, and Lefty never moved off that C. Half a tone up, Lefty. Now try her again. We were an hour late into Springfield, and it was past six o'clock when we pulled out. I had filed my stuff, and when I came back in the car, the concert was over for the time, and Art Graham was sitting alone. Where are your pals? I asked. Gone to the diner, he replied. Aren't you going to eat? No, he said. I'm saving up for the steamed clams. I took the seat beside him. I sent in a story about you, I said. Am I fired? he asked. No, nothing like that. Well, he said, you must be hard up when you can't find nothing better to write about than an old has-been. Cap just told me who it was that found Waldron, said I. Oh, that, said Art. I don't see no story in that. I thought it was quite a stunt, I said. It isn't everybody that can pick out a second cob by just seeing him hit a fly ball. Graham smiled. No, he replied. There's few as smart as that. If you ever get through playing ball, I went on, you oughtn't to have any trouble landing a job. Good scouts don't grow on trees. It looks like I'm pretty near through now, said Art, still smiling. But you won't never catch me scouting for nobody. It's too lonesome a job. I had passed up lunch to retain my seat in the card game, so I was hungry. Moreover, it was evident that Graham was not going to wax garrulous on the subject of his scouting ability. I left him and sought the diner. I found a vacant chair opposite Bill Cole. Try the minced ham, he advised, but lay off in the sparrow grass. It's tougher than a doubleheader in St. Louis. We're over an hour late, I said. You'll have to do a hurry up on your story, won't you? asked Bill. Or did you write it already? All written and on the way. Well, what did you tell him? he inquired. Did you tell him we had a pleasant trip and Lenke lost his shirt in the poker game and I'm going to pitch tomorrow and the Boston clubs heard about it and hope it'll rain? No, I said. I gave them a regular story tonight about how Graham picked Waldron. Who give it to you? Ryan, I told him. Then you didn't get the real story, said Cole. Ryan himself don't know the best part of it, and he ain't going to know it for a while. He'll maybe find it out after Art's got the can, but not before. And I hope nothing like that'll happen for twenty years. When it does happen, I want to be sent along with Art, because I and him's been roomies now since 1911, and I wouldn't hardly know how to act with him off in the club. He's a nut, all right, on the singing stuff, and if he was gone, I might get a chance to give my voice a rest. But he's a pretty good guy, even if he is crazy. I'd like to hear the real story, I said. Sure you would, he answered, and I'd like to tell it to you. I will tell it to you if you'll give me your promise not to spill it till Art's gone. Art told it to I and Lefty in the clubhouse at Cleveland pretty near a month ago, and the three of us and Waldron is the only ones that knows it. I figure I've did pretty well to keep it to myself this long, but it seems like I got to tell somebody. You can depend on me, I assured him, not to say a word about it till Art's in Minneapolis, or wherever they're going to send him. I guess I can trust you, 
said Cole. But if you cross me, I'll shoot my fast one up there in the press coop some day and knock your teeth loose. Shoot, said I. Well, said Cole, I suppose Ryan told you that Art fell for the kid after just seeing him pop out. Yes, and Ryan said he considered it a remarkable piece of scouting. It was all of that. It'd have been remarkable enough if Art saw the bird pop out and then recommended him. But he didn't even see him pop out. What are you giving me? The facts, said Bill Cole. Art not only didn't see him pop out, but he didn't even see him with a ball suit on. He wasn't never inside the Jackson ballpark in his life. Waldron? No, Art I'm talking about. Then somebody tipped him off, I said quickly. No, sir. Nobody tipped him off, neither. He went to Jackson and spent the evening at his uncle's house, and Waldron was there. Him and Art was together the whole evening, but Art didn't even ask him if he could slide feet first. And then he come back to Detroit and got Ryan to draft him. But to give you the whole story, I'll have to go back a ways. We ain't nowheres near Worcester yet, so there's no hurry. Except that Art will probably be sending for me pretty quick to come in and learn Waldron's lost cord. You wasn't with this club when we had Mike McCann, but you must have heard of him. Outside his pitching, I mean. He was on the stage a couple of winters, and he had the swellest tenor voice I ever heard. I never seen no grand opera, but I'll bet this here Crusoe or McCormick or Gadsky or none of them had nothing on him for a pure tenor. Every note is clear as a bell. You couldn't hardly keep your eyes dry when he'd tear off Silver Threads or the River Shannon. Well... When Art was still with the Washington Club yet, I and Lefty and Mike used to pal around together, and once or twice we'd hit up some harmony. I couldn't support a family of Mormons with my voice, but it was better in them days than it is now. I used to carry the lead, and Lefty'd hit the baritone, and Mike the tenor. We didn't have no bass, but most of the time we let Mike do the singing alone because he had us outclassed, and the other boys kept telling us to shut up and give him a treat. First it'd be silver threads, and then Jerusalem, and then my wild Irish rose, and this and that, whatever the boys asked him for. Jake Martin used to say he couldn't help a short pair if Mike wasn't singing. Finally, Ryan pulled off the trade with Griffith, and Graham come on our club. Then there wasn't no more solo work. They made a bass out of me, and Art sung the lead, and Mike and Lefty took care of the tenor and baritone. Art didn't care what the other boys wanted to hear. They could holler their heads off for Mike to sing a solo, but... No sooner did Mike start singing than Art would chime in with him, and pretty soon we'd all four be going it. Art's a nut on singing, but he don't care nothing about listening, not even to a canary. He'd rather harmonize than hit one past the outfielders with two on. At first, we done all our serenading on the train. Art would get us out of bed early so as we could be through breakfast and back in the car in time to tear off a few before we got to wherever we was going. It got so as Art wouldn't leave us alone in the different towns we played at. We couldn't go to no show or nothing. We had to stick in the hotel and sing, up in our room or Mike's. And then he went so nuts over it that he got Mike to come in room in the same house with him at home, and I and Lefty was supposed to help keep the neighbors awake every night. Of course, we had morning practice while we was home, and Art used to have us come to the park early and get in a little harmony before we went on the field. But Ryan finally nailed that. He says that when he ordered morning practice, he meant baseball and not no minstrel show. Now then Lefty, who wasn't married, goes and gets himself a girl. I met her a couple times, and she looked all right. Lefty might have married her if Art had have left him alone, but nothing doing. We was home all through June once, and instead of coming round nights to sing with us, Lefty'd take this here doll to one of the parks or somewheres. Well, sir, Art was pretty near wild. He scouted around till he'd found out why Lefty'd quit us, and then he tried pretty near everybody else on the club to see if they wasn't someone who could hit the baritone. They wasn't nobody. So the next time we went on the road, Art give Lefty an earful about what a sucker a man was to get married, and looks wasn't everything, and the girl's probably after Lefty's money, and he wasn't being a good fella to break up the quartet and spoil our good times, and so on, and kept pestering and teasing Lefty till he give the girl up. I'd have saw Art in the Texas League before I'd have shook a girl to please him, but you know these left-handers. Art had it all framed that we was going on the stage, the four of us, and he seen a vaudeville man in New York and got us booked for 800 a week. I don't know if it was one week or two, but he sprung it on me in September and says we could get solid booking from October to March. So I asked him what he thought my missus would say when I told her I couldn't get enough of being away from home from March to October, so I was figuring on traveling the vaudeville circuit the other four or five months and making it unanimous. Art says I was tied to a woman's apron and all that stuff, but I give him the cold stare and he had to pass up that dandy little scheme. At that, I guess we could have got by on the stage all right. Mike was better than this here Waldron, and I, I hadn't wore my voice out yet on the coaching line, telling the boys to touch all the bases. There was about five or six songs that we could kill. Adeline was our star piece. 
Remember where it comes in? Your fair face beams. Mike used to go all way up on fair. Then they was the old mill stream and put on your old gray bonnet. I'd done some fancy work in that one. Then they was down in Jungle Town that we had pretty good. And then they was one that maybe you never heard. I don't know the name of it. It runs something like this. Bill sought out his voice so that I alone could hear the beautiful refrain. Years, years of waited years, only to see you just to call you dear. Come, come, my love but thee, come to your sweetheart's arms, come back to me. That one had a lot of wallops in it, and we didn't overlook none of them. The boys used to make us sing it six or seven times a night. But down in the cornfield was Art's favorite. There was a part in that where I sung the lead down low, and the other three done a banjo stunt. Then they was Castle on the Nile and Come Back to Aaron and a whole lot more. Well, the four of us wasn't hardly ever separated for three years. We was practicing all the while like as if we was going to play the big time, and we never made a nickel off in it. The only audience we had was the ball players or the people traveling on the same trains or stopping at the same hotels, and they got it all for nothing. But we had a good time, especially Art. You know what a pitcher Mike was. He could go in there stone cold and stick ten out of twelve over that old plate with something on him. And he was the willingest guy in the world. He pitched his own game every third or fourth day, and between them games he was warming up all the time to go in for somebody else. In 1911, when we was up in the race for a while, he pitched eight games out of twenty along in September and win seven of them. And besides that, he finished up five of the twelve he didn't start. We didn't win the pennant, and I've always figured that them three weeks killed Mike. Anyway, he wasn't worth nothing to the club the next year, but they carried him along, hoping he'd come back and show something. But he was pretty near through, and he knowed it. I knowed it, too, and so did everybody else on the club, only Graham. Art never got wise till the training trip two years ago this last spring. Then he come to me one day. Bill, he says, I don't believe Mike's coming back. Well, I says, you're getting so's they can't nobody hide nothing from you. Next thing you'll be finding out that Sam Crawford can hit. Never mind the comical stuff, he says. They ain't no joke about this. No, I says, and I never said they was. They'll look a long while before they find another pitcher like Mike. Pitcher my foot, says Art. I don't care if they have to pitch the bat boy, but when Mike goes, where'll our quartet be? Well, I says, do you get paid every first and fifteenth for singing or for crowning that old pill? If you couldn't talk about money, you'd be deaf and dumb, says Art. But you ain't playing ball because it's fun, are you? No, he says, they ain't no fun for me in playing ball. There's no fun doing nothing but harmonizing, and if Mike goes, I won't even have that. I and you and Lefty can harmonize, I says. It'd be swell stuff harmonizing without no tenor, says Art. It'd be like swinging without no bat. Well, he asked me did I think the club would carry Mike through another season, and I told him they'd already carried him a year without him being no good to them, and I figured if he didn't show something his first time out, they'd ask for waivers. Art kept brooding and brooding about it till they wasn't hardly no living with him. If he asked me once, he asked me a thousand times if I didn't think they might maybe hold on to Mike another season on account of all he did for them. I kept telling him I didn't think so, but that didn't satisfy him, and he finally went to Ryan and asked him point blank. Are you going to keep McCann? Art asked him. If he's going to do us any good, I am, says Ryan. If he ain't, he'll have to look for another job. End of Chapter 9, Part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner Recording by Ben Prince, San Francisco, California. Chapter 9, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ben Prince, San Francisco, California. Chapter 9, Harmony, Part 2 After that, all through the training trip, he was right on Mike's heels. How does the old super feel, he'd ask him. Great, Mike would say. Then Art would watch him warm up to see if he had anything on the ball. He's coming fine, he'd tell me. His curve broke today just as good as I ever seen it. But that didn't fool me, or it didn't fool Mike neither. He could throw about four hooks and then he was through. And he could have hit you in the head with his fast one and you'd have thought you had a rash. One night, just before the season opened up, we was singing on the train, and when we got through, Mike says, Well, boys, you better be looking for another Caruso. What are you talking about, says Art. 
I'm talking about myself, says Mike. I'll be up there in Minneapolis this summer, pitching once a week and swapping stories about the Civil War with Joe Cantillon. You're crazy, says Art. Your arm's as good as I ever seen it. Then, says Mike, you must have been playing blindfolded all these years. This is just between us, because Ryan will find it out for himself. My arm's rotten, and I can't do nothing to help it. Then Art got sore as a boil. You're a yellow quitting dog, he says. Just because you come round a little slow, you talk about Minneapolis. Why don't you resign off in the club? I might just as well, Mike says, and left us. You'd have thought that Art would have gave up then, because when a ball player admits he's slipping, you can bet your last nickel that he's through. Most of them stalls along and tries to kid themselves and everybody else long after they know they're gone. But Art kept talking like there was still some hope of Mike coming round, and when Ryan told us one night in St. Louis that he was going to give Mike his chance, the next day, Art was as nervous as a bride going to get married. I wasn't nervous. I just felt sorry, because I knowed the old boy was hopeless. Ryan had told him he was going to work if the weather suited him. Well, the day was perfect, so Mike went out to the park along about noon and took Jake with him to warm up. Jake told me afterwards that Mike was throwing just easy like from half past twelve till the rest of us got there. He was trying to heat up the old super and he couldn't have asked for a better break in the weather, but there wasn't enough sunshine in the world to make that old whip crack. Well, sir, you'd have thought to see Art that Mike was his son or his brother or somebody and just breaking into the league. Art wasn't in the outfield practice in more than two minutes. He come in and stood behind Mike while he was warming up and kept telling him how good he looked, but the only guy he was kidding was himself. Then the game starts and our club goes in and gets three runs. Pretty soft for you now, Mike, says Art on the bench. They can't score three off on you in three years. Say, it's lucky he ever got the side out in the first inning. Everybody that come up hit one on the pick, but our infield pulled two of the greatest plays I ever seen and they didn't score. In the second, we got three more, and I thought maybe the old bird was going to be lucky enough to scrape through. For four or five innings, he got the grandest support that was ever gave a pitcher, but I'll swear that what he throwed up there didn't have no more on it than September morning. Every time Art come to the bench, he says to Mike, Keep it up, old boy. You got more than you ever had. Well, in the seventh, Mike still had him shut out, and we was six runs to the good. Then a couple of the St. Louis boys hit him where they couldn't nobody reach him, and they was two on and two out. Then somebody got a hold of one and sent it on a line to the left to second base. I forgot who it was now, but whoever it was, he was supposed to be a right field hitter, and Art was laying over the other way for him. Art started with the crack of the bat, and I'd never seen a man make a better try for a ball. He had it judged perfect, but Cobb or Speaker or none of them couldn't have catched it. Art just managed to touch it by stretching to the limit. It went onto the fence, and everybody come in. They didn't score no more in that inning. Then Art come in from the field, and what do you think he tried to pull? I don't know what was the matter with me on that fly ball, he says. I ought to caught it in my pants pocket, but I didn't get started till it was right on top of me. You misjudged it, didn't you, says Ryan. I certainly did, says Art without cracking. Well, says Ryan, I wished you'd misjudge all of them that way. I never seen a better play on a ball. So then Art knowed they wasn't no more use trying to alibi the old boy. Mike had a turn at bat, and when he come back, Ryan asked him how he felt. I guess I can get six more of them out, he says. Well, they didn't score in the eighth, and when the ninth come, Ryan sent I and Lefty out to warm up. We throwed a few while our club was batting, but when it comes St. Louis's last chance, we was too much interested in the ball game to know if we was throwing or baking biscuits. The first guy hits a line drive, and somebody jumps a mile in the air and stabs it. The next fella fouled out, and there was only one more to get. And then what do you think come off? Whoever it was hitting lifted a fly ball to center field. Art didn't have to move out of his tracks. I've saw him catch a hundred just like it behind his back. But you know what he was thinking. He was saying to himself, if I nail this one, we're liable to keep our tenor singer a while longer. And he dropped it. Then there was five base hits that sounded like the 4th of July, and they come so fast that Ryan didn't have time to send for I or Lefty. Anyway, I guess he thought he might as well leave Mike in there and take it. There wasn't no singing in the clubhouse after that game. I and Lefty always let the others start it. Mike, of course, didn't feel like no jubilee, and Art was so busy trying not to let nobody see him cry that he kept his head clear down in his socks. Finally, he beat it for town all alone, and we didn't see nothing of him till after supper. Then he got us together, and we all went up to Mike's room. I want to try this here old girl of mine, he says. Better sung our old stuff, says Mike. This looks like the last time. 
Then Art choked up, and it was ten minutes before he could get going. We sung everything we knowed, and it was two o'clock in the morning before Art had enough. Ryan come in after midnight and sat a while listening, but he didn't chase us to bed. He knowed better than any of us that it was a farewell. When I and Art was starting for our room, Art turned to Mike and says, Old boy, I'd have gave every nickel I ever owned to have caught that fly ball. I know you would, Mike says, and I know what made you drop it. But don't worry about it, because it was just a question of time, and if I'd have got away with that game, they'd have murdered some of the infielders next time I started. Mike was sent home the next day, and we didn't see him again. He was shipped to Minneapolis before we got back, and the rest of the season I might as well have lived in a cemetery while we was on the road. Art was so bad that I thought once or twice I'd have to change roomies. Once in a while he'd start humming, and then he'd break off short and growl at me. He'd tried out two or three of the other boys on the club to see if he couldn't find a new tenor singer, but nothing doing. One night he made Lefty try the tenor. Well, Lefty's voice is bad enough down low. When he gets up about so high, you think you're in the stockyards. And Art had a rotten year in baseball, too. The old boy's still pretty near as good on a fly ball as anybody in the league, but you ought to saw him before his legs begin to give out. He could cover as much ground as Speaker, and he was just as sure. But the year Mike left us, he missed pretty near half as many as he got. He told me one night, he says, Do you know, Bill, I stand out there and pray that nobody will hit one to me. Every time I see one coming, I think of that one I dropped from Mike in St. Louis, and then I'm just as liable to have it come down on my bean as in my glove. You're crazy, I says, to let a thing like that make a bum out of you. But he kept on dropping fly balls till Ryan was talking about setting him on the bench where it wouldn't hurt nothing if his nerve give out. But Ryan didn't have nobody else to play out there, so Art held on. He come back the next spring, that's a year ago, feeling more cheerful and like himself than I'd saw him for a long while, and there was a kid named Burton trying out for second base that could sing pretty near as good as Mike. It didn't take Art more than a day to find this out, and every morning and night for a few days, the four of us would be together hitting her up. But the kid didn't have no more idea how to play the bag than Charlie Chaplin. Art seen in a minute that he couldn't never beat Cragen out of his job, so what does he do but take him out and try to learn him to play the outfield? He wasn't no worse there than at second base. He couldn't have been. But before he practiced out there three days, there was bruises all over his head and shoulders where fly balls had hit him. Well, the kid wasn't with us long enough to see the first exhibition game, and after he'd went, Art was old man grump again. What's the matter with you, I says to him. You was all smiles the day we reported, and now you could easy pass for an undertaker. Well, he says, I had a great winter, singing all the while. We got a good quartet down home, and I never enjoyed myself as much in my life, and I kind of had a hunch that I was going to be lucky and find somebody amongst the bushers that could hit up the old tenor. Your hunch was right, I says. That Burton kid was as good a tenor as you'd want. Yes, he says, and my hunch could have played ball just as good as him. Well, sir, if you didn't never room with a corpse, you don't know what a whale of a time I had all last season. About the middle of August, he was at his worst. Bill, he says, I'm going to leave this old baseball flat on its back if something don't happen. I can't stand these here lonesome nights. I ain't like the rest of the boys that can go and sit all evening at a pitcher show or hang around them Dutch gardens. I got to be singing or I'm miserable. Well, go ahead and sing, says I. I'll try and keep the cops back. No, he says, I don't want to sing alone. I want to harmonize, and we can't do that because we ain't got no tenor. I don't know if you'll believe me or not, but sure as we're sitting here, he went to Ryan one day in Philly and tried to get him to make a trade for Harper. What do I want him for, says Ryan. I hear he ain't satisfied, says Art. I ain't running no ball players benefit association, says Ryan, and Art had to give it up. But he didn't want Harper on the club for no other reason than because he's a tenor singer. And then come that Detroit trip, and Art got permission to go to Jackson. He says he intended to drop in at the ballpark, but his uncle wanted to borrow some money off of him on a farm, so Art had to drive out and see the farm. Then, that night, this here Waldron was up to call on Art's cousin, a swell doll, Art tells me, and Waldron sat down to the piano and began to sing and play. Then it was all off. There wasn't no spooning in the parlor that night. Art wouldn't leave the kid get off in the piano stool long enough to even find out if the girl was a blonde or a brunette. Of course, Art knowed the boy was with the Jackson Club as soon as they was introduced, because Art's uncle says something about the both of them being ball players and so on. But Art swears he never thought of recommending him till the kid got up to go home. Then he asked him what position did he play and found out all about him, only, of course, Waldron didn't tell him how good he was because he didn't know himself. So Art asked him would he like a trial in the big show, 
and the kid says he would. And then Art says maybe the kid would hear from him, and then Waldron left, and Art went to bed. And he says he stayed awake all night planning the thing out and wondering would he have the nerve to pull it off. You see, he thought that if Ryan fell for it, Waldron had join us as soon as the season was over, and then Ryan would see he wasn't no good. But he'd probably keep him until we was through for the year, and Art could alibi himself some way, say he'd got the wrong name or something. All he wanted, he says, was to have the kid along the last month or six weeks so he could harmonize. A nut? I guess not. Well, as you know, Waldron got sick and didn't report, and when Art seen him on the train this spring, he couldn't hardly believe his eyes. He thought surely the kid would have been canned during the winter without no trial. Here's another hot one. When we went out the first day for practice, Art takes the kid off in a corner and tries to learn him enough baseball so as he won't show himself up and get sent away somewhere as before we had a little benefit from his singing. Can you imagine that? Trying to learn this kid baseball when he was born with a sliding pad on? You know the rest of it. There wasn't never no question about Waldron making good. It's just like everybody says, he's the best natural ball player that's broke in since Cobb. They ain't nothing he can't do, but it is a funny thing that Art's job should be the one he'd get. I spoke about that to Art when he gave me the story. Well, he says, I can't expect everything to break right. I figure I'm lucky to have picked a guy that's good enough to hang on. I'm in stronger with Ryan right now, and with the old man too, than when I was out there playing every day. Besides, the bench is a pretty good place to watch the game from, and this club won't be shy a tenor singer for nine years. Well, no, I says, but... They'll be shy a lead and a baritone and a bass before I and you and Lefty is much older. What of it, he says. We'll look up old Mike and all go somewheres and live together. We were nearing Worcester. Bill Cole and I arose from our table and started back towards our car. In the first vestibule we encountered Buck, the trainer. Mr. Graham's been looking all over for you, Mr. Cole, he said. I've been rehearsing my part, said Bill. We found Art Graham, Lefty, and young Waldron in Art's seat. The kid was talking. Lefty missed it again. If you fellas knew music, I could teach it to you on the piano when we get to Boston. Lefty, on the word love, in the next to the last line, you're on middle C. Then on the word you, you slide up half a tone, and that ought to be a snap, but you don't get it. I'm on high A and come down to G, and Bill's on low F and comes up to A. Art just sings the regular two notes, F and E. It's a change from the F chord to the A chord. It makes a dandy wallop, and it ought to be a... Here's Bill now, interrupted Lefty as he caught sight of Cole. Art Graham treated his roommate to a cold stare. Where the hell have you been, he said angrily. Looking for the lost cord, said Bill. Sit down here and learn this, growled Art. We won't never get it if we don't work. Yes, let's tackle her again, said Waldron. Bill comes up two full tones from F to A. Lefty goes up half a tone. Art sings just like always, and I come down a tone. Now try her again. Two years ago it was that Bill Cole told me that story. Two weeks ago, Art Graham boarded the evening train on one of the many roads that lead to Minneapolis. The day Art was let out, I cornered Ryan in the clubhouse after the others had dressed and gone home. Did you ever know, I asked, that Art recommended Waldron without having seen him in a ball suit? I told you long ago how Art picked Waldron, he said. Yes, said I, but you didn't have the right story, so I gave it to him. You newspaper fellas, he said when I had done, are the biggest suckers in the world. Now, I've never given you a bad steer in my life, but you don't believe what I tell you, and you go and fall for one of Bill Cole's hop dreams. Don't you know that he was the biggest liar in baseball? He'd tell you that Walter Johnson was Jack's father if he thought he could get away with it. And that bunk he gave you about Waldron? Does it sound reasonable? Just as reasonable, I replied, as the stuff about Art's grabbing him after seeing him pop out. I don't claim he did, said Ryan. That's what Art told me. One of those Jackson ball players could give you the real truth, only of course he wouldn't, because if Hodges ever found it out, he'd shoot him full of holes. Art Graham's no fool. He isn't touting ball players because they can sink tenor or alto or anything else. Nevertheless, I believe Bill Cole, else I wouldn't print the story. And Ryan would believe, too, if he weren't in such a mood these days that he disagrees with everybody. For in spite of Waldron's wonderful work, and he is at his best right now, the club hasn't done nearly as well as when Art and Bill and Lefty were still with us. There seems to be a lack of harmony. End of Chapter 9, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. Recording by Ben Prince, San Francisco, California. Chapter 10 Part 1 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples 
by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 10, Horseshoes, Part 1. This is the kind of story which the reader can take up at any point and lay down as soon as he feels like it. A trail of vengeance, ruthless and sinister, is uncovered to its hidden source by a flat-footed detective. The series ended Tuesday, but I had stayed in Philadelphia an extra day on the chance of there being some follow-up stuff worth sending. Nothing had broken loose, so I filed some stuff about what the athletics and giants were going to do with their dough, and then caught the eight o'clock train for Chicago. Having passed up supper in order to get my story away and grab the train, I went to the buffet car right after I'd planted my grips. I sat down at one of the tables and ordered a sandwich. Four salesmen were playing rum at the other table, and all the chairs in the car were occupied. So it didn't surprise me when somebody flopped down in the seat opposite me. I looked up from my paper and with a little thrill recognized my companion. Now, I've been experting around the country with ball players so much that it doesn't usually excite me to meet one face to face, even if he's a star. I can talk with Tyrus without getting all fussed up. But this particular player had jumped from obscurity to fame so suddenly and had played such an important though brief part in the recent argument between the Max and the McGraws that I couldn't help being a little awed by his proximity. It was none other than Grimes, the utility outfielder Connie had been forced to use in the last game because of the injury to Joyce. Grimes, whose miraculous catch in the 11th inning had robbed Parker of a home run and the Giants of victory, and whose own homer, a fluky one, had given the Athletics another world's championship. I had met Grimes one day during the spring he was with the Cubs, but I knew he wouldn't remember me. A ball player never recalls a reporter's face on less than six introductions or his name on less than twenty. However, I resolved to speak to him and had just mustered sufficient courage to open a conversation when he saved me the trouble. Whose picture have they got there? he asked, pointing to my paper. Speed Parker's, I replied. What do they say about him? asked Grimes. I'll read it to you, I said. Speed Parker, McGraw's great third baseman, is ill in a local hospital with nervous prostration, the result of the strain of the World Series in which he played such a stellar role. Parker is in such a dangerous condition that no one is allowed to see him. Members of the New York team and fans from Gotham called at the hospital today, but were unable to gain admittance to his ward. Philadelphians hope he will recover speedily and will suffer no permanent ill effects from his sickness, for he won their admiration by his work in the series, though he was on a rival team. A lucky catch by Grimes, the athletic substitute outfielder was all that prevented Parker from winning the title for New York. According to manager Mack of the champions, the series would have been over in four games, but for Parker's wonderful exhibition of nerve and... That'll be a plenty, Grimes interrupted, and that's just what you might expect from one of them dough-headed reporters. If all the baseball writers was where they belong, they'd have to build an annex to Matiwan. I kept my temper with very little effort. It takes more than a peevish ball player's remarks to insult one of our fraternity but I didn't exactly understand his peeve. Doesn't Parker deserve the bouquet, I asked. Oh, they can boost him all they want to, said Grimes, but when they call that catch lucky, and don't mention the fact that Parker is the luckiest guy in the world, something must be wrong with him. Did you see the serious? No, I lied glibly, hoping to draw from him the cause of his grouch. Well, he said, you sure miss something. 
They never was a serious like it before, and they won't never be one again. It went the full seven games, and every game was a bear. They was one big in and every day, and Parker was the big cheese in it. Just as Connie says, the athletics would have cleaned them in four games but for Parker. But it wasn't because he's a great ball player. It was because he was born with a knife, fork, and spoon in his mouth and a rabbit's foot hung round his neck. You may not know it, but I'm Grimes, the guy that made the lucky catch. I'm the guy that won the series with a hit, a home run hit. And I'm here to tell you that if I'd had one-tenth of Parker's luck, they'd have heard about me long before yesterday. They say my homer was lucky. Maybe it was. But believe me, it was time things broke for me. They've been breaking for him all his life. Well, I said his luck must have gone back on him if he's in a hospital with nervous prostration. Nervous prostration? Nothing, said Grimes. He's in a hospital because his face is all out of shape and he's ashamed to appear on the street. I don't usually do so much talking. And I'm raving a little tonight because I've had a couple of drinks. But have another, said I, ringing for the waiter, and talk some more. I made two hits yesterday, Grimes went on, but the crowd only seen one. I busted up the game and the serious with the one they seen. The one they didn't see was the one I busted up a guy's map with, and Speed Parker was the guy. That's why he's in a hospital. He may be able to play ball next year, but I'll bet my share of the dough that McGraw won't recognize him when he shows up at Marlin in the spring. When did this come off, I asked. And why? It come off outside the clubhouse after yesterday's battle, he said, and I hit him because he called me a name, a name I won't stand from him. What did he call you, I queried, expecting to hear one of the delicate epithets usually applied by conqueror to conqueror on the diamond. Horseshoes, was Grimes' amazing reply. But, good Lord, I remonstrated, I've heard of... Ball players calling each other that and Lucky Stiff and Four Leaf Clover ever since I was a foot high, and I never knew them to start fights about it. Well, said Grimes, I might as well give you all the dope, and then if you don't think I was justified, I'll pay your fare from here to wherever you're going. I don't want you to think I'm kicking about trifles, or that I'm kicking at all, for that matter. I just want to prove to you that he didn't have no license to pull that horseshoe stuff on me, and that I only give him what was coming to him. Go ahead and shoot, said I. Give us some more of the same, said Grimes to the passing waiter. And then he told me about it. Maybe you've heard that me and Speed Parker was raised in the same town. Ishpeming, Michigan. We was kids together, and though he done all the devilment, I got all the lickings. When we was about 12 years old, Speed throwed a rotten egg at the teacher, and I got expelled. That made me sick of schools, and I wouldn't never go to one again, though my old man beat me up and the truant officers threatened to have me hung. Well, while Speed was learning what was the principal products of New Hampshire and Texas, I was working around the freight house and driving a dray. We'd both been playing ball all our lives, and when the town organized a semi-pro club, we got jobs with it. We was to draw two bucks apiece for each game, and they played every Sunday. We played four games before we got our first pay. They was a hole in my pants pocket as big as the home plate, but I forgot about it and put the dough in there. It wasn't there when I got home. Speed didn't have no hole in his pocket. You can bet on that. Afterward, the club hired a good outfielder, and I was canned. They was hunting for another third baseman, too, but, of course, they didn't find none, and Speed held his job. The next year, they started the Northern Peninsula League. We landed with the home team. The league opened in May and blowed up the third week in June. They paid off all the outsiders first and then had just money enough left to settle with one of us two Ishpeming guys. The night they'd done the pan, I was out to my uncle's farm. So they settled with speed and told me I'd have to wait for mine. I'm still waiting. 
Gene Higgins, who was manager of the Battle Creek Club, lived in Houghton, and that winter we goes over and strikes him for a job. He give it to us, and we busted in together two years ago last spring. I had a good year down there. I hit over 300 and stole all the bases in sight. Speed got along good, too, and there was several big league scouts looking us over. The Chicago Cubs bought Speed outright, and four clubs put in a draft for me. Three of them, Cleveland and the New York Giants and the Boston Nationals, needed outfielders bad, and it would have been a pipe for me to make good with any of them. But who do you think got me? The same Chicago Cubs. And the only outfielders they had at that time was Schulte and Leach and Good and Williams and Stewart and one or two others. Well, I didn't figure I was any worse off than speed. The Cubs had Zimmerman at third base, and it didn't look like there was any danger of a busher beating him out. But Zimmerman goes and breaks his leg the second day of the season. That's a year ago last April, and Speed jumps right in as a regular. Do you think anything like that could happen to Schulte or Leach or any of them outfielders? No, sir. I wore out my uniform sliding up and down the bench and wondering whether they'd ship me to Fort Worth or Siberia. Now I want to tell you about the miserable luck Speed had right off the reel. We was playing at St. Louis. They had a one-run lead in the eighth when their pitcher walked Speed with one out. Sire hits a high fly to center and Parker starts with the crack of the bat. Both coachers was yelling at him to go back, but he thought they was two out and he was clear round to third base when the ball come down. And Oaks muffs it. Of course he scored and the game was tied up. Parker come into the bench like he did something wonderful. Did you think they was two out, asked Hank? No, says Speed blushing. Then what did you run for, says Hank? I had a hunch he was going to drop the ball, says Speed, and Hank pretty near falls off the bench. The next day he come up with one out and the sacks full and the score tied in the sixth. He smashes one on the ground straight at Hauser, and it looked like a cinch double play. But just as Hauser was going to grab it, the ball hit a rough spot and hopped a mile over his head. It got between Oaks and McGee and went clear to the fence. Three guys scored and Speed pulled up at third. The papers come out and said the game was won by a three-bagger from the Battle Parker, the Cubs' sensational kid third baseman. Gosh. We go home to Chai and are having a hot battle with Pittsburgh. This time Speed's turn come when they was two on and two out and Pittsburgh a run to the good. I think it was the eighth inning. Cooper gives him a fast one, and he hits it straight up in the air. Of course, the runners start going, but it looked hopeless because there wasn't no wind or high sky to bother anybody. Mowry and Gibson both goes after the ball, and just as Mowry was set for the catch, Gibson bumps into him, and they both fall down. Two runs scored, and Speed got to second. Then what does he do but try to steal third, with two out, too? And Gibson's peg pretty near hits the left field seats on the fly. When Speed comes to the bench, Hank says, If I was you, I'd quit playing ball and go to Monte Carlo. What for? says Speed. You're so damn lucky, says Hank. So is Ty Cobb, says Speed. That's how he hated himself. First trip to Cincy, we run into a couple of old Ishpeming boys. They took us out one night, and about 12 o'clock, I said we'd have to go back to the hotel or we'd get fined. Speed said I had cold feet, and he stuck with the boys. I went back alone, and Hank caught me coming in and put a $50 plaster on me. Speed stayed out all night long, and Hank never knowed it. I says to myself, wait till he gets out there and tries to play ball with no sleep. But the game that day was called off on a counter rain. Can you beat it? I remember what he got away with the next afternoon, the same as though it happened yesterday. In the second inning, they walked him with nobody down, and he took a big lead off first base like he always does. Benton throwed over there three or four times to scare him back, and the last time he throwed, Hobby hid the ball. The coacher seen it and told Speed to hold the bag, but he didn't pay no attention. 
He started leading right off again, and Hoppy tried to tag him. But the ball slipped out of his hand and rolled about a yard away. Parker had plenty of time to get back, but instead of that, he starts for second. Hoppy picked up the ball and shot it down to Gro, and Gro made a square muff. Parker slides into the bag safe and then gets up and throws out his chest like he'd made the greatest play ever. When the ball's thrown back to Benton, Speed leads off about 30 foot and stands there in a trance. Clark signs for a pitch out and pegs down to second to nip him. He was caught flat-footed. That is, he would have been with a decent throw. But Clark's peg went pretty near to Latonia. Speed scored and strutted over to receive our hearty congratulations. Some of the boys was laughing and he thought they was laughing with him instead of at him. It was in the ninth, though, that he got by with one of the worst I ever seen. The Reds was a run behind, and Marsons was on third base with two out. Hobby, I think it was, hit one on the ground right at speed, and he picked it up clean. The crowd all got up and started for the exits. Marsons run toward the plate in the faint hope that the peg to first would be wild. All of a sudden, the boys on the Cincy bench begun yelling at him to slide, and he'd done so. He was way past the plate when Speed's throw got to Archer. The bonehead had shot the ball home instead of to first base, thinking they was only one down. We was all crazy believing his nut play had let him tie it up, but he comes tearing in telling Archer to tag Marsons. So Jim walks over and tags the Cuban who was brushing off his uniform. You're out, says Clem. You never touched the plate. I guess Marsons knowed the umps was right because he didn't make much of a holler. But Speed sure got a panning in the clubhouse. I suppose you knowed he was going to miss the plate, says Hank, sarcastic as he could. Everybody on the club roasted him, but it didn't do no good. Well, you know what happened to me. I only got into one game with the Cubs one afternoon when Leach was sick. We was playing the Boston Bunch, and Tyler was working against us. I always had trouble with left-handers, and this was one of his good days. I couldn't see what he throwed up there. I got one foul during the afternoon's entertainment, and the wind was blowing a hundred-mile gale so that the best outfielder in the world couldn't judge a fly ball. That Boston Bunch must have hit fifty of them, and they all come to my field. If I caught any, I forgot about it. A couple of days after that, I got notice of my release to Indianapolis. Parker kept right on all season doing the blamedest things you ever heard of and getting by with them. One of the boys told me about it later. If they was playing a doubleheader in St. Louis with the thermometer at 130 degrees, he'd get put out by the umps in the first inning of the first game. If he started to steal the catcher, drop the pitch, or somebody muff the throw, if he hit a pop fly, the sun get in somebody's eyes. If he took a swell third strike with the bases full, the umps would call it a ball. If he cut first base by 20 feet, the umps would be reading the morning paper. Zimmerman's leg mended so that he was all right by June. And then Sayer got sick and they tried speed at first base. He'd never saw the bag before, but things kept on breaking for him and he played it like a house of fire. The Cubs copped the pennant and Speed got in on the big dough, besides playing a whale of a game through the whole series. Speed and me both went back to Ishpeming to spend the winter, though the Lord knows it ain't no winter resort. Our homes was there, and besides, in my case, there was a certain girl living in the old burg. Parker, of course, was the hero and the swell guy when we got home. He'd been in the world serious and had plenty of dough in his kick. I come home with nothing but my suitcase and a hard luck story, which I kept to myself. I hadn't even went good enough in Indianapolis to be sure of a job there again. That fall, last fall, an Uncle O'Speeds died over in the Sioux and left him 10000 bucks. I had an uncle down in the Lower Peninsula who was worth five times that much, but he had good health. This girl I spoke about was the prettiest thing I ever see. I'd went with her in the old days, and when I blew back, I found she was still strong for me. They wasn't a great deal of variety in Ishpeming for a girl to pick from. 
Her and I went to the dance every Saturday night and to church Sunday nights. I called on her Wednesday evenings, besides taking her to all the shows that come along, rotten as the most of them was. I never knowed Speed was making a play for this doll till along last February. The minute I seen what was up, I got busy. I took her out sleigh riding and kept her out in the cold till she'd promised to marry me. We set the date for this fall. I figure I'd know better where I was at by that time. Well, we didn't make no secret o' being engaged. Down in the pool room one night, Speed come up and congratulated me. He says, You got a swell girl, Dick. I wouldn't mind being in your place. You're mighty lucky to cop her out, you old horseshoes, you. Horseshoes, I says. You got a fine license to call anybody horseshoes. I suppose you ain't never had no luck. Not like you, he says. I was feeling too good about grabbing the girl to get sore at the time. But when I got to thinking about it a few minutes afterward, it made me mad clear through. What right did that bird have to talk about me being lucky? Speed was playing freeze out at a table near the door, and when I started home, some of the boys with him says, Good night, Dick. And I said, Good night, and then Speed looked up. Good night, horseshoes, he says. That got my nanny this time. Shut up, you lucky stiff, I says. If you wasn't so damn lucky, you'd be sweeping the streets. Then I walks on out. I was too busy with the girl to see much of speed after that. He left home about the middle of the month to go to Tampa with the Cubs. I got notice from Indianapolis that I was sold to Baltimore. I didn't care much about going there, and I wasn't anxious to leave home under the circumstances, so I didn't report till late. When I read in the papers along in April that Speed had been traded to Boston for a couple of pitchers, I thought, gee, he must have lost his rabbit's foot, because even if the Cubs didn't cop again, they'd have a city serious with the White Sox and get a bunch of dough that way. And there wasn't no chance in the world for the Boston club to get nothing but their salaries. It wasn't another month, though, till Schaefer of the Giants quit baseball and McGraw was up against it for a third baseman. Next thing I knowed, Speed was traded to New York and was with another winner, for they never was out of first place all season. I was getting along all right at Baltimore, and Donny liked me, so I felt like I had something more than just a one-year job, something I could get married on. I was all framed that the wedding was coming off as soon as this season was over, so you can believe I was pulling for October to hurry up and come. One day in August, two months ago, Dunny come in the clubhouse and handed me the news. Rube Oldring's busted his leg, he says, and he's out for the rest of the season. Connie's got a youngster named Joyce that he can stick in there, but he's got to have an extra outfielder. He's made me a good proposition for you, and I'm going to let you go. It'll be pretty soft for you, because they got the pennant cinched, and they'll cut you in on the big money. Yes, I says, and when they're through with me, they'll ship me to hell and gone, and I'll be dragging down about 75 bucks a month next year. Nothing like that, says Dunny. If he don't want you next season, he's got to ask for waivers. And if you get out of the big league, you come right back here. That's all framed. So that's how I come to get with the athletics. Connie, give me a nice, comfortable seat in one corner of the bench, and I had the pleasure of watching a real ball club perform once every afternoon and sometimes twice. Connie told me that as soon as they had the flag cinched, he was going to lay off some of his regulars and I'd get a chance to play. Well, they cinched it in the fourth day of September, and our next engagement was with Washington on Labor Day. We had two games, and I was in both of them. And I broke in with my usual lovely luck, because the pitchers I was asked to face was Bailing, a nasty left-hander, and this guy, Johnson. The morning game was Bailing's, and he wasn't no worse than some of the rest of his kind. I only whiffed once and would have had a triple if Milan hadn't run from here to New Orleans and stole one off of me. I'm not boasting about my first experience with Johnson, though. They can't never tell me he throws them balls with his arm. He's got a gun concealed about his person, and he shoots him up there. 
I was leading off in Murphy's place and the game was a little delayed and starting because I'd watched the big guy warm up and wasn't in no hurry to get to that plate. Before I left the bench, Connie says, Don't try to take no healthy swing. Just meet him and you'll get along better. So I tried to just meet the first one he throwed, but when I stuck out my bat, Henry was throwing the pill back to Johnson. Then I thought, maybe if I start swinging now at the second one, I'll hit the third one. So I let the second one come over, and the umps guessed it was another strike. Though I bet a thousand bucks, he couldn't see it no more than I could. While Johnson was still winding up to pitch again, I started to swing, and the big cuss crosses me with a slow one. I lunged at it twice and missed it both times, and the force of my wallop throwed me clean back to the bench. The athletics was all laughing at me, and I laughed too, because I was glad that much of it was over. McInnes gets a base hit off him in the second inning, and I asked him how he'd done it. He's a friend of mine, says Jack and he lets up when he pitches to me. I made up my mind right there that if I was going to be in the league next year, I'd go out and visit Johnson this winter and get acquainted. I wished before the day was over that I was hitting in the catcher's place because the fellers down near the tail end of the batting order only had to face him three times. He fanned me on three pitched balls again in the third, and when I come up in the sixth, he scared me to death by pretty near beaning me with the first one. Be careful, says Henry. He's getting pretty wild and he's liable to knock you away from your uniform. Don't he never curve one, I asked? Sure, says Henry. Do you want to see his curve? Yes, I says, knowing the hook couldn't be no worse than the fast one. So he give me three hooks in succession and I missed them all. But I felt more comfortable than when I was ducking his fastball. In the ninth, he hit my bat with a curve and the ball went on the ground to McBride. He booted it, but throwed me out easy because I was so surprised at not having whiffed that I forgot to run. Well, I went along like that for the rest of the season, running up against the best pitchers in the league and not exactly murdering them. Everything I tried went wrong, and I was smart enough to know that if anything had depended on the games, I wouldn't have been in there for two minutes. Joyce and Strunk and Murphy wasn't jealous o' me a bit, but they was glad to take turns resting, and I didn't care how much I went so long as I was sure of a job next year. I'd wrote to the girl a couple of times asking her to set the exact date for our wedding, but she hadn't paid no attention. She said she was glad I was with the athletics, but she thought the Giants was going to beat us. I might have suspected from that that something was wrong because not even a girl would pick the giants to trim that bunch of iron. Finally, the day before the series started, I sent her a kind of sassy letter saying, I guessed it was up to me to name the day, and asking whether October 20th was all right. I told her to wire me yes or no. I'd been reading the dope about speed all season, and I knowed he'd had a whale of a year and that his luck was right with him. But I never dreamed a man could have the Lord on his side as strong as Speed did in that world serious. I might as well tell you all the dope so long as you wasn't there. End of chapter 10, Horseshoes, part 1.